welcome uh, to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council for Tuesday the 28th of September here in uh, the Edinburgh Room uh, under Alert Level 2 conditions. Welcome to Council colleagues uh, and staff. It is um, great to be able to have this uh, meeting face-to-face uh, -face, given uh, the significance of the agenda uh, that we have before us. Uh, before then, speaking of uh, significance, a number of uh, presenters appearing before the public forum, and as, as, I, as I've previously indicated, speakers will get uh, five minutes uh, to present to us. Um, we'll give them a warning at four minutes, and then I'll take up to five minutes of, uh, of questions, should there be any uh, of uh, the matters that the presenters uh, have traversed uh, in their submission. Uh, and the first, um, allowing, and there'll probably be some time in between to allow for uh, our technical solution to our public health problem. But first, uh, uh, first, first up this morning is Mahairu Mackenzie Everett uh, from representing the Otago University Students Association. Kia ora Mahairu, can you hear us? I'm not sure if you heard my preamble, so I'll repeat it for your benefit. You've got up to five minutes. We'll give you a warning at four minutes, uh, and then there'll be uh, capacity for questions should elected members have any. We're all yours. and students make up a large portion of employees in these positions. 
Additionally, students also make up a large amount of customers, particularly in cafes around the Knox Church end of George Street because of its closeness to campus. Having a more accessible and safe environment will support student shoppers and workers, and we believe that this is vital to keep in mind. Additionally, we'd like to specifically reiterate our strong support for the submissions of the disabled community who have highlighted many accessibility and safety issues with the street throughout this process. Um, we'd like to end with thanking the team from ACOM and for <coughs> this business case who were incredibly accommodating in the workshops, which we believe facilitated really great consultation with stakeholders and students alike. Um, so thank you very much for letting me speak and I'm open to any questions. Uh, kia ora for that. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, I've got a question about probably a year ago, I suppose, I chatted to the then um, uh, president of OUSA and he mentioned that it would be great if they, because um, he said what happens at the moment is that because of the way, you know, if, when they have lunch time, they'd love to be able to go to some other cafes and things in town at lunch, but because of the tight turnaround with lectures they, and the time to get into town, they tend to just go to the, like a lot of students tend to just go to, you know, the ones that are there near, so the sushi shop or the, you know, those wee, wee places that are nearby, which is great for them. But he said it would be good if somehow we could get in and out of the city a lot easier at that lunchtime period. Is that something that you are feeling as well? And he, the context of that was around a type of loop bus or something like that that could pick up and drop off regularly from the university. Is that something that um, would, would be useful for you, for, for the, count, the OUSA now? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Worship, and thank you, Myri, for um, a very intelligent overview of OUSA stance. Um, my question is, uh, the argument against a move to a more people-friendly city centre is often that it's bad for business. Um, considering that people shop and not cars, would you agree or disagree with that sentiment? Yeah. Absolutely disagree. Um, I work in retail myself. I hold a, <laughs> a part-time position at a boutique on George Street, and I have essentially worked in the retail industry in Dunedin ever since I started here as a student. And I think the more foot traffic you have, um, the better this is for business. Mm -hmm. And as it stands at the moment, when you have car parks all the way along George Street, people are more likely to drop into one specific shop park there for 10 minutes, pop in, pop out. <coughs> Whereas if you have to walk up and down George Street, you're more likely to wander into businesses, grab a coffee, um, pop into the mall, realize that you need something else to grab. I think it's a it's a an old fashioned way of thinking to think that you have to be able to park incredibly close by um, to, to have a benefit to business. Additionally, from a student perspective, if you do drive into the city to um, buy something, for the most part, all of us try to avoid paying for parking. So we'll park yeah. up on um, Stewart Street, where there are free, you know, all-day parks, um, and then walk down anyway. And that's where I often find, if I have all-day parking I'm, and I'm walking around the city, I'm more likely to spend more time in town. So I think that argument is, I think, perhaps a little ignorant of how people spend time in, in shops and things like that today. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, just sort of following up on that, 
Um, how did you consult with students? How, what engagement did you do with them regarding this? So this isn't something that I've been involved in the whole process through. Um, Michaela, our president, has been for the most part involved in this process. But we've spoken to a number of our subcommittees at RUSA. Um, so we have a residential committee, we have a provisions committee, and a number of other processes. So we've spoken to these committees about this before, but also throughout this process of looking at the Broad Street changes, when we have these work um, ACOM, we also had a number of um, just students from the student body who were there to talk to us as well. So um, it's sort of been more of a um, authentic process of just speaking to the people that we know in our sort of established networks as it is. Um, but how we've also previously done some submissions are we reach out through our social media um, and that's where we hear a lot of stories too about particularly about the um, the public transport plan, regional public transport plan. We reached out through our Instagram stories and we had a lot of feedback there about what students are looking for in terms of mode shift as well. So it sort of changes depending on what specific topic we're working on. Okay. Thank you, Ms McKenzie. Everett. Thank you for your time, for your submission. Our five minutes are up. Uh, and we have a full slate of, of presenters. But thank you for, for taking the time to speak to us this morning. We appreciate it. Next item one, item 1 1.2, Louise Mainville from Public Health South. somewhat opposite given accessibility is on the agenda. Kia ora Ms Mainville, do we have you? Are you um, before you begin? Are you joining us by video? It's not compulsory, but just letting you know that we can't see you currently. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, five minutes are all yours. We'll get a warning uh, with a minute to spare, and then there'll be time for questions. Should you? be prepared to take them, otherwise we're all yours. Great. Thank you very much. Um, today I'm really here to talk to you about um, the retail business district and, and the plan and I guess I'm advocating from a position of public health south to um, encourage the one-way option. So I guess I'm coming from the background of that, I guess that um, using that thriving cities analogy of looking at things from that local and social sector and asking that question, what would it mean for the people of the city to thrive? And what we need is a burgeoning economic center to you know, attract jobs and to attract the retail sector. Um, but we also need a location where people can congregate and come and want to spend time in those locations to actually engage in that activity of purchasing things from um, our local <coughs> shops um, and enjoying that space. And here at Public Health South, um, you know, we're part of the Southern District Health Board, um, and our aim is to create healthy social, physical, and cultural environments. Um, and so I guess our approach that we're taking is we're really looking at, at the evidence around that healthy streets approach and those 10 healthy street indicators um, that our streets to create well-being and um, healthy lifestyles that will support good well-being and health outcomes. Um, we are looking for um, indicators that you all know about, that we have pedestrians from all walks of life who can access um, our public places with easy to cross streets, there's shade and there's shelter, there's places to stop and rest, it's not too noisy, as people choose to walk, cycle and use public transport, people feel safe, there's things for people to see and do, people feel relaxed, 
and there's clean air to breathe so people can enjoy that experience. And so these are the indicators that have kind of, I guess, driven us to that outcome of thinking that the one-way option would be the preferred option um, that you're going to be um, reviewing today with the detailed business case. Um, I guess also in that equation, we just want to point out that in previous submissions, we have encouraged um, to improve the walkability and the cyclability of our city. And we've also supported public um, transport initiatives. And with the public transport initiatives that you're doing in that area, we again see that the one-way option would promote people to use public transport and then to engage in that space um, when they get there, that it's a pleasant destination to arrive at. So hopefully that will also increase use of public transport systems, cycling, and pedestrianization of George Street. Um, so yes, green spaces, smoke-free, um, all come into mind, as well as making sure that um, these, you know, these these streets that we have are accessible to all. And that's where I do hope that you heed the advice that you receive from the disability support groups on this matter, that you do things to universal design using the parks tool um, from the university and other tools to make sure that we actually do create spaces where everyone can access and that we don't exclude those who are oftentimes disadvantaged in many aspects of, of, um, of, of life, you know, when it comes to accessing housing and other needs, that we at least create open public places where everyone can access regardless of people's abilities. And that will create safety for all. You have one minute. So, yeah. so I think that pretty much captures what I wanted to say. The only thing that I saw missing from some of the discussions was around drinking fountains. So I would also advocate that whatever option is chosen, that we have some uh, public drinking fountains and Public House South has created some advice on what are some of the best options in that regard. I'm finished. Thank you for your time. Kia for that. I rudely interrupted you for no reason. You're happy to take questions? Are you happy to take questions? I am, but I, I can't say I can speak for all of the council. I'll do my best. With, with all the appropriate caveats. Councillor Reddick. Hi. Um, are you aware that the uh, options on the table before us uh, have no public transport on George Street? challenge that I know the retail sector was looking for in, in previous submissions where they would like people to be able to have public access to that in some way on that one way. Um, but we also do realize that there'll be a group of people that if there's accessible streets from, I suppose, the bus hub, will be able to access um, those, you know, if there's adequate footpaths for them to access. So, I, yeah, I think it's a challenge. and. Um, that yeah, I don't have any answers to other than that, so. Councillor Vanivis. You are from Public House South and you've talked about Southern District Health Board. Is the view that you've presented that of the Southern District Health Board, Public House South, or is it just your personal view? Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess mostly it's my personal view, which has been informed by the submissions that we've made to council on the, um, you know, on the long-term plan, as well as the 2019 <coughs> submission on the tertiary precinct. So that has informed the views um, that I'm expressing today. Right. You're in favor of one way for George Street. Are you also in favor of two-waying the current one-way system? past the hospital. I think, yeah, I think that is probably outside my knowing, but I did see a submission on that, and I think they were advocating um, that Public House South preferred the two-way system traffic in both directions around the hospital area, with right. my understanding, but you know, I may be wrong on that. Okay, and finally, are you aware that in consulting with the public, that the vast majority of the submissions to last year's annual plan were opposed to uh, doing anything in George Street, and that the biggest petition that we have had this century, six and a half thousand signatures, was also opposed to 
uh, spending a lot of money on George Street. Are you aware that all of our feedback so far, or the vast majority of it, actually opposes the George Street development? I think you know, I'm expressing a view that I'm advocating for those who want active lifestyles and access for all. And so that's, I guess, the view that I'm taking today to make sure that voice, which might be a minority voice, is heard. But ultimately, it's up to esteemed councillors to make the final determination for what's required for our city. Thank you for that. Cheers. Councillor Gary. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I wondered if you would comment on the uh, initiative to expand um, mobility parking in the area. You talked about uh, an inclusive area and uh, we were touching on the difficulty for some people to access uh, George Street. Um, what would be your comment uh, about accessibility and mobility parking and the expansion of that? I don't have any firm views, but I would encourage you to listen to the experts in that area. Um, and I suppose if Mary O'Brien is speaking today, that she may be able to provide advice from that disabilities community so their voice can be amplified. And I would endorse the voice, their voices in that regard of what their needs are. I can't speak on their behalf. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, uh, kia ora. I thought it was interesting that you started your comments by saying you were um, voting, you know, well not voting, but um, advocating for one way because you wanted to support business vitality. Are you aware that the businesses are strongly against one way and, and want two way? Their concern is that it'll do exactly the opposite to what you were um, advocating for. I guess it's just, yeah, I guess there's just a question of, um, yeah, I guess I'm coming from the perspective which may be more from, again, that Friday City's kind of framework of, of having um, a livable city where people can um, congregate and actually move freely on the streets. And, and I guess, like I said before, advocating that everyone could have that opportunity to access, um, yeah, to access our retail sector. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. May Mainville, for your, for your time and for your submission. That is our five minutes uh, for questions. Appreciate that. I will uh, further move that we extend the time of the public forum beyond half an hour, uh, seconded by Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Third uh, on the list uh, for public forum today. Uh, and was um, well segued from our previous speaker, Mary O'Brien, uh, from CCS Disability Action, who will join us on the screen shortly. Ms. O'Brien, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. We, 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 we saw you very briefly and now we can't. Um, oh. I'm not sure if that's a strategic choice on, on your part or a technical issue. Here we are. Oh, and now you're gone. Uh, I've gone again. Hang on. There Don't touch go. anything. <laughs> The, ne the next five minutes are all yours, uh, Mary, and then uh, and we'll give you a warning with a minute to go, should it be necessary. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is everybody, um, your worshiping councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to make this um, submission. And I also would like to thank the council staff who have worked really hard to accommodate the submitters and the management of the zoo before we join this great. Today, at looking at the plan, at a first glance, you might just think, well, this is a simple decision about traffic movement, but it's much more than that. It's a very complex decision which will influence livability and wellbeing. The Council achieving its aspirational goal of Dunedin being one of the world's greatest small cities and fitting with the government policy statement on land transport. That states that the purpose of the transport system 
is to improve people's well-being and their ability to face unexplored places. And this fits with the way that um, Waka Kautahi is moving as well. We're looking at the detailed business case, it states that there's not much difference between the options for travel times and congestion across the network. So that means that when you're making the decision, you must very carefully scrutinise the options with the lens of the one in four New Zealanders who are disabled and the elderly people who are significantly disadvantaged by inaccessible footpaths and will make up the bulk of the future Tunisian population. Just looking at some of the key factors um, in the report, safety, accessibility and amenity value. Pedestrians just don't use other safe areas. If it's not safe, they won't go unless they absolutely have to. The wider footpaths and the one-way options will allow for a safe, obvious, very accessible route along the shop frontages. The remainder of the footpath will allow ample space for other pedestrians and enhance the city's walkability. It's activity zones, these are the key things really, will create places to stop and rest for people with limited mobility or stamina. We'll all be in that group one day. Um, children will just be placed to socialise or just be. The one way vehicle movement zone will slow traffic create an accessible and safer transport environment. The ample um, space allows for mode separation and will create obvious space for cyclists and micro mobility users. The two-way option will provide less space for these factors and the traffic speed of 10k per hour is less likely to be achieved. This will encourage cyclists and micro mobility users to use the pedestrian spaces because they're afraid of the faster traffic. Faster traffic and two lanes to cross will increase the risk of crossing the road for all pedestrian users. Talking now about the bus hub, bus movement and public transport. Once again, this isn't a straightforward decision. It's not buses on or off George Street or one-way versus two-way. This is about creating ways to get people to where they want to go. Proximity is the really important thing for people. Um, so that means that the council has to look at creating ways to get people close to where they want to be and providing several options. For example, smaller buses that link with the main bus service um, and a frequent loop bus, a free loop bus, with multiple drop-down and pick-up spaces. Looking at this in a different view and looking between... This is your one... Minutes. Sorry, this is your one minute warning, Mary. Okay, right. So we'll move right along. Yeah. <laughs> um, you need to look at this in the context of public transport and look at ways of getting people into town. For example, the on-demand service that Timaru has introduced. Um, this decision really is about bringing people into the city and, sorry, there we are, bringing a loose range of people into the city and will create vibrancy and rejuvenate the retail and hospitality sector by spending money. If you look at some of the success stories in the retail business case, it's actually 5.2.6, which are related to New Zealand, it will confirm this. We strongly support a one-way system. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Kia ora, Ms O'Brien. Questions? Councillor Elder. Thank you for presenting. Um, I, have about, I have three questions. Um, when you look at the plan and you look at mobi mobility parking in the plan, are you happy with the amount of mobility parking along George Street? something that the council needs to look at pretty carefully. Um, there are no set guides for mobility parking and that needs to be something that the um, detailed case of the rest of the planning looks at. We also need, oops sorry, that's my other computer. Um, 
we, we need to look at that carefully and look at it with the um, ageing population increased things as well. Yeah. Uh, my second question is, um, in urban planning, um, there's a lot of talk about walking distances and the need for resting places. So in the plan, do you think um, there's enough resting places along George Street if people can't walk far? Um, again, I haven't met those in and I think that's something that comes into detailed business case but they're certainly essential and I think we've all probably had an experience of just wanting somewhere to sit down from time to time and sociability as well. The last question um, is regarding public transport and the, and the bus hub and accessibility and your mention of um, a de desire to get people you know, to George Street and along George Street. Um, have, have people talked to you about that and, and what, what is their desire for the bus system in general? Yes, people speak about that quite a lot and one of the key things is getting from the bus hub and to the destination, be that the hospital, the town, the octagon. What we know at the moment is that there are people who don't use those facilities anymore because they can't reach them. Mm. So I think this reflects back to what I said, you've got to have a creative way to do that. And I think something like a loop bus or other alternatives are just essential. Also adding to that, um, the free on-demand bus in Timaru has proved to be very access successful. And when speaking with the council staff member that managed that, I asked her about it and her response was, People are doing things they've never done before. Mm. I thought, wow, what is this? And she said, they're going out and they're visiting friends. And what we do know is that there are a lot of people that don't access the centre of city because they can't get there because it's not accessible or too expensive. And if you want to draw those people in and draw everybody in, then you've got to link it all together. Somebody can get from home and get to town they on the main bus service or a demand-driven one. And if you have those services that are fully accessible, it frees up the mobility taxes, which are expensive mm. and limited. People have to book well ahead. You can't just make a decision and say, I'll go to town for lunch, because there won't be one. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Mary, can I just ask you a question, picking up on the point of around public transport and, and, and the loop bus. The advice we've been given is that for a bus network to run, or a bus route to run efficiently, it needs to travel in both directions. Uh, if you had to choose between there being a, a one-way street on George Street or a street that could accommodate such a bus service, which would your priority be? Our priority would still be for, um, for one-way. Two-way um, systems, even if the slow speeds and things, are less successful, cars are less likely to travel more slowly. It just means that we have to think broader than a bus system going along George Street or a loop bus. That, that's just, um, they're the first options that come to mind. I mean, we're in the 21st century, other cities are using all sorts of things like perhaps little golf carts or having mobility scooters available. And then again, it's thinking of those, that very small group of people who've got very limited access to town, providing more services for them. Yeah, so our preference will always be for the one for the one way system. Thank you. Um, thank you. Councillor Reddick. Uh, I was just wondering if you're aware that the one way and the two way options both have the same footpath width. Yeah, but the, 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 um, according to the plan, there's greater space for amenity, and that's what, um, attracts people. It's, the, it's getting there, it's getting down. It's, I think if you look at those plans with the safe, obvious and step-free principles which are now coming into transport planning, they're pretty self-explanatory. People won't go anywhere if it's safe. If it's obvious that you can be on the footpath and this is your area to walk, that's fine. And if it's obvious that there's other space for cyclists and cars, then you will find that it, it's much better. The two-way, <coughs> excuse me, 
transport is less difficult to um, control. They go a bit faster and it's just generally not as fast. So. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien, for your time this morning and for your submission. Much appreciated. Thank you all very much, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. It's a beautiful day out there. Fourth, 1.4, Mr. Budd from the New Zealand Automobile Association on his way in now. Welcome, sir. I'm not sure how much of the preamble you've heard, but you've got five minutes uh, should you choose. Uh, and if, if you're still going at four minutes, we'll let you know you've got a minute to go. OK, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Malcolm Budd, um, AA Otago District Chairman. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to our submission today regarding the George Street redevelopment. Well, I also want to thank the Council for inviting AA Otago to be involved in both the project team's workshops and taking on board our recommendations. AA currently represents 46,000 members in the Otago region. These members are not only motorists, but also pedestrians, cyclists, disability and public transport users, as well as we represent all other road users. Our prime focus is for people to be able to move efficiently and safely across the city and be able to easily access parking. Our prime focus <coughs> is that the AA supports the two-way option as presented by the project team at the second workshop. But in saying that, we do not support a 10 km an hour speed limit. We consider this as unrealistic and unenforceable, as do the police. We would prefer a more realistic speed limit of 20 km an hour. We do not support the one-way option for George Street, as we consider this as unworkable and will create traffic congestion in the outlying streets, in particular Frederick, London, Ballool and Great King Streets and the surrounding intersections. With the limited modelling that was available, which indicated currently there is a marked increase in traffic volumes on Ballool Street, particularly during peak times, with George Street being one way, this will increase traffic volumes and create further congestion. We also consider the one-way option will restrict access to the Golden Centre and Great King Street parking buildings, and with the loss of half the current car parks is a concern. George Street currently is the main, one of the main routes through the city. By making this one way, it will potentially force traffic onto the current one-way street systems being State Highway 1. But we consider it will also restrict access for traffic movements from west to east and vice versa again creating congestion, in particular at the surrounding intersections. As I said, AA represents 46,000 members, of which a selected number from each age group were surveyed and 75% did not support a one-way system on George Street. Once again, thank you for your opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions. Kia ora, Mr Budd. We have some among our number. Councillor Benson Pope. <coughs> Thank you, Worship. Um, hello, Mr Budd. Just in respect to that last comment you made about membership views, um, my wife and I and our two children are all AA members. I don't recall ever seeing a request for a response from the AA about this issue. Did I just miss something? Not, not everybody is selected. As I said, a selected number from each age group, so not every 40, not 46,000 were surveyed. Okay. You, earlier, earlier on you talked about um, the availability of parking. You are aware, I assume, of the considerable spend that Council has already committed in respect of wayfinding and, and making sure that people more readily know where the available parking is. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you'll be aware of the parking road, rap, <coughs> road map report from MC Cagney, MR Cagney, 
uh, that we committed, um, and that fact that that demonstrates, in their view, that there is ample parking in the city, but an issue in finding it, uh, and you'll be aware of the amount of money that council has already committed to improve that, to solve that problem, so that people can f more readily find where parking is available. Yep, I accept that, but what our concern is that if it's one way, it will restrict access for people to be able to get to that parking. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Richard. Kia ora, Malcolm. Um, I just have a question around the parking. When you've said that the that the changes would be the loss of half of the current car parks, and in the attachment that we've got on page 193, it actually does outline the parking, and I've just been adding it up, and I can't see that it's half. The current parks are 95, with the one way it would be 78 parks, and then with the two way it would actually be 60 parks. So I just wonder where you got the information from that it would be cutting the number of car parks in half that are available. That, that's what we took out of the, um, of the options that were presented by the project team. The one-way street system in George Street would reduce the parking by half what it is now. I, I just, oh, I'm just going to suggest that you had just have a look at the um, page 193 and 194 of our attachments. That might give you some um, some comfort around the number of parks that will be available. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Budd, for the presentation. Um, I've been an AA member for 20 years now. Um, an AA member who, who cycles more than he walks. Um, and my personal view is if it remains two-way, because of perceived danger, I won't take my cycle along George Street. As my AA rep, what do you say to that? Sorry, I can't pick that up. It's just so muffled. I'm just saying, as an AA member who cycles more than he drives, I likely wouldn't cycle George Street if it remains two-way because of danger. As my AA rep, what do you say to that? I, I just I cannot hear that question. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Councillor Gary. My question's been answered, thank you. We've exhausted questions. Thank you, Mr Budd, for your time and for your submission this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. 1.5 in the public forum, Alan Race. A bit early for that, Alan. It's always 11 o'clock somewhere. Uh, we can't see you other than your still image of you holding what looks to be a lovely Sauvignon Blanc, or maybe it's a Pinot. Now we can. Now we can. Uh, and I'm not sure if you've heard the preamble, but you have uh, five minutes uh, should you choose. We'll give you a warning with a minute to go if it's necessary. Thank you. We're all yours. to talk this morning. Urban Access has participated fully uh, in the uh, stakeholder meetings and with the workshops that the project team um, have run and we've appreciated being able to contribute to those. Um, we support a vibrant central city and we certainly want Broad Street to be able to work for all users. Uh, our survey that we did last July showed that, uh, and that was a survey of uh, over a thousand people, showed that 75% of those surveyed came into the city by their car. Uh, the, they favoured the car over alternative public transport. But people like the freedoms of their cars and they like the freedoms of being able to choose when and where they go. Now, people without cars obviously won't want to necessarily agree with um, having cars everywhere, but these are the transport of choice. So limiting access to the CBD will simply result in fewer people coming in, unless there is good parking facilities and possibly a good loop bus option. And we do favour that. A large portion of our population 
uh, do work in the CBD, and of course they're also the shoppers. So often they're the lunchtime people who move around the, the area. Um, unfortunately, public transport is really not working as well in Dunedin as we would all like. For public transport to work well, it needs to be cheap, it needs to be efficient, and it needs to be frequent. And unfortunately, in some areas, this just does not happen. Uh, Princess Street is an example of what happens when fewer people are able to get into the area, and is an area which has fewer parking availability. What happens is the shops start to close, and then the area just starts to deteriorate. And what we don't want to see is this happen to George Street. There are a lot of uh, empty shops in George Street now, unfortunately, and we certainly don't want to see these uh, increase and for George Street to become an area that nobody really wants to visit. Shoppers are attracted by the convenience of parking, and a two-way option does have that choice that people can get uh, a closer proximity to where they're actually intending to want to be. But businesses need people to come in and buy their goods. This is what makes a vibrant uh, business centre. And, and of course, it's not just retailers that are in George Street. There are a lot of commercial premises and uh, professional premises that are in George Street as well. Failure to support the businesses is something that the council can't afford to do. And I would read in the report the uh, concept of a good partnership between the council, the business owners, uh, and the property owners, and we will support uh, the three parties working close together for the future development of George Street. One of the areas that we are concerned about, though, is the traffic modelling. And the traffic modelling deals with the uh, area on either side of George Street, primarily Great King Street and Camille Street. What is of concern to us is that if George Street changes to a one-way, and we don't have any fixed view as to whether it should or whether it shouldn't, but if it does, then where does the traffic that would have gone in the opposite direction go, and what parts of the network will then have a greater traffic flow? That's one, uh, that's, that's one minute, yeah. Alan. Okay, thank you. The, the modelling sort of is a bit similar to what happened to the bus hub, which showed that uh, it, it, it failed to identify congestion happening in other areas. Um, I think the, uh, uh, an impact of 10 k's an hour speed limit is of concern, and we understand that's for a shared street, but if traffic is slow, and we found that last year, then it's going to take a long time for any traffic on Broad Street to actually move. Now that means that exhaust fumes are going to be um, more prevalent in the area uh, and really doesn't align with the emissions plan that the city has. So we want you to think really carefully about what your long-term plan for George Street is. If it is for people to be able to um, have curbside cafes, well then traffic right next to them, whichever direction it goes, is not particularly pleasant if it's slow and just sitting there idling. That's, um, that's a perfect pause to accentuate your five minutes. Are you happy to take questions? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Race. Um, I wonder what you, I would be interested to know what you would say to those from the disability community who have very clearly stated uh, the preference for one way and all of the amenity uh, and space that that provides and inclusiveness. Uh, I wanted to know what you would say to the disability sector who have very clearly uh, stated that they have a preference for a one way in terms of the safety and accessibility uh, that it provides. Uh, I think our preference, if we've made it clear even in our workshop, that we would prefer to one. Um, we do accept though that uh, we want the area to be more 
use it readily for pedestrians because all motorists are pedestrians, of course, and we're all shoppers. Um, if it was to be a one-way option, we would favour the one-way south. I'm not sure if that's actually asking your question. I found it quite echoey. There are no further questions, Mr Race. Thank you for your time this morning and for your submissions. Appreciate it. Thank you. One point six Finn Campbell. Blink twice if you can hear us, Finn. Can you hear us, Finn? Are oh, you rebranding? That's okay. <laughs> Mr. Campbell and half of two other people uh, on your left and right flank, uh, welcome. You have five minutes, uh, should you choose to use it, we'll give you a warning with a minute to go, uh, and, uh, and if you're happy to take questions there will be some, uh, undoubtedly, otherwise we're all yours. It's taken us six submitters for someone to be on mute. <coughs> um, perhaps they're not. We, we can't hear a we can't hear a thing uh, that you're saying. Um, indeed. Um, you're on mute. Oh, they're not on mute, councillor. There's, there's, there's some there's some kind of technical problem. Ah, good, good. We'll quickly swap laptops and see if that comes up. No, we can hear you now. <laughs> don't, don't, don't touch a thing. Uh, I don't touch a thing. Yeah. So you got, um, you have five, oh, you heard, you would have heard what I said before, we just couldn't hear your response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got five minutes from now. Welcome.
These practical farms make George Street more accessible to be a great destination to improve business outcomes and to make it even a wholly more attractive place for the world. At the core of Temple Park, there are some important things that need to be lost for the compromise. Consider the hierarchy of accessibility needs, designed for the most vulnerable first and then be able to accommodate other users with less needs and experience. Some of these most vulnerable people, people with disability needs, the elderly people, parents, and children. Children, youth, teenagers, and their school users. Accessible design prioritizes the users first. And with our understanding of the disability, we do the most configurations of Short Street under how it works to cover all users and We were reminded during the consultation that parents who should be able to drive up the their kids on Short Street before they pick something up from the park. We want to really iterate that this limit of accessibility to the population will get people to use their homes and quickly get in and out of this place as it takes change to the there are games to be made in the Pedestrian girl wants to be spending 100% of their money in town and using their time to get people out of the ground and appreciating the amenities of space will bring about greater economic gains than the original space of Starcraft. As far as how this relates to the leaders' car and mutual objectives, this project can help reduce our transportation emissions by providing space for alternative trip making and consequently alternative journeys is a means of a better public space. Furthermore, think of Janine's approach to climate change. Came to a 100,000 piece digital bottle. Every project that we take is just one of them. And every time, every time we put it finished or placed, it gets to last another 18 years before we finish the journey. Bill Street is not an energy for the sun either. It is one of the most critical signals for the sun that we can put down. Right now, we decided that we got to get an 18 year event that we can call the necessary feature of our nature. Our first year driving on Georgia Street must be sent to Flora Street for the two, and pop up there for the last crowd to move every few months so that that's what we want to do. We can't do good stuff for anything if we drink the energy for us. Our decisions are based on limited access. We're aiming for the opposite. Making George Street a destination is easily achievable with the support of this council. We ask that this design include better accommodation crossing places to traverse across the street. That more space is allocated to foot traffic, and that parking only be given to loading zones and disability parks. We've got one minute. This will improve the safety of George Street, as well as allowing the pedestrians easier access to the entirety of George Street. While full pedestrianisation may be a bit of a stretch, we believe that increasing pedestrianisation by moving to a one-way system is an essential step in terms of swing to lead to a sustainable city <coughs> The George Street Redevelopment Project also presents us with wonderful opportunity to reimagine the role of public transport in this need. By creating a stronger connection and accessibility to the bus hub, we can strive to improve accessibility to the city centre, put in need lights, and reduce the need for car transport in the future. As the younger generation, we're set to inherit whatever the DCC decides to do, and therefore we better choose to consider our position. We have a prime opportunity to shape the into a sustainable city for the future. Let's bring Zanin from 100% catered to cars down to 99.9% and with that, create an 18 year statement on that direction. Thank you. And Aroha mai, I've forgotten the name of the chap on the left, but it would appear to me that the microphone of whatever device you're using is on your side. So whoever is answering the questions that come, uh, if they can lean in uh, to that side, that's probably going to be easier for us. You don't need to get any closer, Finn. Uh, yeah. I'm really here with that. Questions. Yeah, so I'm going to start with the questions. Good grief. Uh, Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Tina Koto Katoa. Um, I wonder, do, do you guys realise that in the option for the two-way, it's got flexibility that it can go? We've got um, the proposal in the papers we've seen has automated boulevards that I thought were quite cool, and they um, give the option that you can close it off to one way or fully pedestrianise it and it gives it an easy option. It also has smart city, you know, like we can go, all those things that we could do with one way, we can also do with two way, like re, you know, revamp the street, um, do all those things. But um, with one way, um, you can't, you don't have that flexibility to change it in any way once it's done with the two way you do. The other thing I don't know whether you realize is 
that with the one way we've been told we couldn't have the loop bus. So keep that in mind. I don't know whether that affects your decision, you know, like how you feel about um, one way or two way, but we had hoped that a loop bus would bring commuters out of their cars and into town, and, you know, and, and up we, and down. And Councillor, we had hoped that a question would be forthcoming. Is there one? Yeah, so that's the question. Those are the questions. Good luck. I think it, if, you can, if you can do those sort of bollard adaptations with the two-way design, I, I think it would be un, unreasonable to think that you could not put that same amount of effort into the one-way design. But why, why would we pick the one-way? The two-way design is kind of like that default state of where the street sits. And we think that that default state should be closer to pedestrianisation through the one-way design because it had better um, safety needs and at, the, the amount of allocation of that public space is already better set up for, for having a pop-up event or having something happening, you know. It's all right, yeah, we can, we can see the benefits of having that flexible two-way design, but yeah, just having the, uh, having it as a default state is our preferred option. And yeah, we, when uh, we were talking through the consultation, we do realise that it, do, it does seem like it's a real problem bringing buses down George Street, and that's, uh, we we can't we can't deny that it is disappointing that this is something that we could potentially be, be losing. We think a, a real uh, good feature of sensible city design is allowing buses to get pretty close to where they ought to be. And uh, we realised that if we weren't able to put buses down George Street, that council probably unfortunately would have to work with the ORC to. Um, make some other accommodations elsewhere um, and other small features, just just around, around that space. Because I think it's like, if we didn't put an effort into accommodating work for buses, I think we would be in a, we would, we would be stuck in a tight position. And so I think no matter what goes on with the two-way or the one-way, better work still needs to be done as, uh, as other supporting uh, features of making the centre of the town a better place to spend time. Thank you. Was I close enough? Can I? Can I? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Those are two. Those are two very. Those are two very different questions. Councillor Lofisol. Tenako, your worship. Tena Koto. Um, your second speaker could not be heard very well, but I picked up um, uh, as part of the argument for one way about economical opportunities increased economic opportunities. Can you speak to more to that, to the yeah, microphone? Sure. Um, so I guess for, for our understanding, it does, uh, not a single person will buy something on George Street from the confines of their car. Um, it's kind of technically impossible unless they, George Street manages to fit some drive-throughs in there. And so, yeah, it's not surprising. And so in, in looking at that, we're saying, if we, if, when we're supporting pedestrianisation, pedestrian access, those are the people who are spending the dollars. The people who aren't there, who these retailers are losing out from, are people who are shopping online, who have no interest in going and spending time in a quality place. And so for us, it, it's making it a pleasant location, uh, making it something that you're just worth spending time in. Catching the sun on a beautiful Dunedin morning would be bloody excellent on George Street, and that would be like a great reason to go out there and, and spend time. With. So I think increasing, like, if we make it a pedestrian space, that will increase foot traffic. Most businesses want more foot traffic. I think their their concern about like losing our business from from these changes is related to the to, to the perception that because there aren't car parks on George Street, that there won't be uh, foot traffic out in front of their stores. And that's something that we disagree with. That's something I don't like going shopping at George Street by car. I like to go in there. I like to go spend time on those year rounds, maybe get a coffee before buying something. Yeah, it's, it's about making it a, a point of difference from the internet shopping area and making, you know, thinking and reflecting on that, that principle that this is a destination location and we've got to work best to those values that we'll be having in as a way that increases pedestrian for Jago, and that's why we think we will be good for business. Thank you, Mr. Campbell.
Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you for your time and for your submission this morning. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you very much, and we appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. Uh, have a good afternoon. One point seven, our anti-penultimate speaker for today's public forum, Joe Miller from Grey Power. Kia ora, Joe. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Good morning. Thank you. Can you Mo hear me? Most excellent. We can. You, the next five minutes are all yours. We'll give you a warning with a minute to go. I'll try not to interrupt you mid-sentence, uh, but it may not be avoidable. That's fine. Thank you for the opportunity. What I would like to make at the very start is there's actually, I believe, two ways of looking at how we're going to fix up George Street to make it look really good. But the predominant thing is, is it going to be done so that it enhances the university and the students who come through the city? Or is it being done for the permanent residents of the city? My hope is that that's the second factor. The first one will automatically happen if we enhance the second factor. There are two few things I would like to say, and they are fairly bullet points, and I'll try and make them as short as I can. One, we would like to see George Street retained as a two-way street. Bearing in mind that a lot of the people that we're hoping to go in there will be our older people and will be our young mothers and children. And we believe that two sides of the street is more practical for both lots of people. If we have parking on either side, perhaps predominantly it could be for disabled or young people's parking like they have in the supermarkets where young mothers can get easy access or elderly people can get easy access. One of the things I think we need to remember about George Street is it's not only a retail sector. It is an area where people can go to the opticians, they can go to medical centres, they can go to podiatrists, dentists, and it is often when they are doing that, they would like the opportunity to be able to stay a little bit longer and perhaps look at the shops or go and have a coffee or meet someone for afternoon or morning tea before or after their appointments. So I think we need to be looking at how we can encourage people to go into the city and stay in there a wee bit longer. The most important part of the whole scenario is the access to George Street for those who do not have cars or transport to be taken in there. If we are going to persist with people having to come from the hub up to the centre city, then I believe this is going to stop before it even gets started. The number of people that I have spoken to who don't go into the city anymore because they find the trip from the hub up to George Street just a little bit too hard. And while it may well be that they can get around, the undulation of the streets doesn't help at all. I'm not asking you to put buses up George Street. I think that's stupid. What I have suggested is that in conjunction with the regional council, consideration may well be given to seeing whether some of the bus routes could be altered so that they come down and up St Andrew Street, George Street, uh, sorry, not George Street, up and down St Andrew Street, Frederick Street, and those streets along there so that people could get off at a bus stop and walk around the corner into George Street, do their shopping or whatever they need to do, come back round the corner, hop on the bus and <coughs> down to the hub. There needs to be some enabling transport between the city and the hub. It is really actually too far for a lot of elderly people. And it's also quite a trek for mothers with young children who've also done some shopping. So I would ask you to give some consideration to that. The other thing I would like you to bear in mind is that this is a long-term plan. And you people are going to be in my situation in another 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So how would you like to be able to access George Street in your 70s and 80s? I think I've said about all I really want to cover. Thank you. Thank you. Um... 
I do hope I have all my remaining faculties in 15 to 20 years' time. Uh, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, Joe. I also want to note that you were the fastest on the microphone and the video of everybody. Um, Mary O'Brien made the suggestion that um, some councils, I don't know if it's around New Zealand or in the world, offer mobility scooters at their bus hubs um, for people with mobility issues on demand. Um, and are you, would you be comforted with the idea that the buses would run up St Andrews, um, Great King Street, as I should say, um, to, to, to Falu and then make their way over to George after that? So there will be a block away running all the way down George? And I guess if that's the case, would you want to see some assistance on getting people from those buses to George Street? You're actually quite hard to hear because you're echoing quite badly. Yeah, I'm quite hard to hear anyway, but yeah. You are, you are saying we do need the bus, the buses close to some bus transport close to, up to George Street. That's an essential. I, I can, oh, if, if you can hear me okay, I'll try and ask the question again. Uh, uh, Councillor O'Malley's question was, um, uh, following on from a suggestion made by an earlier submitter, uh, would you be comforted if, if people looked into mobility scooter on-demand type options for people with more limited mobility to get them to the main street from wherever the buses end up on Frederick Street or St Andrews Street? Those sorts of solutions for those people. Well, no, because that really doesn't cover the areas apart from... I mean, I'm not here just talking on behalf of the older people. I believe that some of our young mothers need some help and assistance, and I wouldn't like to see anybody on the most limited scooter with two or three kids in there. <laughs> 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 I don't want to <laughs> Or a motorised mountain buggy, uh, for that matter. Councillor uh, Gary. Thank you, Worship. Um, first of all, Ms Muller, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear I might uh, pose the question and ask uh, His Worship to communicate. Um, would you agree that if we, uh, in our decision making, if we choose the option uh, that um, is best for the most vulnerable in our city, then it will be best for everybody? It's fine. I'll, 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 try, I'll try and communicate. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Your Worship. It would be helpful if you could actually relay the question. I really can't hear it in your brain. Yeah, um, that's fine, and I'll try my best. Um, the, the question is, uh, it was a statement seeking your, uh, seeking your opinion uh, around whether or not, in, in terms of the, how we approach our decision-making, uh, the statement was, if we make decisions that take into account the needs of the most vulnerable people in our community, uh, that that would then serve the best needs of the wider community. Well, yes, I always have a, a, a belief that if it works for the elderly, and they're probably most vulnerable, if it works for the elderly, it will work for anybody. If you've got easy access for the vulnerable and the old and elderly to get around, and move freely and easily, it's equally as easily for everybody else to be able to do the same thing. And the second part of my question was to ask, what would be your response to the disability sector who uh, prefer the one-way system? Se seeking your feedback on the uh, advocacy from the disability groups who are promoting, uh, on behalf of their membership, uh, the, the one-way street design. We actually had some discussion on that. We're quite surprised that they've come up with that because to us, that they are going to be worse off than probably some of the older people because they will need to cross the streets, which is something that we don't believe um, is, is, it should be happening. We should be, it should be as easily accessible on either side of the street without having to cross the street to go to where you need to be. Uh, Councillor Walker, please make it short. I have to relay. Yeah, I'll just go through here. Like, you're like a BBC correspondent doing translation from Farsi to English. Um, can you ask Jo, please? Um, she alluded to the fact that um, she preferred the two the two way because there'd be two sides of the street. Can you ask Jo? She's aware that the one way doesn't preclude that. One way still has two sides of the street. Yeah, and the the the, the question is is around um, the because. It, there will be parking provided on both sides of the street, 
whether that street is heading in one direction or in two directions in terms of providing access for people to move out of the road corridor, if you like. It's, it's a statement, not a question. Uh, just make, just <laughs> raising that with you, whether you're aware of that. I, I am aware of the fact that there is parking on both sides. My idea of the fact of being a two-way is you do, if you park on the left-hand side and you need to go somewhere on the right-hand side, then that's where you would go. Otherwise, you'll be, if you're coming up one way and you're going to go somewhere, you're going to drive up the way you want to go. If that doesn't happen, you're going to drive right the way around to get parking on the other side. It makes more sense to me that if you've got parking on both sides, then there should be access to both sides. Can I, can I ask, just finally, is it, your, is it your desire or opinion that people shouldn't need to or shouldn't be able to cross uh, the street without, going, without walking up to the next signalled intersection, uh, crossing the street and then moving back, as opposed to being able to cross between sets of lights, if you like? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm one of those who's a great fan of crossing with the lights, because crossing and dodging traffic is not a very good idea at the best of times. And that is one of the concerns that I have, is if you're going to have a one-way street, how frequent are you going to have accessible crossings along that road? So I just think that also can slow things down a little bit and make it uncomfortable for people having to cross between traffic. Thank you, Joe. We appreciate your time this morning and your submissions. We got there in the end. Uh, thank you. Uh, next. Thank, thank you all very much indeed for the opportunity. Bye. Miss. Waving into the abyss. Uh, Mr. King was there a moment ago. Now he's back. Kia ora, Alex. Can you hear us okay? It would appear not. Can you hear us? No. It's certainly easier when... We're not, we're not on mute. I can see that, I think. Can you hear us? Oh, good. Oh, can you hear me? I oh, we can, not we, hear anything from the council. Yeah, we can. Speak, my speakers weren't said correctly, but it might be working out. We can hear you, Alex. Can you hear us? Mr. King is going to re enter the meeting now that he's corrected the speaker.
I'm, I'm the ghost of GSO's past. I, I'm, I'm happy to do that if Mr. F if Mr. Ford is in the waiting room. Uh, it seems like the most efficient way of dealing with this. Welcome, Mr. Ford. We can hear you, but we cannot see you. Right. I'm just turning on my video now. <laughs> uh, kia ora, Chris. Yeah, the, um... Uh, sorry, we've been dealing with technical issues, not with you. Um, but thank you for, for being ready to go. The next five minutes are yours. Uh, and then and we'll give you a warning with a minute to spare, should it be necessary. Uh, and then we can take questions, should there be any. Okay. Kia ora Toto, Committee Chair, Mayor Aaron, and Councillors. In a brief time available, we'd just like to reiterate a number of key things that DPA believes will be crucial in your decision today as a Council. Firstly, we support a one-way southbound option, but would be happy to see it go one-way northbound if the decision came to that. Secondly, we favour the southbound one-way option as we believe the greater pedestrianisation will benefit disabled people and indeed all Tadipati residents and visitors with greater ability to access our main thoroughfare and all of the retailing, community activity and other options available. Thirdly, it will enable better city arrangements to be made and also afford separate from parallel spaces for both pedestrians and cyclists and other transport modes such as e-vehicles. Furthermore, having a one-way street would afford each mode the road's safe space and place to navigate. Fourthly, we'd like to reiterate the need for an adequate number of mobility parks and temporary drop-off parks to be created in any one-way option vehicles, mobility taxis, and operation of mobility card holders to either park and or be dropped off. Fifthly, the one-way southbound option will afford greater space for the creation of activity zones, which can be easily accessed by everybody, and also places and spaces people and older people with mobility impairments, for example, or even parents carrying children or people carrying heavy loads from retail shops can sit and rest. Sixthly, however, we would like to raise a key point, and no doubt this has been raised by others. Both options under consideration today drop the idea of having buses run through them. DPA believes that buses are essential, especially for people with mobility impairments and older people, and some may be disadvantaged by having to walk up to George Street from the bus hub or other surrounding streets for bus stops. Instead, the full-sized buses aren't feasible on the proposed thoroughfare. The idea of a smaller bus loop and or shuttle service, which is fully accessible and inclusive should be looked at by the DCC and ORC as an alternative operation on either the one-way or two-way system and that this should be included in any final decision reached, especially if a one-way system is opted for. Ultimately, we'd like to see our preference cross the line today for the one-way option, preferably southbound but even northbound would be good. Even if the two-way option is decided upon, we hope that enough space will be retained for pedestrian access and activity spaces in so far as is possible. However, for the sake of our city, our inclusiveness, and ultimately our planet, 
we can make a social, economic, cultural, and environmental statement by going one way southbound. But, Chair. Kia ora, Mr Ford. You're happy to take questions? Yes, certainly. We have had some we have had some difficulty uh, with these, so you may end up getting asked them twice. He's hoping not, but uh, Councillor Raddick, if people could, if people could keep their questions uh, succinct, just in case I do have to paraphrase them uh, for the submitter's benefit. Yes, currently there's no provision for public transport on George Street with either of the options, but to me, two-way would uh, allow provision for public transport in both directions, perhaps with a smaller bus, like a loop bus. Uh, it surprises me that you don't prefer that option of having public transport running in both directions. You don't prefer the possibility of that? that could you repeat that question? It was, it, was more of a, it was more of a statement than a question, Councillor. If, if well, councillors have questions, I'm happy to uh, relay them. But if they're speeches, then I'm less inclined. Well, um, do you embrace the possibility of two-way having public transport in both directions? Well, uh, what I have said is that in any option that is agreed today, and especially if it's a one-way option, either way, then it should, there should be a public transport option, and one which is accessible and inclusive for everybody, including disabled people, Councillor. There appear to be no further questions, Mr Ford. Thank you for your, for your time and for your submission this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Leah. We're, we're going to have another shot at Mr King. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you this time. Uh, can you uh, hear me? Are you running that open source speaker software again? We can hear you fine. Uh, the next five minutes are all yours. Uh, we'll give you a warning with a minute to go should you need it. Right. Sorry, no, I'm actually a wee bit quiet, but um, I should just start now? Yeah, we, we can hear you fine, so that's, that's great. Excellent. Okay, so what I what I'm, want to talk about is, um, or the, or the reasons, reason behind it is, is I think we all agree that climate change is a big issue facing the city, which um, the council passed a resolution about recently, and we're going to get to... to to the, to the council's and, and the city's uh, climate target, we need to encourage a lot more people to travel by bus. And, um, and really a central pillar, I believe, of this redesign should be to, um, to achieve the change we need in terms of uh, mode shift from private cars onto buses. And so we'd prefer that the buses remain on George Street as a highly visible um, uh, you know, um, sign that you know that buses are important and, and that buses are, um, are the way of the future, and uh, and and for that reason, we prefer that the, that George Street remains two way. Obviously, because it, it, may, it means the buses can travel in both directions. We don't we don't want the buses to be um, sidelined, put off, uh, you know, put out of the main off of the main street um, to a side street. Um, mostly because of that visibility issue and keeping buses front and centre. Um, but, but if that is to happen, uh, if, if they are going to be moved to Great King Street, which doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to be an, um, we don't seem to have that option really, it just seems to have been already decided, it's not a, it's not a thing that seems to be being consulted on, but if, we, if that is going to happen then um, that it goes to Great King Street, then, then really Great King Street needs to be primarily for buses, um, buses should get priority in, in Great King Street if, if they move to Great King Street. Um, there should be a, a stop every block in Great King Street, not just one stop between um, between the Octagon and, and um, Frederick Street, but there should be a stop each block. That's the way it always used to be uh, until, until quite recently. Um, I think it says in the report here that they're going to replace one, one stop on George Street with one stop on Great King Street, but the, the problem is that when they uh, a few years in the past, when they when they bought in the bus hub, bus hub, we lost a whole lot of stops at that stage. So while it might be replacing one for one at the moment, it's still um, insufficient in terms of what we used to have. And this is one of the main complaints we get from from passengers on the buses, is that uh, there's there's highly insufficient number of bus stops in town, 
uh, when you get to the when you get to the town and you, you can stop in the bus hub, but nowhere else are there convenient places to get off. Oh, no, well, not, I wouldn't say nowhere else, but um, there's there's um, a lack of convenient bus stops uh, in the town, and and we believe that bus stops should be every 200 metres, basically every block in town, uh, where it's where it's close to town, where the um, you know frequency of places that people want to go to uh, is high. There should be a high frequency of bus stops as well. So um, that's um, that's that's pretty much what I want to say about that. I mean, recently I took the, the bus from St Kilda to town, and uh, it goes along Crawford Street along the one way, and there's no stop between um, Big Safe Furniture, which is near the Oval, and uh, and, and Queen's Gardens. It's a kilometre. It's a kilometre stretch of where you're, you're on the bus, you're going past all these shops, um, you know, um, second-hand shops, um, uh, been in, um, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of all kinds of shops, uh, Somerset House, all those kind of places. Um, you can't actually get off the bus um, and access those access those places uh, until we get to until we get to um, to Queen's Garden. So uh, it's it's a problem that we've been um, we've been uh, asking the regional council to rectify for for years and years, ever since the, the changes to the buses started happening. Um, now, I mean. As a whole, the bus service has improved. We've got a, a much better, better bus service than we had five years ago. But these, there are these things where they've been, uh, where, where it's been degraded uh, in, in, in ways that could easily be fixed. And, and it just seems that we don't get the priority for bus users. The bus users just seem to be at the bottom of the ladder in terms of, um, in terms of um, provision of bus stops and that kind of thing. So you got a minute to go, Alex. We want to meet our. our and our carbon goals, our climate goals. We need to make bus make bus travel as easy as possible. We need to have um, we have we have sufficient stops in town. Um, and so that's that's the main point I probably want to make in, in this submission. Thank, thank you. Um, and and it's certainly relevant in the grander scheme of things in terms of how the city centre functions, but. Uh, as you're aware, we have no direct decision-making influence over the design of the bus network. Uh, that's more of a cautionary message to anybody who wants to dive down that particular rabbit hole. But are you happy to take questions? Yes, I am happy to take questions. Excellent. Councillor Wiley. Mr King, are you speaking on behalf of any group or user? Uh, we are, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the bus, bus users that, are, that belong to our organisation, the bus users support group. Um, yeah, and uh, as I say, we get a lot of we get a lot of feedback from bus users who um, who uh, would like to see more convenient stops in the city. I mean, that's one of the biggest issues that we get we get feedback on. Okay, with the change in the perceived um, plan for buses going down Great King Street, and then turning left onto Frederick Street. Uh, and then go into the five-way um, intersection. Do you see uh, increased congestion, uh, especially outside the hospital and around those two intersections? Uh, so I'm just, just looking. I'm just looking on Google Maps for, at the moment to see. So the five-way intersection. This is. Uh, it's yeah. So let, let me let me remind myself. Um, yeah, it is. Right. So this is where it's newly. It's this is coming up Frederick Street, isn't it? And the buses are, are, are planned now to come up Frederick Street and turn right into George Street. Correct. So uh, coming past past the hospital, turning left onto Frederick Street. Yes. And then turning right or going up the hill. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I imagine that. that um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't really know whether there's going to be more congestion or, 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 or just the same amount. Um, what I think we should be aiming for is less cars in total using those intersections and more people on buses, and that would re reduce congestion with whatever whatever route the bus takes. Councillor Venevis. Hi. Um, you've said that you think we should have less cars in total and that buses are the way of the future. Are you aware that in 1950, in Western countries, passenger transport was predominantly bus and the next highest was cars and then it was trains after that, but that since the 1950s, 
passenger transport by bus has steadily and inexorably uh, reduced to the extent that it is now a fraction of what car transport is. What do, makes you think that buses are the way of the future when they're a Victorian well, mode that used to be... Uh, uh, you, you, you're right that, that buses have, have uh, been on a downward decline. Uh, at the moment, the only way... Uh, and, uh, uh, at the moment, the only, the only easy way to, to uh, reduce our carbon emissions in the transport sector is to get people back onto buses. Um, you know, there may be you know, trams or trains or, uh, or other public transport or, or um, certainly a lot more active transport. Obviously, you've got to focus on active transport as well as, as, well as public transport. Uh, but buses are the only option we have right at the moment. And uh, we're looking at redoing George Street. Uh, we have to look at what the situation is going to be in the next 10 years, in the next 50 years. Um, so we have to we have to plan for that, and, and you know the enabling works on Great King Street is what I'm talking about in terms of if you if you are going to definitely put the buses on the Great King Street, you have to make sure those enabling works are going to uh, cater for the buses we have today, and we've done fantastically well actually in Dunedin in terms of the bus patronage holding up um, in COVID uh, compared to Auckland, Wellington, and compared to compared to other cities. So actually we we're already seeing a turnaround. Um, uh, and the bus service, service holding up quite strong when you might have expected it to drop away sharply with COVID and people not wanting to congregate, etc. Et but in fact, our numbers have held up very, very well. Uh, and and we're, we're, we're set to explode, really. Um, if, if the council is serious about the climate target, <coughs> people in the Dean are serious about the climate targets, which many of us are, then, um, then the buses are. are um, it, it may not be the, for, the, for the far distant future, but in the, in, realistically, in the next 50 years, it's going to, be a big, it's going to have to be a big part of the solution. Councillor Elder. Hi there. Thanks, Alex, for your submission. Um, I just wanted to know, you're part of the Bus Users Support Group, and I was just wondering what the feedback of um, from, say, people who find access really hard, older people and disabled people, about the bus hub and how it's affected their ability to access George Street? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are people, I mean, there are people uh, who um, are disabled or elderly and really physically challenged who found it tough to get from the bus hub to, I mean, is it, uh, to from the bus hub, say, to the library, even to walk a block um, is tough for some people, and it's generally obviously the people who used to catch the bus all the time, the bus went right past the library, and now they have to walk a, a block further, and for some people that is too much, uh, um, unfortunately. For the great majority of people, I think the bus hub has been a, a good thing, um, people, many people are very pleased with, with the bus hub and the way it's turned out. Um, but there is there is a section that we that we would like to cater to um, who who find walking that far too hard and yeah so yeah there's people who just don't catch the bus anymore um, because they can't access um, the library and other other, other places in, in near the Octagon and, and and George Street that they used to be able to access. So uh, thank, you, thank you, Alex, uh, uh, thank you. for your for your time for your submissions. Your five minutes are up for questions uh, and thank you for your perseverance in, in addressing our technical concerns. Yep, thank you. Councillors, it's 11.41, which is not a bad effort, all things considered, but we do need to adjourn to allow for the room to be reset so that we can have humans sitting where the screen currently is. Uh, so I'll move that we adjourn the meeting for 10 minutes. Second, Councillor Walker, thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed.
Um, welcome back. Uh, there are no apologies for the meeting. Item three is confirmation of the agenda. I'll move that council confirm the agenda without additional alterations. Second of Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Uh, item four, declarations of interest. Any amendments to be made to the interest register? Being none, I'll move that council note the elected member's interest register confirms the proposed management plan and notes the proposed management plan for the executive leadership team. Seconded, Councillor Hall. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item five, confirmation of the minutes. Uh, I will move uh, that council confirm the public part of the minutes of the ordinary council meetings held on the 10th of August, the 27th of July and the 3rd of September uh, as a correct record. Seconded, Councillor Gary. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Item six, minutes of community boards. The Saddle Hill Community Board. Councillor Raddick. Yes, I, I move that the Council notes the minutes of the Saddle Hill Community Board meeting held on the 10th of June 2021. Seconded, Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 7, uh, West Harbour Community Board. Councillor Walker. Yep. Um, I'll move that the Council notes the minutes of the West Harbour Community Board meeting held on 9th June 2021. Braddock. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Uh, item 8, the Mosgiel Tairi Community Board, Councillor Houlihan. Yes, uh, thank you. I, want, I note the minutes of the Mosgiel Tairi Community Board meeting held on the 28th of July. So moved. Is there a seconder? Seconded, Councillor Raddock. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 9, the Otago Peninsula Community Board. Councillor Wiley. Yes, I move that the Council notes the minutes of the Otago Peninsula Community Board meeting held on the 24th of June 2021. Seconded, Councillor Staines. Thank you. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 10, uh, actions from resolutions of Council meetings. Any questions? Someone like to move? Move Councillor Stain, seconded Councillor Lord, that those uh, open and completed actions are noted. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Aye. Similarly, item 11, the Council Forward Work Programme. Any questions? Someone would like to move. Councillor Staines, thank you. Councillor Lord, thank you. Second. Uh, all those in no, Any discussion? All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 12, the forward work programme uh, from the 10-year plan, 2021 to 31, incorporating the 2022-23 annual plan. Uh, any questions? Some would like to move that that be noted. Move Councillor Hall, seconded Councillor Raddock. Thank you. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 13, a welcome to uh, Mr. Vo Mr. Von Pine, Mr. Drew and Dr. Hazelton. The Central City Plan retail quarter detailed business case uh, just foreshadowing but uh, in due course, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions before we get to that point. Uh, it's my intention to move uh, A and B, uh, that Council notes the findings of the uh, detailed business case and confirms its previous decision uh, to endorse a one-way design for the retail quarter George Street upgrade grade project, and then following that uh, we can uh, separately discuss which direction uh, it might go in. Sure. Councillor Hall is sitting back from this item. Anything in by way of opening from the gentleman at the end? Kia ora te uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity to um, speak and answer your questions this morning. I think uh, the only really opening comments that I have is that through the process so far we've been really, uh, found it really positive that many people and just about everyone that we've spoken to is passionate about George Street and they all want it to succeed. 
Um, it's how they see that success happening that is the difference. We, through the workshops, we particularly found that we needed to take quite a holistic approach to this. So part of the answer to making sure that George Street thrives as a retail quarter in the future is the infrastructure and the necessary upgrades. Part of it, though, is also the other attached document around the revitalisation plan, which is really taking a more holistic view of the area and thinking about the different ways we can manage and work in that area. And the third area that we think is really important is really around building those relationships. Um, as a result of the debate, we know that people have very strong feelings each way, but people want it to succeed. And there is a really good feeling out there about wanting this to be the best possible retail quarter that it can be in the South Island or even in the entire country. Through the DBC, all of the options were very close. And I can't you know, sort of stress how close they were. There was no clear recommendation for us working on this to come forward to you that clearly differentiated itself from the others. All of them deliver very clear benefits. Um, the difference between each of those things is very marginal. We feel that all can work. The modelling has demonstrated that. And ultimately, we felt it came down to a philosophical decision about how you use public space. And for that reason, we decided not to give a recommendation and felt that it was best for council to debate that issue. Kia ora, Dr Hazelton. Questions, Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I have two questions um, at this point. The first one is for Dr Hazelton. Um, thank you um, to all the staff, really, for the um, the extraordinary breadth of the reporting to us. If you want more facts, good luck. Um, but also for the summary report, which I think is a much more accessible document for the community. My question, though, um, can you confirm the accuracy of the statement that Councillor Barker made earlier about the reality of the number of parks on street in George Street um, compared two-way compared with one-way uh, which was, um, it would appear, uh, misconstrued, shall we say, by the AA. Uh, correct. I can confirm that it, it was uh, Councillor Barker's numbers were very, very close. Uh, 90, what we had was 97 uh, for the existing, 78 for one way and 60 for two way. So <coughs> Thank not you. Half. And my second question is for Mr Drew, I think. Um, you will have heard the uh, questions raised about the issue that's been outstanding ever since the bus hub went into its current location in respect of the need, f the community need for a lot of people to get to the shopping area or the closer to the library, whatever it might be. Can you confirm that whatever configuration we end up with, uh, some sort of shuttle arrangement is doable on a two-way or a one-way street configuration to accommodate that need? Yeah, so the, looking at um, accessibility, buses has been outside the scope of this detailed business case, but there is possibility to have some kind of shuttle through there. There are other possibilities as well with um, uh, working with ROC to change where existing bus routes go as per one of the submissions that you heard this morning. Councillor Lord. Yeah, actually, I think uh, Councillor Benson Pope probably asked my question, but I just wanted to phrase it slightly different. So if, the, uh, and it was just in response to a statement that was made earlier that I didn't quite pick up. So Councillor Hurlihan had said to one of the submitters on the Zoom that uh, there would be no options for a loop bus on George Street. Now, as I understand it, there would be absolutely nothing stopping uh, a loop bus going up past the museum, going up past the university, and then coming back down George. Kilometre per hour speed limit, and that, that is because it is shared space with cyclists, pedestrians, vehicles. Sorry, is that better? Um, the, the, the 20 kilometre an hour speed limit will probably affect the design uh, and, and will, would require probably drop curves or demarcation between um, the vehicles and the pedestrian movements. So, so it's linked with the design? It's linked with the design, That's helpful. so it'll compromise the design. Thank you. The second question, 
uh, was really for maybe Mr. H uh, Mr. Hazeltine, and it was I noted in the um, documents on page 118 that age concern preferred the one way, but that is not reflected. They're missing from the summary in the report. Um, did I get that right? And was that just an oversight? Um, that may just be an oversight, I believe. Uh, there were some groups that weren't present at the last workshop, um, and some did not cast a vote in that workshop. Well, I, they didn't put forward their suggestions, their preferences at that workshop. Thank, thank you for the excellent report. Councillor Reddick. I've got a few questions. Um, firstly, on page 11, um, the two-way option was more broadly acceptable, having less variation between negative and positive scores and a more neutral to positive assessment overall. Does this mean that two-way is less contentious? I think you could take that as the summary that it is less contentious. You have less strong views in either way. Yes. People either passionately for or passionately against. Yes, so the one-way is more polarising, but the two-way is less contentious. Yep, thank you. Um, next question, page 12. Um, we've got a table of the capital cost. To me, that looks like uh, there's a million dollars to be saved going two-way. Yep. That's just mm -hmm. a... That's, it relates to paving the, of the carriageway, that in a two-way option, you use an asphalt carriageway. In the one-way options, it would be additional paving and some additional cost to that. Right. Thank you. And... Um, would a two-way build um, have a stronger road with a broader foundation? That one for you. Kia ora. Um, the, uh, the pavement design, the pavement structure will be relatively similar between uh, one-way and two-way. So there'll be, we haven't gone into the detail design, detailed design yet, but at the moment, it's very much, they'll be very much similar. So, uh, I suppose it leading to the question is that if it was two way to start with, that would be would that be more flexible to allow moving to one way versus the other? If it was built one way for a start, it's quite difficult to move to two way, is my interpretation. Um, we have done some work around costings for changing it between, and it's about one point six million dollars to make the changes between um, it being a two way going back to one way. Um, and it's predominantly a lot of the cost is actually around intersection layout as opposed to the mid-block base of the street. Because there's quite a bit you have to move traffic lights and things in, there's pa you know, your tactile pavers, etc. all have to move as, as well. And what about in the other direction? I haven't done the costs in that direction. Right, uh, so uh, what I'm saying is my interpretation, it's much more expensive to move from one to two versus two to one. I'd have to come back to you on that one. Thank you. Um, over on page 17, uh, the, um, the Treasury Better Business case optimises value for money, which is the economic case, and also the commercially viable, the commercial case. Are there any actual surveys done of the commercial stakeholders, namely the um, building and business owners down George Street uh, to determine their point of view on viability? Only through the Central City Advisory Group constituted by Council. Yep, so only discussion with a few. And they are universally in favour of two-way. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Over to page 21. Um, up the bottom of this first second paragraph, it's clear there's a declining sense of satisfaction with the look and feel of the centre city, and this will be impacting the area's ability to compete with other um, areas and online shopping. Mm -hmm. uh, the public opinion, the residents' opinion survey suggests that the majority of people are actually reasonably happy with George Street. What is the greatest cause for dissatisfaction in Dunedin? That just, the residents' opinion survey, in my understanding, the satisfaction with the CBD has been sliding for a number of years. Yep. Um, so that's, that's what we've covered there. We also have um, data which is available on the Council's own website um, from Market View and Inf Infometrics, which shows that the share of the CBD, the share of the city's 
uh, retail spend in the CBD is falling as well. Yes, but the, when you when this residents are surveyed, both in the residents' opinion survey and the quality of life survey, the residents tend to zero in on one particular factor with the CBD that they are dissatisfied about. Are you aware of what that is? I think I know what you're trying to get me to say. Yes. <laughs> and what is that word? <laughs> Starts with P. That's right. <laughs> Quite right, and probably the whole room is aware of what it is. Um, so over the page 23, uh, more access to off-street parking opportunities and reduced traffic circulation is part of the Enabling Works package. Is any new parking planned? No, there's no new parking planned. Thank you. Over the page again, 25. Um, The, there's an improvement in safety claimed uh, with the uh, stats on the accident rate on Georgia in the CBD now. And my reading of that, the total figures are 101 versus 103, which is pretty much identical, in my opinion, um, between the before and current uh, periods, three years each one. Uh, so why is there an improvement in safety claimed when, well, to me it looks like there's none evident? You know, for the, this is in the detailed business case, not necessarily as you're, you're claiming it. No, so the, the detailed business case is saying um, if you reduce the movement of traffic along George Street, less cars moving along George Street, less potential for conflict with pedestrians and cyclists. You know, and they're that claiming the, that, that over the, the two, three year periods uh, measured that there is a reduction, that there's an improvement in safety, yet the total numbers show there is not. In fact, there's a tiny increase, but I would say negligible. 101 to 103 is a negligible increase. But. So, so, sorry, what's the question? Why is there an improvement in safety claimed when there's none ev evident in the measurements? So. Uh. Oh, so if you refer to the page, so I'm talking on page 25, but the table used is on page 44. Yeah, I think later on they do talk about that it's difficult to say that there has been any change because during the two-year period there was COVID, there was less traffic on the road, and there hasn't been enough data to confirm that there has been a change. Right, well, despite less traffic on the road, there is slightly more... Uh, incidents, it's more, it's slightly more crashes. Yeah, it's, it's only a so two year period, so it's difficult to sure. um, extend trends from such a limited data set. Yes, well, it does look like there's selective stats chosen to try and exemplify that to me. Who chose the stats? Is that the, the business case writers, I presume? Oh, no, it's a standard. Um, so it's the statistics within the study area over the last five years. Right but they're saying there's an improvement in safety, yet there is none. No, well, they've seen a reduction in serious harm once, mm. so, so in deaths and serious harms, but there's been an increase in very minor incidents. Yes. There was no so, increase so, in deaths on George Street. They were in side streets. No, with a wider study area. Because, mm. I mean, the DVC encompasses the enabling works as well of Falul and Great King Street. So, okay, uh, we'll leave that. It seems an error they're claiming George Street, yet there's no increase there. Anyway, um, page 33, putting people first is one of the key project outcomes. And if this is the top project outcome of putting people first, how does that um, sit with the number one concern of Dunedin residents, Dunedin residents that um, parking is their number one concern. I think that presupposes that that parking has to be on George Street. It does not. Better access to the off-street parking opportunities and better understanding about wayfinding, where to find parking, could actually help resolve the issue of access to parking. Mm. If you, you know, the parking statistics around the city show that we're not at full occupancy all of the time. So there is parking available. People are not being able to find it. I've noticed recently at busy times there's quite a queue of people to get into the Meridian. And, it, and it, even on, uh, well, on busy weekends currently it often is full. 
So what is planned for that? Well, part of that is related to the enabling works where we're enabling another entry into the building as well. So currently at the moment, you can only access it from a left-hand turn on Falil Street and a left-hand turn on Hanover Street, but that will also will enable a right-hand turn off Falil Street as well to help access that. We've also been in constant conversation with the owners and the managers of Meridian to look at how we can improve that parking resource. You know, and get access into that building as well, and that will continue that conversation. Thank you. The Councillor, we, we don't need to exhaust all of your questions in one sitting. Okay, I'll come back later. Is that, is that okay? Oh, good. Uh, I'll, put you, I'll put you back on the list. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, kia ora. I, so just to clarify, it was actually another councillor who asked the question about the loop bus, but since it's been brought up and said I asked it, I'll just ask it again just for clarification, because under, some of us understood that under the option of one way that there cannot be a loop bus, because I think the Mayor also said that to one of the submitters today as well. Is that correct or not? By what you said before, it sounds like you're now saying we could have a loop bus. No, that's not, what, that's not quite what I said. What, what, I, what I said was that the advice we'd hand was that for it to be as efficient as it could be, it would require travel in, in two directions. That's not the same thing as is it technically or feasibly possible. Just. Oh, I see, just that it'd have to be two-way. For it to be as efficient as it could be. Right. Yeah. Thank you. What the Mayor said it's technically possible. So but with a would one it be way... efficient and would the uptake be enough, I, I can't say that. Right, no, that's good. I just wondered, um, we talked a bit about this morning, they were saying that when it's one way, and I know it mentions in the report that we'll also offer parking on the other side of the road. Could you just talk a bit about that and how that will work? Because one of the things we've talked about a lot is the safety of that area, and also that people could be walking around it. How's that gonna work if people are gonna be come pulling in and out of p car parks? On the other, on the side that I presume is the pedestrianised side, people will be walking, and you have people driving in and out of car parks. Um, the it, there's no pedestrianised side as such. I just clear that first. That you would have, um, if you look at the plans and many of the blocks, you'll have it alternating. So there'll be some car parks on the left-hand side. Further down the road, there'd be some on the right, some on the left. You wouldn't typically have them right opposite each other. And you can also move that parking around depending on you know, if the road was one way and it was meandering slightly, that you might have some in the shady spot and then outdoor seating in the sunny spot. So I don't see that there is the issue that you're raising. Because yeah. certainly some of the submitters seem to think that they can linger around in the in the side that would be closed off and um, sit down and maybe do activities and things. But if people are driving in and out of that side, I'm just trying to work out how that's possible. Um, there, are, there are the design will have a path down the middle that vehicles would travel down, and then two sides for pedestrian space and activities. There's no side. Yeah, if it will be the same, just as it is currently, just with one lane of traffic and a larger amount of space on either side of it. But what I'm meaning is, my question to um, whoever wants to answer it, is that um, the people who are driving, who are parking on the other side of the road have to go through that activity area. See what I mean? To no, park. no, the, no. The activity area is on the sides, yes. and the area that people would drive and then deviate slightly to park in where there is parking made available goes down the middle. But so they, they don't overlap. But team, maybe you could point Councillor yeah. Houlihan to one of the pa pages, the pages that pa shows that clearly. Page 187, Councillor, it right. gives a, a good graphic of where the parks are and how it would look and function. Okay, because I might have misunderstood that when I read it, but um, another question I have is around um, timing. Obviously, none of us can, um, you know, predict COVID. But given the businesses have now been, you know, many of them closed for four to five weeks, and many of them are still in restricted conditions now, and then we're going to start work, I believe, if this is approved soon. Uh, you know, I realise we need to do work, but what a that seems to be a problem to me. 
Um, as you'll be aware, we formed the construction reference group through council um, a couple of months ago. That group uh, starts meeting as of next week. We've been delayed because of COVID as well in terms of meeting. We're sticking together with that group a plan and we have revised our construction schedule as a result of COVID as well so that we don't have as um, optimistic a view of how much work we'll get through before Christmas and we've also decided with the contractor that we would be steering clear in the first areas um, of any of the retail areas so we'd start for example in London Street uh -huh. rather than starting into what you know one of the side streets or into Falul or Great King. Um, we will be working really hard on that construction plan as well in terms of getting buy-in and figuring out the best way that we can possibly do this without disrupting well, with disrupting businesses as minimally as possible. We're yes. all very aware of the, the upheaval that there's been, but we think there's also some opportunities that can come out of that as well in terms of some of those spaces that might be closed off for construction. We may have more opportunity to allow outdoor dining for some places, etc. So I don't think it's all bad, but we're very cognizant mm -hmm. of that sensitivity as well. Yes. Um, I don't know, Josh, if you wanted to comment in terms of what happens if we do have another lockdown. God forbid. <laughs> um, um, so we are working with the contractor to have a contingency in place to be able to um, do work within different levels. If that was the that was the, that was the issue, um, and obviously the site won't be given over until well, until this in, until we've reached a, a agreement here, and um, yeah, the provision will be put in place to to move off site and back in site as as necessary. Yes. Well, we've had about four or five groups. Um, who've all said that a bus, some sort of loop bus or a bus would be good down George Street. Um, and it sounds like the most efficient way to do that would be two way, is that fair to say? Oh, there's lots of different ways that you could manage the concerns of the accessibility community. So uh, one of the submitters raised bringing buses down the side street, so that is one way. Uh, uh, there is also, we're working with OIC to move one of the bus stops in Princess Street, maybe a block earlier, bring it closer to the octagon. Um, a, a bus loop is just one of the ways that we could address those concerns. Right, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Van Ivers. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Dr Hazelton, um, you've said that you've taken a holistic overview, and I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, but then you've also said there's a really good feeling out there. Are you aware that of the 172 annual plan submissions on George Street, the vast majority, including all but one of the community boards, was opposed to doing anything with George Street? I'm not aware that they were opposed to doing anything on George Street, and I think 172 out of the entire population of Dunedin seems quite a low number. If you consider that of all the submissions we got, the highest number was actually 200, and that was on rates, and they wanted them to be zero, that 172 was actually the second highest submitted on issue, do you not consider that that indicated a lack of good feeling out there, given the vast majority of them were opposed. Councillor Van I, I don't think this is the opportunity to relitigate the debates that were had during the 10-year plan. Council made decisions at that meeting to fund this work, and staff have gone on following that and done the work that we have asked them to do, uh, and to go back now and ask those same questions again, I don't think is particularly a fear on them actually, or helpful to today's discussion. I'm wanting to drill down into Mr Hazelton's claim that there's a really good feeling out there. My next question, Mr Hazelton, was are you aware that the biggest petition this century in Dunedin had 6,500 signatures opposed to what is proposed here for George Street? I haven't seen that petition, but I am aware of those numbers. 
I don't and, know the exact question that was asked. And do you still uh, stand by your statement that there's a really good feeling out there when the biggest petition that we've ever had has been opposed and the vast majority of annual plan submissions were opposed as well? Yes, I stand by it because the data that we're going off is the discussions that we've had in the Central City Advisory Group and all of those people in the advisory group were very keen to see work go. If you look at the numbers in that, there clearly was no preference for a do-nothing so when you're talking about a really good feeling out there, you're talking about the members of the advisory group rather than the population that's going to use this facility. That, well, that was the group that was constituted by council for us to consult through. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, and <clears throat> thank you, team, for this incredible document. Um, it's a lot of hard work, and I, like uh, many, have spent four days reading uh, this latest version of war and peace and I can just say amongst my demographic the feeling out there is good um, I just want to I think I've got three questions and it relates to page 86 um, the Fort Street and Elliott Street examples in Auckland um, and I ask the questions uh, in the context of the fact that there seems to be a sub subliminal feeling amongst a number of people um, via parking that shared space street design sometime somehow impinges on on retail business so the first question is can we speculate um, well, we can speculate all we want about that feeling, but can we, doesn't this evidence you've presented uh, demonstrate the Fort Street example uh, it, it, in an evidence-based fashion clear, clearly defines the benefits? And I think uh, Elliot and Fort, it was 47 and 50% respectively in terms of um, pedestrian visitation at peak time. I think that's why the, that is why the examples were chosen by the, by the consultants. Great. And the second question is, that sort of relates to that, because I've been critiqued before for using examples from other jurisdictions across the world, but isn't it fair as you state um, that the space allocation along Fort Street is very, very, or was very similar to what we have in, in George Street? Correct. That's correct, yeah. So the final question is, and you might not know the answer to this, but I'm curious, and I'm going to ask it anyway, um, do you know if prior to the work in Fort Street and Elliott Street in Auckland, if there was a similar sort of pushback from the retail business sector prior to the work happening? No, I'm not aware of that. The one thing I could say is that I did grow up in Auckland and the nature of the retail environment in there was previously quite different to the retail environment that is there now. Um, I hazard to describe the types of businesses that were most common in Fort Street at the time, um, but many of them operated quite late night hours, um, and it wasn't particularly a strong retail area, or it was lower level retail, and that retail mix has changed quite substantially as a result of my own personal visit last time. Sorry, just a final follow-up to that. So I, I guess we can ascertain from that 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 change is largely due to the reconfiguration of the street design? Um, potentially, yes. I think you've got other factors with inner city residential, etc. as well, but yes. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, my question relates on page um, 131 of the report, which is like 133 of our paperwork, and it's, and it's the Waka Katahi relationship to the DBC. Um, and I was going to facetiously list a whole heap of three, three other acronyms out at this point, but I decided against it. Um, I want to go to the bottom of that page, and it says a key consideration of this DBC is how to manage in the funding contribution. And it speaks to um, the, in the next paragraph, due to the large urban component of this project, Waka Katari has requested transport-only options to be considered. To what extent has the analysis been affected by what appears to be in these two paragraphs, if you read them in totality, a focus on transport outcomes and less of a focus on amenity outcome, even though the GPS, which is where my TLA thing was going to start, where the GPS should be dictating what Katahi um, take that into account. So what I'm asking is, to what extent was the amenity component taken into account in the, in the DBC? Um, versus a transport only component? We've tried to balance as best we can, but there is a strong transport component within the DBC. Um, and, and it's been clear to us that, um, that that is the, 
the clear steer from Wakatahi that, that they consider that element more than the amenity elements of it. So therefore, it's, is it fair to say then an interpretation of that is then that the amenity value in the DBC is lower than it would have been if it had been focused on potentially as the government policy statement may have, should have directed Wakatahi towards. Oh, you don't have to answer that. That's sort of a question mm -hmm. for me with Wakatahi, but if they had, it would have raised the value. I think potentially, yes, you can look at it, any of the criteria by shifting those criteria slightly, you can influence the outcome. That's great, thanks. And then just some more generic questions. When, mostly to Mr. Von Pine, I think, um, when we lift up the road right now and do the three waters work, we have an existing road foundation which is enough to carry the dual carriageway as it exists. Will that foundation be more or less intact when this work is over? I, I imagine it will be affected in certain places when, when the trees are put in and rain gardens are put in, but will that general foundation shape still be there? Are you, are you talking about the, the existing pavement structure? Yeah. Great. I was looking forward to some engineering pavement questions. Excellent. <laughs> um, so the, um, the, the pavement has um, reached the end of its, its life. You see it's got wide-angled ruts in it, so that means it's deformation in the subgrade. Which we, can, which we can get into. So a lot of that, so, uh, all the, um, the good aggregate will need to be um, carted off site and recycled. Um, and the trenches that we need to dig for the, the pipes will, um, yeah, will, will, will mean that a lot of the existing structure won't be, won't be as it is now. So that there would not be a capacity in the reconstruction of the area to put in a, a foundation that would be strong enough that, getting basically back to Councillor Radich's point, that if we were to go to a one-way decision and then it turned out that all those who have predicted the end of the centre city and death comes to us all resulted in the requirement to put back a two-way system, um, is there capacity to have a foundation in place during the period now so as to sort of cover our options if we had to in the future? Yes, we can include that within the design criteria for our designers once we go into detailed design. Excellent. And then my last question, again, fairly detailed, so you'd be very happy to hear this. Um, curbs on the Knox block, um, will they be curbs, step-down curbs, or will they be flat and even, as they are in universal design for the rest of the section? My understanding is on that section we were looking at curbs. So my question to that is, why do we do that on that block when in the lower octagon, which is a 30 kilometre an hour open road zone now, there are no curbs? certainly something we can look at in detailed design. Because I'd like to say that's probably people like the DPA and that would mm -hmm. actually like that considered. Thank yeah, you. I understand. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Rish. I have um, about three questions. I just want to clarify the number of parks for my addition. So if there was, uh, what, uh, page 193, if it went to two-way... So it is probable that will be funded, the level of funding they will work through once we submit the detailed business case to them. It, as what Dr Hazelton said before, it's predominantly focused on safety and mode shift benefits. And my third question is just around the revitalisation plan. I, um, I was just wondering about where it fit, fits in, like when it's going out for consultation. So is it, is it going out like this year um, as part of the, the build up to the works? Correct, that's what the planning for that we need to confirm obviously with other consultation that's going on around with council at the moment. But ideally it would be at the same time that we're working through detailed design because I do think there will still be a lot of people that have um, you know, ideas that are coming forward around specific you know, issues within it. The other thing is that we will have a shop front presence on George Street through Isaacs, the construction partners. Um, and that will be a, a, a place where people can drop in and, and also give ideas. It will also be a great place for um, managing, coming back to one of the other councillors' questions, managing those construction risks as well, that there will be people on site all the time that will be able to answer any of those concerns that people have on a day-to-day -day basis. And our team itself will be based in George Street area. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I have an engineering question. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Um, the question is actually about the two-way versus one-way, because in two-way it kind of implies that we 
don't have the same surface treatment. Can you explain why that is happening? Because I, I look at um, St David Street near the university and they've got the whole thing in one. So why, why do we need that different treatment? That's the question I had to ask. Yes, probably more one. Uh, you jump in. Uh, predominantly with the two-way, it is about not giving the sense that it is a shared space. So it, it does relate back to safety. So you'd want to have greater differentiation between the road surface and the footpath amenity areas. So while in a shared space at that very low speed, there's that expectation that people are going to be moving around. It, really, if cars are coming from both directions, it's better to have a clearer definition between the road and the areas that aren't for, for cars. Uh, could you have a different coloured um, material instead Correct. of... Um, yes. It doesn't have to be asphalt. No, no, I, I, I don't like the idea of asphalt. Mm -hmm. um, but if you had, you do need differentiation, I, I agree with that. Um, one of the points that Joe Miller made, and it is relevant to the issue, is when it's two-way, someone can park on, on one side and go proximity straight to where they want to go, which is an issue for, for a lot of older people. They cannot, they, some people can't walk more than 50 metres. So the issue she brought up was if you have one way and you want to go to another direction, you know, on the other side of the street, then you have to go all the way along to the lights, back and then up, and that's what she was pointing to. Um, do you think that's an issue for, I suppose, oh, a quarter of our population is disabled, as registered as dis disabled or, or noted as disabled, that, that length of walk, that proximity to places, isn't it? That, it, that is also how she described the status quo of the George Street corridor. Yeah, so I need to clarify the question slightly there. Is that because my understanding would be if you do park on that side of the, the opposite side of the road, for example, under the one way, because it will be easier to cross the road at any point you want, you wouldn't necessarily have to go to the lights. Yeah, because that's to what make she that was crossing. asking. Yeah, so. That the idea is that with the one-way system and the well, sorry the one-way option and the the more shared space environment that there will be more opportunity for people to cross wherever their desire line is rather than having to walk to the next set of lights to do that. So I, I think if I understand the question correctly, I'd say that 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 um, Joe Miller's position wasn't quite correct. That there would be better opportunity to cross the road right where you are. Thank you. Um, and the other question was about um, with cycling safety and going two-way, um, what are the issues related to that? Um, like, what were the concerns? Because um, if, if someone's always looking one way for traffic, then if oh, there's two-way the cycling, thing. people might get run over by a bike or something okay, like sorry, that. that. Sorry, that, that clarification helped. Yeah. So uh, I guess it's what we referred to as the contraflow of other modes. So um, some nice uh, you know, terminology there for you, which you would have cyclists and other modes like scooters potentially coming the other direction. That was one of the concerns that was raised. And it, it, it's really about having a zone to the side of the traffic lane um, which you can see marked out as in between that and the amenity zone, that would be where you'd be encouraging cyclists to cycle more than just you know, anywhere in the street. Um, it is something that we still need to resolve in the detailed design, and partly I think will be an education thing as well, because you don't want anyone just looking one direction when they cross the road anyway. So that would be something we need to encourage people, no matter what, you want to look in both directions. Thank you, that's all for the moment. Questions on construction for Mr Van Pyne. Questions on constructivism for Dr Hazelton. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Worship. Just going back to loop buses, uh, and I think we've all got in our head that these are vehicles that travel on the road. I've seen around the world in Shanghai is one city where on a very, very busy pedestrian street they have about 1.2 1, 1 metre wide trains on tyres. 
um, that meander in and out of the people and ring a little bell to warn you to get out of the way. Is that sort of thing a possibility uh, to take people through the, the George Street area and past the main, um, if you like, commuter bus pick-up points? It could run, and it could run, I guess, both ways. Technically, absolutely possible. And I think what I, uh, that and previously in one of the public uh, forum submitters had also suggested uh, mobility scooters or the like. So there are numerous potential solutions that we can look into more for that. It does not have to be a bus. So that would be part of the further work as the designs and... Correct, and, and obviously talking with our partners at ORC as well. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. Um, look, I had a couple of questions. The first one is, um, at the moment, obviously, if you're on a two-way street and you pull up to park and you open the door, you're very conscious of people coming beside you, and I, I don't like getting out in traffic, to be quite honest. Um, the, the question I have is, if we were to uh, go for a one-way option, and people were to park on what would be, so the driver pulled into the kerb on, say for example, it was south on the right hand side of the road. Is it envisaged that there would be sufficient room there that if you were unloading a person with a disability, you would be able to get a wheelchair off the back or just help them if they need sticks? Is, is it expected that there would be sufficient room to do that safely? That is correct. Uh, the, that will come down to the detailed design again. But we'll be looking at best practice for how um, unloading and loading of people with disabilities goes in those spaces. So at the moment, probably none of our spaces on, well, the one space I think that we have on George Street would not be best practice. Yeah. So absolutely that is something we'll be looking at in the detailed design. Thank you. Both in terms of a buffer to the side and to rear for rear entry vehicles. Um, the other question, <coughs> sorry. Another question I've got is around the cult cultural opportunities that you've uh, listed on page 33, and it does talk about the use of terrario signage, which I'm absolutely cool about, but I just wonder if the two points, um, uh, the history is visually reflected in the built environment and expressions of kaitahu identity, does that mean things like, uh, and I often think, and no disrespect to what you did down the precinct, but I think of a couple of sheep statues. We could have done better in the cultural space, and I just wonder, uh, on a recent trip up the Kaikoura Road, I, I, um, I'm i really impressed with what Waka, Kaha, Waka Kaha, Katahi have done up there, and, and travelling through several North Island towns, I saw some very wonderful statues and stuff, and I'm just wondering, is it envisaged that Kaitahu, uh, the Manifenua would be involved in design and is that the type of thing that you might do? Or Correct, you... absolutely. Um, trying to not be offended by the sheep comment given that I was on the assessment panel for that one. But uh, no, I totally take what you're on board, what you're saying, that yes, uh, we are working very closely with Okaha and with Mana Whenua as part of this project and the next, they've been very involved in creating the cultural narrative for the area. And so any of the, um, se the selection choice for things like materials, we're running through plantings, things like art and furniture, will all be something that, that they will have input into and we're working collaboratively in that space. Thank you. And, and certainly those expressions, they could be po or statues, but equally could be more abstract uh, in the way that they've been expressed through thinking of the retaining wall at Roseneath on State Highway 88 or uh, the, the work that's been incorporated into the design of the new Mosgiel pool. Where it's, it's not as literal as people might think it necessarily needs to be to 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 tell those stories and, and speak to those cultural values. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Worship. A uh, question for Dr. Hazelton. I think about the um, about the um, enabling works. The um, tailback. I understand the full all entry issue for the Meridian, so that the capacity of that car car park can be complex, can be properly accessed, but. It's always seemed to me that the Hanover Street tailback is caused more by um, the fact there's only one barrier at the top rather than the um, lack of space in the building. Um, so in, in the discussions you said you're having with 
the owners, is that issue of easing the entry at the top of that ramp part of that discussion? Yes, it is. Great, thank you. And the, the other part of um, the comprehensive work that you're doing so that whatever is decided can happen as seamlessly as possible, with as least disruption as possible, um, is that there is always a sensitivity around work that has to be redone because something else is being done that wasn't on the radar. Um, so can we assume that you've got in place procedures so that everyone in the wider organisation <coughs> excuse me, and or other contractors are aware of your enabling work so that we're not digging stuff up again a week after it's gone down? Correct. We're working uh, closely with all other departments and council to do that, but also our consultants are currently working with other providers to make sure that if there's opportunities for them to replace their infrastructure at the same time, for example, Aurora and, and um, Vodafone, um, all those agencies, we're looking at how they might tie their works in with us, and that has been, the, our conversation has been very positive with them so far, that they do want to try and do some replacements of their things as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, depending on how long these go, but Councillor Lofiso and then Councillor Wiley, it may take us through until one o'clock, at which point it will be my intention to adjourn the meeting for lunch uh, and then return uh, in 45 minutes from that point of adjournment. Um, it's a ceiling, not a target. Councillor Lofiso. Nako, Your Worship. Tēnā gentlemen. Thank you very much for all your work in this um, space. Um, my question mainly relates to engagement. And so I'm asking a question on sort of on behalf of Councillor Barker, um, referring to the summary of considerations, internal engagement. Is there any, uh, going forward, is there any um, uh, engagement of Enterprise Dunedin in this space? Yeah, my apologies for omitting that. I've been sitting with Enterprise Dunedin for the last six months in the same part of the building and there's very much ongoing conversations with Enterprise Dunedin. I should have had them as part of that list. Um, Dougal and uh, Dears and I work very closely together, particularly around the retail matters. And yes, there, there will be more. Okay, and so my um, other question is about external, well, sort of external stakeholder engagement. And um, the first reference point was paragraph 54 of the report, um, talking about enabling car parks um, during the construction or the enabling work. Um, and it says that there's engagement um, planned for visits to businesses and mm -hmm. stakeholders and getting them to respond via the website. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any other engagement processes um, planned? I guess the, the other one will be that the media will cover this issue in depth, I'm sure, so that people will know to find that information. The main reason we were targeting getting out to see businesses, we have a couple of things that we obviously want to talk to them about, both the enabling works, making sure they're really aware of any of the changes that are occurring, but also to remind people that uh, don't read the paper that this work is coming up. And we have started some of these walkabouts earlier, and they were really positive in terms of not all of the issues were positive. People obviously had concerns, but it was good to hear those and there was good ideas coming through about how we could make changes. So I see this as being an ongoing conversation that will continue throughout the project, um, but open to other ideas in terms of how we could get that message out there further. And finally, um, my question, again, generally still relating to stakeholder engagement, and I've looked through the business case, and there's just, um, I don't mean to delve into operational stuff in, in terms of, but the, some typos in the detailed business case, particularly in terms of uh, Te Reo Māori and Pasifika's surnames. Mm -hmm. So what's the process by which someone with a cultural lens, if you like, um, speaks the language or knows the community, <laughs> has a review of the final um, draft before it goes that hasn't been done as well as it could have been, and partly that was also because there was a, we were quite pushed for time pulling the document together at the end, and I do apologise for any of those mistakes there, and I would like to make sure that we do better next time. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Oh, good. I've got eight minutes. Cool. Um, you don't have to. It's not compulsory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Glenn, I sent you some questions overnight, um, and um, you got them received them this morning. So I'm not going to read all six lines of what this question is about, but it's uh, regarding the traffic flow and lower traffic flow at the five-way intersection. Can you please just um, expand upon that? Yeah, so the question you had there was around um, how that flow could be um, impacted, particularly by more bus movements or the bus movements through it. Um, as we noted before, the, the bus, there'll be the same number of bus movements, they're just coming from a different direction, so they're doing a Great King Frederick George rather than Great King St Andrew George. Um, so we don't see a dramatic increase in that. The other thing to note, I think, is that um, as a result of the modelling, that shows that people will disperse many different ways across the network as well. So not everyone will be going through the five-way intersection. And I don't know if, Simon, you wanted to comment any more on <coughs> the modelling results around that. Put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, no, just other than that, the modelling is just a tool. It's not an exact science. It, it gives you an idea of kind of scale of change and where things might move to, but it's not an exact science, it's just a tool. Okay, thank you. Um, and Glenn, to follow up on the Great King Frederick Street intersection, obviously there's going to be a lot more buses getting through that intersection and that uh, barn stance is already quite busy with the hospital on one corner and the dental school on the other. Um, how is that going to change? So under the proposed design with the enabling works, the configuration of that intersection will change um, and it's predominantly about pushing the kerbs out so you can get the vehicle, the, the buses around. There'll still be some more work to do around that when we get to the final stage of that detailed design. Um, but it's also worth noting that the section beyond that at the moment, uh, the what we call the dental school block, we're also looking at a new design for that area as well that will funnel pedestrians in a slightly different way down that street as well to and that's a collaboration with the university okay thank you um i note in the 500 page plus pages we received there is very little commentary around the hospital and also the hospital build and for example on page 257 our papers it says, in inclusion, it would appear that the proposed changes to George Street have only a minor impact on network operation in either of the three main options investigated. And for context, it should be noted these models do not include hospital changes, changes in traffic patterns in relation to the new hospital and any associated network changes, e.g. reduction lanes on St Andrew Street. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple of things to consider there. Um, so, so the model does include some of the shaping future and transport changes, so the efficiencies of Ward Street have been included in the model. Uh, the model includes the existing hospital, so there's movement in and around the existing hospital. Um, it's just that the hospital will move at some point in time. We, we haven't been able to um, model the new hospital because we don't yet know where the entrances, exits, those things are. Um, and and uh, we don't know how the network, Waka Kotahi, still have some work to do around how St Andrew Street will look, uh, how the state highways will look in the future. So we haven't been able to model that. We're just um, predominantly working on the assumption that there's an existing hospital in the middle of the city. It's just that the traffic kind of moves from one place to another. And I'll just add one thing to that, is that's partly why there's quite a light touch to the east-west streets as well, particularly St Andrew and Hanover, is that we understand that there may be further need in future to make further alterations to those streets, and there is capacity to do that. Um, so that's why we've left those quite simple at the moment, that we can build in those changes. OK, thank you. Um, I note the speed limit is suggested to be 10 kilometres an hour. We've already canvassed that a little bit. Um, I also note that bike riders at a leisurely pace ride at 15 to 20 kilometres per hour. Neon scooters generally can travel comfortably at 20 kilometres an hour also. And yet the police have also said they're not going to be able to enforce a 10 kilometre per hour. So I'm wanting to tease out the 20 kilometre per hour a little bit more. Can you have, give me some feedback on that, please? Um, on why we can't have 20 kilometres per hour. Uh, so the, the, one of the, so I contacted the police again about this matter just to clarify, and I, I might actually read partly what 
what the response was, that um, it will be difficult but not impossible to police a 10k speed limit. And there's various arguments that could be held with regards to cyclists and scooters versus car with regards to mass manoeuvrability, road space consumption and the level of harm resulting from the impact. Um, also noting there that um, tra a car travelling at 20 to 30 k's will have inherently a greater stopping distance than that of a scooter or a cycle. Um, if, all, if the road limit was set at 10 k's, then all road users would be expected to comply, but police would take a graduated response to those failing to adhere as is standard practice with a significant focus on the education of the road user. Thank you for that. Um, sticking with um, police, um, I'm working around a question around fence, um, and I take it any design uh, and future proof of the road would factor in the needs of the fire service if there was a major fire on George Street and the heavy equipment needed. That is correct. We've had quite um, in-depth conversations with Fire and Emergency New Zealand. They've also shown us uh, all of the new kit that they are bringing into town and made sure that that can fit within the roadway. We sure will. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting until a quarter to two, one forty-five. Second at Councillor Lord. Any? No. Uh, all those in favour? Uh, those against? That's agreed. Thank you.
a couple of minutes later than anticipated, but we will resume if people can take their various positions for the purposes of the meeting. That would be helpful. Uh, questions? Councillor Reddick. Um, I'm looking at um, page 95, 96, the MCA scores. Um, I'm wondering about the DSIs and the retail quarter, that two-way slow. Uh, they're thinking there's going to be more uh, incidents with the two-way slow? Why do they think that? Um, so it'll be around mode conflict again and vehicles traveling in two directions, more of them. So scored slightly lower. Right. I mean, people are used to vehicles travelling in two directions currently, but you think that's more to you. Okay, so jumping over to page um, 185, the um, cyclists are going to be going in two directions with a one-way system. Is that correct? And is it on page 185, that activity zone, is that for cyclists going against the traffic flow? Correct. That would be the um, that would be where you'd be encouraging cyclists to use if they're going contra flow. Yeah. So it they could be in lane otherwise, or coming back down that direction. Well, to me, it seems quite dangerous if you're lulling people into a. Council, there's plenty of opportunity further down this path for you to expand upon your opinions. This I'd is an like opportunity to... for you to ask questions of staff. Yes, so I'm uh, about to ask for some clarification on that. Has that? Uh, perspective being discussed and that people look the one way for the cars and step out and then there's a cycle coming in the other direction. That, that was canvassed in the workshops and in spite of that, that was still the preference for the disability community to have one way vehicles. We spoke about that at length in the workshops. Yes, is there any data on whether that has proven dangerous elsewhere or is there such a thing as elsewhere? Um, not that, well, in terms of data, no, we haven't looked directly at that, but it does happen in other shared spaces like the ones in the um, detailed business case that they do, they do have contra flow. But what you do tend to find in those environments is that cyclists also tend to moderate their speeds as well. Well, it all should all be going 10k, right? So, mm -hmm. but, uh, so, there's the, the, so what you're saying, there's no data on people looking at cars one way and getting hit by cyclists coming the other? Not that we've looked at, no. Yeah. Okay. And so back to page uh, 96. The what is what is the definition for the purposes of this report of accessibility? Um, I don't know that we have a specific definition in the beginning of it. The reason but why it tends I... to be that you know, uh, reducing the barriers for people with physical disabilities from accessing the area. Okay, so the reason why I ask is that two-way slow is rated lower for accessibility, yet to me if you could have you know, pick up and drop off in both directions, that would make it more accessible for people such as the elderly and such as disabled people and the general public. It would appear that those communities have spoken for themselves, Councillor. Well, including the general public. I don't see the voice of the general public in that. So that's why I'm asking about the definition of accessibility. So the definition of accessibility in here is not around access, uh, is about dis disabled access and other access uh, barrier, removal of those barriers. I think you're referring to access in terms of the ability to come in from different directions. Yes. That's not under the definition of accessibility. Which is why I asked about what yep. the definition of accessibility is. So, you know, that's why it's 
lower uh, ranked. Mm -hmm. um, was there any feedback from the advisory group about the accessibility of coming from both directions using a dif that different, or access using that different uh, definition? Uh, yes, uh, and access, not accessibility, but access, uh, you'll note in one of the um, uh, appendices there, it talks about, yeah, there's a word map of the different things that came up, and access was one of the key words that people had, but there was also a lot of discussion about the fact you're talking about three blocks, and within each of those blocks, you can still come around and come into the area, so it's not like there's no access in. There was still access in to come in for car parking outside a shop if you so needed to be right outside it, mm -hmm. and you would only have to drive another block to come in and come back towards that place. So access was seen that there was still access to the area, quite different to if it was fully pedestrianised, for example. Sure, but it's ranked lower for accessibility, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so. It was, next on that list is personal security. Now, one of the things that Cobus Mintz mentioned at length was the, uh, the risk of after hours assaults and attacks at night with less eyes on the street. And so he favoured two way for that because you'd have traffic in both directions more, it would, would actually mean more cars going by, which, in his view, and the view of uh, others experienced, uh, experts suggested they would increase personal security on the street. So uh, they're all ranked evenly, which is kind of contrary to what we heard from the expert. You just Do you have any comment which, on that? Can you, firstly, can you clarify which other experts you're referring to, just so that people have a shared understanding? Uh, no, I'll just, just stick with Cobus at this point. Oh, so just the one. Thank you. I think at this stage they were uh, scored evenly because there was a very similar in the modelling, a similar number of vehicles travelling down the street, whether they were one way or two way. Uh, so there's not a huge differentiation between that. The other thing that's important to note is that, and it was something that was counter to what I had originally thought as well, it had come up through some of the feedback from members of CCAG that also they found um, and I think Councillor Barker had raised this earlier about cat calling and you know sort of the abuse that they get from passing vehicles as well, and that they felt that that undermined their personal safety by having more people driving past them with some of the behaviours that were exhibited. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, that's right. It's a, ver uh, a personal opinion as opposed to any data on that. There's no data either way. Well, there, well, there's anecdotal data from the members of uh, the. Uh, from some of the young women in the group. Hmm, sure. Uh, so on page uh, 79, the, uh, just looking at these options one way and two way and the stakeholders, uh, you've got the stakeholder thoughts. Where is the voice of those most affected on page 79? And by those most affected, I mean the uh, building and business owners on George Street and the shoppers that's further on in the document, you can see the feedback on those options. And here it was predominantly if someone had said something specifically about that plan, that they would put those comments in. So you'll more likely see the, um, t the comments from the business community in the two-way comments, because that's what their preference was. Okay. So, for instance, fire and emergency uh, have a comment on uh, One Way South but no comment on the two-way or the other. Which uh, seems odd, when I spoke to Fire and Emergency, they're not worried, they don't want to be a lever for any of the options as long as their machines can negotiate the streets. They're not worried one or two-way was what I heard. Is that different to what you heard? That is different to what we heard because there is a summary form that they were asked to fill out at the end of the workshops where they were asked to put their preference down and mark each of the preferences on a minus three to plus three scale, and that's where these, this data came from. Very good. And on uh, page 83, the two-way option, where are the property owners, the business owners, the shoppers, the general population, urban access, grey power, hospitality, New Zealand, 
Hospitality New Zealand didn't put in a submission because there was too much diversity amongst their members as to what they thought, so they couldn't put one option down. Um, but the others are further on in another table, I think. But I think it's in section nine. There's the full summary there. Section nine, I think it is. Yeah. We're just sorry, we're just scrolling to it, Councillor. I'll get you a page yeah, number. Yeah, well, you've got the, the whole thing listed out. Yeah. Uh, 111, we think. Is that the first one or the second workshop? There? Keep scrolling. 116. Oh, yep. Very good. There's quite a lot. I've highlighted the ones with preference for two-way. There's quite a lot of those, but none of them mentioned in that summary table. No, correct. So, um, page 104, the, it looks to me as though the two-way is the best economic value for money. Is that the correct interpretation of that table? Uh, correct, that's what it says in 7.5. Thank you. And page 41. Where am I? So uh, the economic development strategy uh, is included in their strategic objectives. So um, how will essentially ignoring the concerns of the George Street business community, which was, is already causing widespread disillusionment, how will that, uh, what will that do for economic development? I don't think I can answer that question. What I would say, though, is that um, you, by taking the counter position, you could say that we're ignoring the potential shoppers of the area if we're not listening to those who want to visit the area and cannot do so currently. Well, 6,500 shoppers said they wanted two-way. Councillor yeah. Reddick, I'd prefer if we didn't descend into debate with staff at this point. Well, um, so how are the 6,500 shoppers who said they wanted two-way being taken into account? Well, they're not because we haven't entered that. Uh, data in there, partly because we didn't conduct that data ourselves. We don't have the methodology behind it, but it is in the back of our mind. But we were asked to consult through the advisory group, as which what we've done. Very good. And those members of the advisory group did bring up, and some of them were members who organised that petition as well. Yes. Um, I note, I think uh, Fort Street. It's a very nice uh, sheared street, and it's a side street, of course, off Queen Street. Uh, what's going to be, is Queen Street going to be one way or two way, being a main street? I have no idea. I don't work in Auckland. Right. That's all right. It's, uh, well, my latest information, it's going to be two way, but that's all right. Thank you. That's all I have for now. Thank you. And, Councillor, whether it was conscious or otherwise, I'd prefer it if you didn't minimise the harm of sexual violence in this forum. I think dismissing the concerns raised by young women as personal opinion in the way, uh, in the way that you did is unhelpful uh, to those discussions. Councillor Houlihan. I must. I haven't been hooted at. Uh, point of order. Uh, point of order. Point of order. Councillor Rennick. Thank you. Look. Uh, I think that's disrespectful, and I'm certainly not minimising the harm. In fact, I'm contrasting the, the harm of her uh, talking about somebody singing out the window of a car versus actual assaults and problems on the street as outlined by Cobus Mintz, who's an urban development expert. And furthermore, I will be making a comment about Cuba Street, which has ten times the number of street assaults as other streets in New Zealand. So I, I, uh, I find it offensive that you would suggest that I am minimising uh, sexual harm. I take offence at that. I'm going to take a quick adjournment. Could I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Walker.
was that? And thank you for taking the vote in my absence. Um, I'm not going to uphold the point of order uh, because uh, the, the Mayor's comments were entirely uh, on point and that that is considered. Are you okay, Councillor? Uh, those, those are considered uh, extremely difficult for young women and uh, they are... Um, the comments you made were minimising the effect that has on young women. So I'm not going to uphold your point of order. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say I love the idea you've got in the report for marketing. I, <clears throat> I personally thought um, we should have been doing that ages ago, personally, but that's my personal opinion. Um, and I wondered if you'd investigated the Main Street um, option that I know they did, because when I, years ago, oh, I suppose I won't go into my wee spiel because you'll say time. And, okay. <laughs> anyway, I've worked it's with Main Street. It's only taken two years, <laughs> Councillor, but we're getting there. <laughs> I've worked with Main Street coordinators before, and there's a really good one in Manchester Street in Christchurch. And um, they did a really good job, and what they did was liaise with the businesses. And is that the type of thing you're thinking of? Correct. I think there's a number of different models out there. Yes. Uh, the Main Street model is one that I'm very familiar with myself as well, mm -hmm. um, having um, presented at some conferences with them. Um, and I think there's all manner of different opportunities there, and I think it is one of the missing gaps that we have at the moment, probably um, due to the fact that we haven't had strong competition from, from an out-of-centre mall that other yeah. centres have, and so they have marketed a lot more, and we have identified that as one of the key things that we think could help the area. I agree with you. Do, do you think that um, that marketing ideally would, could, if it gets approved and goes ahead, um, could start soon? Because I see a lot of that marketing needs to kick in now when they start to get the disruption happening in the road to tell people we're still here, you know, come to us, that type of thing. Absolutely correct. As one of the things that we're looking at is, as part of the rollout of the work will be a number of different marketing measures um, around, you know, sort of change, you know, upheaval is coming, please bear with us type messages and also a please shop local message as well to make sure that people are well aware. One of the other things that we've talked about in the group is having um, ambassadors out on the street that would yes. also be, you know, are you having problems getting from this point to this point, where is the bus stop now, Where you know, those types of questions to make sure, and that seems to be one of the things that has worked in other centres really so well. So you're thinking... So I, absolutely marketing start as soon as possible. Are you thinking someone like Marcus Slush might pop off on our CBD? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> He's popping up everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, could I... So another thing I wondered, and I don't know if you've thought of this, but in my understanding around the papers is that the option we've got at the moment isn't seen as being feasible because it would cost a lot more to change it to two-way if we decided to do that. Is that correct? Have I understood that correctly? You're talking about the one way with the potential to go yes. two-way? Yeah, there are a number of issues in there that we've outlined that um, do make it not the easiest option to implement <coughs> and you know, would involve more cost and I think it, also a concern that you would also require closing the street again to make some of those changes. Um, and the idea oh, of swatch, uh, swapping between a flexible one-way and two-way more regularly, that would be of concern to users from a safety perspective as well. So I think it is, it is a case of it needs to be a decision that stands for quite some time. If it does need to revert, we just have to recognise that there will be additional cost and time to do so, and also that that would unlikely if we go back and redo it, you'd be very unlikely to get Wakakatahi funding for a second 
go at it. Right. And have you considered, say for example, if we approve the two-way with the options that you've given of the um, automated boulevards that could block off, that we could do some sort of trial? You know, because um, we are saying, the people who, or, or not necessarily all of us, but anyway, people who are in favour of one way have been saying that it's going to be really good and bring economic benefits to the businesses and all that sort of thing. What better way to test out that, to know if that is the fact, is to have a trial with that. You could, you know, and so you could have the one way, you could have the two way, and you could see which ways were better. The challenge to achieve a trial that, so we did discuss the idea of trials. The challenge to achieve a trial, sorry, I'm like mixing my words up here, is that to make it look good, and not have hundreds of orange road cones and temporary barriers oh, right. out there that don't give people the right impression. Mm -hmm. You have to do so much of the work that we may as well have done the work itself. Oh. So it's, it's, it's hard to get a trial that would give you a good, fair impression of what it's going to be like. Um, and, and, and on that matter, you can see how that has happened around the country with other trials as well, that often they're very negatively perceived. Yes. So if, if say, um, we voted for the two-way, but it does still have that flexibility, if I'm correct in saying that, that if we had an event on on a weekend, we could have that boulevarded off for fully pedestrianisation or one way. Is that correct? But, uh, fully pedestrianised, yes. One way would be more difficult and you would end up with a lot more temporary traffic management. But in either a one-way or a two-way option, by using the smart street option, you can then fully pedestrianise in the blocks on a temporary basis. And the idea behind that is also to ensure that when event holders do have those events, they again don't have to have lots of ugly orange road cones out there to do it. Right. Oh, brilliant. I won't reference another um, trial that we did. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, can I just... Um, uh, to, with regards to leasing of permanent parks, where are we at with that and have, uh, where's that step being taken? There will be a report back to Council in October, following up on the recommendations Council signed off on through the MR Cagney parking road map work. Oh OK, thank you for that. And um, just with regards to, I know there's been a bit of a discussion on this, but around the hospital, because that was one of my main concerns, was around the one way. In the modelling that we've got here, if I'm correct in saying it's saying we can't assess that because we're not sure which way it's going or what it's going to be like, is that correct? Correct. We don't know where the hospital entrances and exits are. Yes. So if, say, um, it goes two way, which, and we end up going one way. On, so the two-way would be on the one-way and the one-way for George Street. Do you... Cou Councillor, I, I mean, picking up on the staff's previous response, we're dealing largely in hypotheticals here, given the, the uncertainty there is around the layout and design of the hospital and therefore its impact on the transport network. Yes. So I don't know if you're going to get a different answer uh, asking the same question well, in a different way. Well, just that... I am concerned about the impact it can have on our on the congestion in our city. That's what, is the, the, what is the question of staff? So I was about to ask it. But, okay. Right. Well, well, do you have any concerns about congestion if that happened? Uh, yeah, there are concerns, but there is capacity in the network, and the, the models do show there is capacity. And what we are doing in terms of east-west flow is being flexible, um, so that. Um, we can change signal you know, intersection timings depending on how traffic does move into and out of the hospital. Okay, um, I have an engineering question. <laughs> uh, um, I, I'm just wondering, can you assure us that with the changes to the pipes and the upgrades to the three waters on George Street, that the level of supply will not be less for water? than it is now? Um, I can, there's no planned uh, drop in level of service, if, if that's the response you're after. So, um, yeah, if anything, it will be an, an increased level of service. OK, so the, the water that is available now will still stay at the same level or even increase? 
I've got no reason to suggest otherwise. Yep. Okay, yep. great. But, um, granted, we still need to go into detailed design, but no reason to suggest otherwise. Yes, thank you. Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, the, I noted on page 432 that, um, Dr Hazleton, you'll be able to comment on this, um, that all of the respondents or the stakeholders uh, agreed that progress as quickly as possible on the project was, was the paramount commonly held view. Have I got that right, first of all? Correct, within members of CCAG that it was the overwhelming message. Thank you. So that leads me to a question of uh, Mr Van Pine, which is around, we're taking a wee break for um, Christmas, New Year, with the retailers in mind. Um, what confidence do you have in the, um, or what can you tell us about the track record of the contractors that we have chosen uh, to interact with the stakeholders on the ground, particularly the retailers, business owners and so forth, being Isaacs, and, and um, bearing in mind they've just won a major national award and have some track record in Dunedin. Could you comment on, on that, please? Yes, um, you probably took my comment in that sense. Um, so Isaacs have been, um, they've completed a couple of projects for us uh, recently. Um, one of them was Temples Bay out in um, on the Peninsula Connection, um, which was a very difficult engineering challenge, which I won't get into the detail of, uh, for, but um, they won an award based on their engineering prowess, but also their um, communication and liaison with the community. Um, had fantastic community feedback. Um, the guys and girls on site were getting um, uh, looked after, um, or getting, getting fed by the, by the locals. They were very appreciative of their work. Um, and the team that they've brought into George Street um, has several of those, those same personnel and they've got a very similar methodology so they are very um, very capable in the engineering space but um, the reason they've been selected is uh, moreover f uh, in their public, um, this, this stakeholder management and liaison to, and, and information sharing. So it's all about relationships? Absolutely. We're not okay. going to win this one by just digging big holes in the ground and not telling them about it. Excellent. Second question is, um, Dr Hazleton, have you got confidence that given what we've heard from uh, various groups associated with vulnerable users that we have used all the tools in the design, we've incorporated them all, as many as we can uh, in the design to address those issues for our most vulnerable members of our community? Uh, yes, I do, and I think the next stage of detailed design is also where we drill into more of those further as well, into things like surfacing and you know, the paver issue that continually comes up around slipping, those types of matters. And at the last uh, of the workshops, it was suggested that we should aspire to be, as part of this plan, one of the most inclusive cities in the country, which I think everyone on the project team thought would be a nice goal for the project. Music to my ears, thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, it's about uh, progressing to detailed design, I guess, and also touching on the issue, this um, personal security issue that's been touched on. Uh, I'm assuming that, well, can we safely assume that full consideration will be given during the detailed design process to the issues of appropriate lighting, particularly in winter? Uh, in addition to the publicly provided LEDs above, the under veranda lighting and the rest of it to ensure the sort of security we expect in the city centre. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Vanivis. Looking at the overview and other cities' experiences of having done this sort of thing to their main street, have you looked at uh, similar cities to Dunedin, for instance, Norwich and uh, Ipswich in the UK that are both about our population, they're both university cities, and 20 years ago both uh, did a similar pedestrianising of their main streets. Have you looked at what their long-term outcomes were and how happy people were with those city uh, changes? We, we haven't directly looked at those 
cities. But what we did note in a lot of the research that we looked at is that, and this was partly probably covered in previous iterations, is that many cities are backing away from full pedestrianisation, but partial pedestrianisation or one-way or slow two-way streets do seem to be more common now than full pedestrianisation, which is why we don't have a full pedestrianisation option on the table. Right. Um, you haven't looked at Norwich and Ipswich that are very similar to Dunedin. Have you looked at other cities that are similar to Dunedin in terms of their semi-pedestrianisation and what actually their experience of it was? No, not directly. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Just um, had some questions similar to Christy and Gary, actually, um, Councillor Gary. Um, the question about mobility parks and spreading them along the street, what is, uh, what's uh, your plans around that? Because a lot of people, that older people, who, who come to town and really they can only work, walk, say, 50 metres at the max sometimes. Yep. So at the moment, I think we've included two within each block, uh, at, and that's just as a proposal um, in terms of the exact locations of those and the exact numbers of those parks. We would look at that further through detailed design and refinement of exactly where those are. I think there probably needs to be a bit of flexibility around those in the future as well, on the basis that you know that the sites that people might be going to today might move in future as well. Um, and on the same subject of mobility parks, um, there has been a concern that um, some of them aren't long enough if someone's being dropped off in a van. Um, are those considerations? Yes, absolutely. That um, I mentioned before that we would be looking at best practice in that space, particularly as the, the types of vehicles are changing quite substantially now as well, so that we would want to make sure that those are accessible and you can load correctly from them. Oh, cool. Um, the other aspect is rest stops, because again, a lot of people can't walk a whole block. They can barely walk a half a block, actually. Um, and so in the design, is there um, consideration for you know, how many rest stops and what distance apart they are? Yes, correct. So that will be again um, refined further at the detailed design stage, but it was a clear message that came through was that having locations along the route that you could stop and rest at was important, and partly why there's a little bit more work going on in the enabling works around some of the side streets, particularly St Andrew Street coming up there that we're looking at um, reducing the crossfall on the pavement and making sure there are some stops, some seating stops along the way that would help people coming from the bus hub up to George Street. So yes, it is a key consideration for us. And with the furniture, um, I noticed in, um, in the previous design and, and, and what have you, um, with the establishment of the furniture, some of those can get in the road of people as well. So um, what's your work with the community about um, the furniture design and how it works with mobility? Yeah, again, at the detailed design stage, that'll be something that we'll workshop very closely with the disabled community to make sure that, 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 that the, the, any choices we make in terms of that furniture is also accessible and also offers opportunities for people to you know, have socialising opportunities alongside people. <coughs> now, um, in the two-way design, um, you know, we want, we want a wonderful streetscape, and I found this drawing at home, <laughs> <laughs> with a wonderful streetscape with um, cars and um, lovely um, foliage, etc. And I was just wondering, in the two-way design, is it still going to... It, could it still be attractive? I mean... People go, oh, um, what's your um, thoughts around the two-way design? I think one of the key messages that we tried to convey in the, in the DBC that was that, and if you look at the, the, the brief sketches that we have there, is you can provide better amenity under every one of the options. The question comes down to how much additional space you want for amenity and other activities, and that's why we decided that that was predominantly a philosophical debate for the council to have. Okay, and one of my last questions is, and you may not be able to answer this actually, um, 
We have a significance and engagement policy and we have engaged with um, different groups. But um, when it comes to a, 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 a significant issue like two-way, one-way, um, George Street, um, my thought was that it should have gone to the whole community and was the, we had got you know, um, some of the um, transport options in the 10 year plan, but we have not gone to the whole community on this issue. What are your thoughts around that? I mean, that's just philosophical again. So, so we, the um, George Street and Central City Plan project was part of the previous 10 year plan and we specifically consulted on that um, in the 2018 to 2021 plan. Ah, oh, so that's before your time. Yeah, but it was, that, that met the, it's the um, requirements of the Act at that time, and this is just giving effect to that um, consultation. Yeah, I wanted a clarification on that, that's all. There have also been a number of feedback processes as this work has evolved that have been open to anybody who chose to participate in them uh, leading up to this point. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Usha. I have two areas that I just want to ask a couple of questions on. The first one was, is safety was brought up, and I note on page 63 there's some um, report here from the police and the New Zealand police crime snapshot data. Um, is, that, is, is that, did that come via the Dunedin police or is it how did that work? Yeah, uh, that data is publicly available. So it says that the data suggests that the central city and specifically the area surrounding the retail quarter is a Dunedin crime hotspot, which is likely eroding the, the public perception of safety, and that there's also anecdotal evidence of an increase in sexual harassment in the last few months. Um, woman described catcalling coming from passing cars at all times of the day with George Street, Octane, etc. I just wonder when it talks about the... Um, the case for the incorporation of crime prevention through environmental design. Um, how, how is this going to be addressed? Is it addressed through detailed design? That is, yes, it's part of detailed design. Um, it's also ensuring that we make sure that we engage with the people that are most affected by those things to, to find out what are the types of things that would make you feel safer. But there is also um, crime prevention uh, through design is, is a pretty robust field with its own measures as well that we can make sure that we're going through best practice to do that. My second question is just around some of the consultation. This is on page 116 where it has the, the Chamber of Commerce, the CEO um, says that they have a, well they, the organisation that they represent has a preference for the two way and then we have the chair of the retail and tourism subcommittee saying that they have a preference for one, base, one way south and I, I'm assuming that you would have engaged in, in conversations for them so I'd just like to kind of tease out why those are conflicting, I don't know if they're opinions or <laughs> statements where they've arrived at. Um, I can't speak directly to why those to that, that same group has two slightly different opinions, but I would note uh, the same as we face with the hospitality group is that the membership doesn't have one position. It, you know, there's many members within those organisations, and many of them have different positions. Just as many of the retailers that you know have have made their voices clear, I've been approached by other retailers who've said we'd prefer something else as well. So I think that's where it gets very hard for for broad groups to often put in one submission, which is I think why the um, the uh, retail uh, sorry the um, the other group didn't or the entertainment type ones because they just said they they could not come to a joint position. Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. Um, look, I just had a wee question, Glenn, and I um, fortunately gave my book away. I don't know if I'll be able to find the place <laughs> easily, but there was somewhere I was reading about budget. Um, and I guess um, in some earlier work, I think it might have been while you were absent from the DCC away on a overseas sojourn, but there was some work shown to us that were mock-ups of how it might look, whatever we did, and... Um, I think it was Boffer School had done some mock-ups and I guess um, I felt a wee bit underwhelmed by what I saw and I, I feel that whatever we do, we are going to be doing it, like, like 
what was done out here now is, is done for the sort of 30 years. Um, are you concerned or, or do you believe you have enough budget to do something that's absolutely... Um, well, no, the reason I ask is... <laughs> I'm in, getting in a direction p- here that... No, no, uh, no, I guess the question I ask was in relation to some pricing that looked like the above street works might cost less than what we had originally allowed, and I'm just wanting to just make sure that we don't... I mean, there's nothing going to make this project fail more than not doing it properly, and um, I'm confident you have the ability, it's just whether you have the budget to go with the ability, so... Yeah, and I um, I acknowledge that I, I have had a nod from across the table, but I do actually <laughs> fundamentally believe that we do have enough money for it as well. Um, it's one of the first times that I've been working on a project that our initial QS has come in under what we had estimated originally, which gives me great confidence that we actually will get there within it. And I think we can do something very, very good with the money we have, either as a one-way or a two-way option. So and I guess... If, if I can just add, um, and, and Dr Hazelton has is, you know, spoken correctly to the budget that exists, but were we to find at some point through this project as we work through it that things changed, given its significance, we would come back to council and advise you of that and look at how we dealt with it. Thank you, Sandy. And going back to Glenn now. So I guess, I guess what I would also like to ask is, do you feel um, that you've been pretty ambitious in terms, or, or do you think you will be ambitious in what, like you, you say your first draft has come through and it's looking okay, but that's not because you're just uh, wanting plastic flowers or anything like that, is it? You know what I mean? Like, No. Um, from the, the initial stuff that we've done so far, I feel pretty confident that, that what will be delivered out there will be quite incredible compared to what we see out there today. Thank you. Um, can you assure us that um, if we go ahead with one way, that we don't end up with a whole lot of the stuff on the road like we had with the safer schools. That caused an absolute fury in the public and it looked, quite frankly, a lot of it quite tacky, in my opinion. I think the key, one of the key drivers for this project is quality and the and same as I prefaced my comments before about the, the concerns around a trial, is that I, I, we don't want anything going in there that looks tacky. Mm, I agree. Um, can I just go back to something earlier that was mentioned around Cobus Mintz, and uh, would it be fair to say that he is recognised as one of New Zealand's top urban designers? Yes. Yes, that's what I thought. Um, so what will happen if, well perhaps I'll phrase my question slightly differently, can business owners and um, building owners claim, um, make financial claims and get them from the council if we vote one way when someone like Cobus Mintz, who you've just um, acknowledged as one of New Zealand's best um, urban designers, has said that is his preferred option to give flexibility for one way and two way, and our CBD advisory group, also the majority of them wanted two-way as well. Um, do you think that they would have a case for asking for financial assistance because the businesses themselves have all said they don't want it and more than 6,000 people have signed a petition saying they don't want one way either. Do you think that there's any financial recourse for businesses if they're hit really hard because of this, and they can prove that because of the change, they're financially hit. Councillor, um, to begin with, no matter how many times people repeat uh, a view to the contrary, uh, Mr Mintz never made a, a single recommendation. He made uh, he presented two options, both of which, in his view, his professional opinion, were viable. Council chose one of those. Uh, and and I, I would defer to Dr Hazelton around the view of uh, to what degree urban design matters are an art uh, relative to being a science. Could I answer that? No. Could I make an answer to that? Right. Okay. 
I think you could line up as many urban designers as you want and each will come up with a slightly different idea or proposal. There's, yeah, you won't get one overwhelming voice from urban designers and I think that's also clear from the urban designers that are and landscape architects that are involved in this project as they have said we think we can make both options work very well. Also given we don't have the modelling for the hospital yet do you think given the significance of it and the fact that it could impact you know on George Street that we might need to wait until we see the modelling? No, no. Okay. There's, there's capacity in the network at the moment and we can shift and move um, vehicles to accommodate how the hospital was delivered. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Glenn, I want to take you to pages 76 and 77 of our papers. And in 76, it says the DCC does not have sole responsibility for creating a memorable and distinctive experience in the quarter. People's experiences are all strongly influenced by the private sector and other stakeholders in the area. And then on page 77, it talks about the transformative potential of the project will be reduced if private landlords adjacent to George Street and other parts of the retail quarter do not invest in improving the appearance of their buildings and as a challenge and under potential actions it talks about develop a collaborative relationship with developers and building owners to maximise the benefits of building upgrades and developments on the retail quarter as a whole. Then we have, uh, and what I saw in the report, was the fact that the building owners are very much focused on a two-way street. Can you give me some um, narrative around what you saw in the uh, hearings and the, in the workshops around that? Well, I think uh, I can't quite answer the question in the way you want me to answer it in terms of what their feedback was, but there was, there was just a preference for that. But I would also say that I think most of the people that were also engaged and that we've engaged with consistently would also understand that no matter what the outcome of council's decision, it is also in their best interest that we work together because the last thing I think anyone wants is for George Street to fail in which case businesses would fail, landlords would lose tenants. So I think everyone will be wanting to invest in the collaborative way. And I think the, that no matter what the decision is, the question is just is getting on, doing the work and working together to the best of our abilities to get the best outcomes. I don't think it would be in anyone's interest to see it fail either direction. Um, I, I would hopefully that's the case. But the business owners and the private investors are very much, from what I read, focused on a two-way option as their preference, correct? Correct. OK, thank you. And then um, when I see that there was quite a dialogue about additional parking uh, from those same business owners to about the success of George Street, is that a fair reflection of what was relayed in the workshops? Certainly that was a key factor for uh, the retailers and building owners was the provision of more parking. Okay, thank you. Um, there's been a little bit of commentary about Fort Street uh, and how its appearance is and the changes in Fort Street, and I would agree with you about the change of it from the what it was to what it is now. Um, I would personally consider Fort Street to be an unequal street similar to Vogel Street in the sense that it's a side road, not a main retail precinct like George Street. Would that be a fair assessment? Uh, yes, that would be a fair assessment. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. I apologise for asking a question that's not directly related to what we're voting on today, but relates to the program. Um, Aurora has infrastructure in the area, and I've got verbal affirmation that they're not planning on renewals, but can we have written information from, uh, affirmation from them so we know for a fact that they absolutely will not come back in 10 years' time and go, oh my God, we've got a high voltage line that needs to be fixed? Uh, yes, we can seek that. We've had some more engagement with them over the last week, so I can get an update on that and provide it back. Thank you. Um, I just wondered, there was a question answered earlier prior to the lunch break that Councillor O'Malley asked around the foundations, and I was just a little bit confused by the answer with that, because my understanding is that... Um, 
when we um, in the papers that it talks about the option that we've got currently on the table is not viable because it'd be too expensive if we had to change it. And you talked a bit about that, but did you mention before? I think you said it, Josh, that you could put um, strengthen the street or something so that you agreed that you could do that. That would mean it could change from one way to two way. Is that what you were saying, or did I misunderstand that? Um, I was referring to the, like the, the granular pavement structure, if you will, so the, the, the road thickness, and if we can, within the detailed design phase, we can add that requirement if, if necessary. Um, right. It will, obviously, the, the thicker the pavement we um, design and build, um, the more costly it will be if we do need to sneak that out wider, um, but we can, we can include those provisions. Yes. So today, if by any chance we end up with a one-way, um, is that it? We won't be able to change back to a two-way. Is that this design will be final? Is that what? Is that the agreement, or will it be? Is there any flexibility in it? Um, we, we we can factor it into um, the design if necessary, but again, it does. It will come with a cost if we do need to build a thicker pavement. It comes with a okay. A and cost. what sort of cost would that be likely to be? I, I couldn't tell you that offhand. No, thank you. Uh, if I could just add that Josh has uh, covered the the base issue, so we can certainly extend the base. Just remembering that the change between one way and two way will also require the moving of furniture and the, the paving and the types of things on top as well. And, 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 yeah, sorry, and intersections. Yeah, curbs and intersections, so yeah, there's, there's, there's quite, a, quite a bit involved. So we factor the base in quite easily, it's the stuff on top that's a little bit more difficult and costly to move around. Councillor Elder. Just related to that question, actually, is if per se in the in the future we have um, no cars down there, but um, a two-way sort of um, system where um, you can have a bus or an electric bus going both ways in a loop, um, at, can we look at the future and think, well, we need to future-proof this and actually? Um, make it wider anyway? Because, I mean, in the future we may have two like tram-like things going up and down or around in a loop. Absolutely. I mean, the, the design life of the, of the pavement structure is about uh, 20 to 25 years, so we'll be looking out to see what um, that future might include and um, anything, we, yeah, anything's possible. So. Just, just related to um, his question, uh, Jim's question, um, and the other um, question was, um, with the infrastructure down the street, um, when we put that in, are we making it so that it's easily accessible, so if people like Aurora want to change things, it's much easier to change things? And I know people have talked about that. Um, we will install um, spare ducts, so there will be some capacity in there, and um, we'll also consider, and if safety and design um, workshops where the, where the manholes are, um, where the entry points are to access um, all the infrastructure under the ground. Um, so that will, that will be teased out and considered during uh, detailed design. Oh, thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Following on from Councillor Elder's question, can I just double check that? If we're two-way, will there be room for buses in a, in a two-way now, like moving forward if it was voted in favour? The current two-way as we've got it at the moment would preclude buses on the basis that there wouldn't be enough manoeuvring space and that we would have to go back to slightly wider lanes again under the existing bus type. Right, but if it was a smaller bus, say we loop bus like we talked about off and on, we could do that? Correct. Uh, under the two-way? Yes. Right, thank you. Councillor Raddick. Do you expect that the changes to Great King Street and Philil Street to accommodate the current George Street car traffic are going to be sufficient to handle? I'll, I will continue. I'll move the A and B as indicated uh, and we'll add to that uh, C uh, that uh, we, um, forgive me, I don't have the wording, decide the preferred direction of travel for one-way vehicle movements uh, and designate that as being southbound traffic. Um, uh, but before that, 
uh, that Council note the findings of the Retail Court at George Street Detail Business Case B confirms its previous decision to endorse a one-way design for the Retail Court at George Street Upgrade Project and C uh, decides uh, that South decides that the preferred direction of travel for one-way vehicle movements is southbound. Uh, there's, you, you most certainly can. Just give, a, give us a moment and we'll bring it up. Oh, is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded, Councillor Gary. Thank you. So should we, are we taking these in uh, separate? Yeah, that's fine. That, that's the point's well made. I'll, I'll, I'll amend that with the leave of the second to say confirms a one-way design for the project for the abs, for the clarity that that would provide. Just making sure that. People are ready. Is Adam some? You're comfortable? Ah, thank you. No, quite all right. In <clears throat> uh, moving this, uh, I want to thank uh, all of the people who have come and gone uh, from this project uh, over the past decade. Uh, among them, uh, elected members and staff uh, and consultants and the general public uh, from the conception of the Central City Plan work. Uh, to now, uh, the, the, uh, the discussion and the engagement has been extensive. Uh, the project has been often delayed or rephased, uh, as the as the jargon goes, but is now uh, finally imminent. Uh, what we want from this uh, is the safest, most accessible, most inclusive, vibrant city centre that we can build. Uh, we want a destination uh, for everyone. Uh, that tells our stories, and it's pretty clear to me from the papers uh, over the years, including the ones appended to this agenda, uh, that a one-way street design in George Street is by far the best option we have available to us uh, in terms of getting there. And why wouldn't we seize uh, the best opportunity that we have? Uh, in 2021, uh, in a climate emergency so declared, uh, why would we invest so heavily in a city centre revamp uh, that builds in a car dependency for another generation? And I appreciate that that isn't important uh, to everyone around this table, but I also know from the speeches that have been made around these issues that it is important to most of us, and it is certainly something uh, that needs consideration when we think about uh, how our city centre functions. Uh, this is about future-focused decision making uh, and I see the decision in front of us now as being uh, in the best long term interests uh, of our communities, all of our communities and I think it's worth noting among those who have been the most intimately involved in this discussion uh, through the delegated advisory groups or others uh, who is in favour of the option that we are debating now 
uh, those yeah. from the disability community, uh, those representing students and young people, uh, age concern, those advocates for young parents and families, uh, the police uh, and fire and emergency New Zealand. Uh, and again, and, and those against, uh, we have businesses, landlords, car advocates, and it is, it is understandable that people are anxious about what will be a significant change uh, and, it's, and a significant disruption to the way that they currently understand uh, how our city functions. Um, and, and again, you have to look at uh, who is supported by the status quo that we currently have uh, and who is actively excluded uh, by the status quo uh, that we currently have. Uh, apologies for the redundancy uh, in those last two sentences. Uh, because what happens if you have a one-way street design? Uh, will we be able to facilitate vehicle movements elsewhere? Uh, yes, we will. Uh, and, and, and if you have a two-way design, uh, will vulnerable users be able to feel safe and access our city centre, no, they won't. And if I have to choose uh, between those two, it's a reasonably clear decision. This is about providing, as much as anything else, a safe uh, and appealing destination, one that encourages and facilitates social connection uh, and well-being, about public activities and public spaces that will in turn spill over and benefit uh, private businesses and landlords uh, that occupy uh, that prime real estate. And regardless of what we choose, uh, this alone, we know, is no silver bullet. The urban design and, and transport configuration isn't going to uh, save the retail precinct. Um, and, and, and as has been pointed out, you know, the, the sole responsibility for a, a strong and vibrant uh, retail district cannot, and cannot sit with uh, the City Council. And, we, and we've seen uh, prime examples in other parts of the city, most notably uh, the warehouse precinct, where the most substantial investment uh, in that part of the city and in the urban renewal we've seen in that part of the city has come from uh, private building owners with the support of, uh, of, of the City Council. Uh, but this is part of uh, a range of things that need to be considered uh, in terms of uh, what we want our city centre to look like and how we want it to function. It's, it's alongside the recommendations that have come out of the parking roadmap in terms of how the, the wider transport network will function, and we will address that uh, in October. It sits alongside, um, well signalled through the draft uh, revitalisation plan, events uh, and activations of that space, uh, our ongoing efforts to encourage greater inner city living uh, in the city centre, better bus services, safer walking and cycling, all of those things uh, are important uh, to achieving the best uh, outcomes we can out of uh, out of the central city plan. And we need to, wherever we are provided with options on all of those things, uh, take the best option that we have uh, to, um, to, to progress in that direction. Um, it's inevitable uh, that we'll be relitigating the, the discussion today up to this point. It's entirely understandable. Uh, but it's important to remember that we've already uh, made this decision. Uh, when we had the... Uh, the, the IBC presented to us, council made a, uh, an in-principle decision that we wanted a, a one-way street design with the flexibility uh, to, uh, to change it back to a two-way configuration uh, should the need arise. Uh, and, and the detailed business case, the stage we're now at, is really the opportunity to test that thinking and, and tell you uh, what else you might need to know or might need to consider uh, in terms of making a, a final decision. And what it did tell us is that the, the cost of building in that flexibility uh, was prohibitive to the point that it wasn't actively considered. Uh, and I think that's useful, uh, that's useful to know. Uh, it also tells us, and, and I know that this was a big obstacle uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the last uh, debate, it tells us that uh, the transport network can cope uh, with these options, uh, that, that we, the, the network can accommodate uh, a one-way uh, street design. And I know that the, the data and the traffic modelling was something that people had great interest in, uh, and it's great to, to see that work and have that confirmed uh, that the network uh, can cope. Um, the, we, we could spend a long time, a lot of time, uh, second-guessing uh, what the design or, or layout of the New Dunedin Hospital might be or what Waka Kotahi may eventually do with the state highway network. Um, but that is true of any of the options, and if that was uh, a knockout clause for one, it would be a knockout clause for all, and, and I think the message we got very clearly from all of the people that have been involved 
uh, through the Central City Advisory Group uh, is that the status quo isn't an option. Uh, that this work needs to happen above uh, and below ground, uh, both in terms of maintaining our, our water infrastructure, but also uh, investing uh, in uh, our main shopping street, uh, which hasn't happened uh, for the best part of, of 30 years. So delaying any investment below or above ground in George Street until after the construction of the New Dunedin Hospital uh, doesn't seem tenable to anybody, and uh, it certainly isn't, uh, isn't tenable to me. Uh, we will make this decision today, and subsequent decisions will be informed by this, uh, but I'm, I'm confident that the network uh, can, uh, can cope based on the information uh, that we have provided. Uh, and um, and the, the decision around the direction of travel, which I initially flagged as, as, uh, as doing separately, um, I think the, I mean, certainly the, the strong sense we got from uh, supporters of the one-way design through the public forum today is that that is their preference. And I think that what swings it for me, aside from the, the, the psychogeography, if you like, of drawing people towards uh, the octagon and, and, the, and the city centre is uh, that that seems to me, based on what we have been presented, to be the best option in terms of reducing risk and reducing harm uh, at the five-way intersection uh, at the Knox uh, at the Knox corner by taking out uh, one of those um, five arms, uh, and so uh, that is uh, largely uh, the rationale for choosing uh, the southbound direction. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, this is about trying to create the safest, most accessible and most inclusive, vibrant city centre we can. Uh, this that we have before us is the best option we have uh, for achieving that through the current uh, central city plan work, uh, and I uh, welcome support for it. Through the speakers. Councillor Vanivis. Your Worship has been quite right saying that consultation has been extensive and delayed and done over a very long period of time. The initial consultation on this with the wider public drew the biggest petition that the city has seen the century. Six and a half thousand people said, no, we don't want this to happen. Last year's annual plan submissions the opportunity for everybody to make a submission. There were 172 submissions on this particular issue, second only to, to the usual rates issue. And again, the vast majority, including all but one of the community boards, were completely opposed. The consultation has since been refined. The consultation has since been run by the Central City Advisory Group, a group itself which I certainly had no chance of ever being part of. And what we have is essentially a wearing down of the wide resistance to changing George Street. Councillor Vincent Pope quite early on, uh, though confusingly a major supporter and driver of this, has said words to the effect that Dunedin already has the best city centre, the best city road in the country. And I agree with him on that. Why we would subsequently spend up to $60 million on surface treatments from George Street down to the exchange, when we already have the best and well-working central city shopping centre, in the country eludes me. To me, it makes absolutely no sense at all. Our Mayor, Mayor Hawkins, says that we don't want to do something that builds in car dependency for another generation. I think I got all those words right. We don't want to build in car dependency for another generation. This proposal is not a proposal for central city vibrancy. This is a proposal that is simply anti-car. It's not just anti-car. It's anti-technology. It's proposing that we all start to use buses again when bus use has been collapsing ever since 
the high in the 1950s when there were more passengers on buses than there were in cars. Bus use has continued to fall for at least the last 70 years and is predicted to do so, and economics is what drives it. Car dependency makes it sound like some kind of addiction, when in fact cars are the most safe, most comfortable, most convenient mode of transport that we now have. And they've become more so in every decade that has passed since the 1950s. The idea that somehow the cars are noisy and polluting is rapidly being uh, diminished by the arrival of electric cars. And if you look at uh, companies like Volvo, uh, six uh, companies in China, and a lot of the other major auto manufacturers around the world in 10 years' time, they won't be making any of these noisy and polluting vehicles. So the whole argument that somehow uh, for the central city to be uh, quiet and for people to have easy access and for there to be no pollution, that, that argument is simply irrelevant. By the time this proposal gets finished, the cars will be largely electric. Buses will have continued to become more expensive. Cars will have continued to become much cheaper to run and have virtually no maintenance. And all that we are doing now is going to be redundant. 30 seconds, Councillor. If we look at Norwich and Ipswich, two university cities in the UK of about our size, who had a go at doing a similar thing 20 years ago, the clarion call 10 years later is please bring the cars back. It hasn't worked in so many other cities. We are a city of hills where it's not going to work here. This anti-car agenda needs to be stopped. Thank you. Councillor Lofisal. Tēnā koe, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> thank you to the staff who have sweated over this for the last decade, as as, um, as His Worship said, and 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 to past councillors, in particular, um, I recall uh, Councillor or Richard Thompson's uh, comment to via the ODT at some point last year, maybe saying, "Yes, retailers and businesses have a point, but you've got to think about the customers." And I would just reprise, if you like, my statement uh, last time we debated this for a one-way um, design because of the input and submissions of young people, such as Generation Zero and OUSA, and um, the disability uh, groups. And I would add to that uh, the voice of Pasifika is in technology. Uh, I would say that it's really an argument for the status quo. And the status quo, um, is about keeping those who do not have power, do not have feel access to, to um, shop in the high-end uh, retail quarter, if you like. Um, I know a lot of people who live from Brockville, and they have cars, of course, and they don't go anywhere near George Street. And it should be, it should be possible in the future for people to come to the city centre and be proud of it, all of it. Rather, they would make the car journey to pack and save and what have you out in South Dunedin to do their shopping. And if we're talking about inclusion and we're talking about future generations, um, then the status, people who hold to the status quo are not thinking seven generations ahead, and we need to. And that includes the climate change um, that includes the climate change challenges that we face. Kia ora. Apologies, Councillor Raddick. Thank you. Um, as it says in the report, this is a once in a generation opportunity and as Glenn said, it's in no one's interest to see it fail. So here are five compelling reasons why George Street should be re redeveloped as a two-way. They are practicality, flexibility, viability, accessibility and safety. Firstly, it's far more practical 
to build a livable, workable compromise that a significant majority of residents can agree with, instead of constructing a contentious, polarizing political statement that so many people oppose. I refer to page 91 of the detailed business case, stakeholder acceptability is a significant element of this project, followed by page 119 where the, the question is answered, two-way is more generally accepted overall. I note the Otago Daily Times survey of November 2020, which showed 78% of readers preferred two-way. I note 65% in the residents' opinion survey are totally satisfied with the look and feel of the uh, central city retail area. They like two-way. I also note the property owners, the business owners, the Chamber of Commerce, the Hospitality Association, whom I've spoken to, and a petition of 6,500 shoppers who all prefer two-way. These are stakeholders Councillor, of primary importance. Councillor, Councillor Raddock, yes. it's been made quite clear during the questions of staff that the Hospitality Association presented no view uh, on the final design. Regardless of your personal uh, conversations, that isn't, they didn't submit Without. on the process to take a view on the options that are currently before us. Right, so uh, I also refer you to page uh, 99 of the detailed business case. The retail quarter's role as Dunedin's preeminent retail area is a strong driver for the project, yet their voice is all but ignored to say nothing of Grey Power, the AA and the bus users who represent tens of thousands of people. The two-way is far more acceptable overall and therefore a far more practical option. Flexibility is also crucial to the success of George Street. I refer to the case of page 11. There is a strong desire for George Street to have a high level of flexibility. A two-way redevelopment allows an easier transition to less cars on the street and keeps the door open to public transport. This is particularly important while the hospital rebuild is going on. Two-way makes a stronger street with a better foundation which future proofs it. It's clear that the street is used by through traffic now and that capability will still be needed for some time to come. So it's vitally important that we retain that flexibility. It will be easy to convert to one way if the need is evident later on, but very expensive to change from one to two. The viability of the businesses in the CBD is vital to its success. We've heard that. The businesses are the only reason this streetscape exists, and not enough importance has been placed on this aspect. Mayor Hawkins might favour a bohemian Cuba Street model, but he's wrong to suggest that retail rates are amongst the highest in Wellington. They fetch only half that of the golden mile of Manners, Willis and Lambton Quay. Furthermore, shoplifting is rife on Cuba Street due to a lack of police patrols, and the reduction in inner city car parks here has already caused many businesses to vacate as people go elsewhere to shop. All around the world, cities are working to make their inner city merchants more viable. You might say that one way will help, but the evidence is against you, and the owners do not believe it. They all want two-way, and to quote Richard Thompson, retail anchors a town centre, and if it fails, then the heart goes out of a city. We conducted a disastrous octagon experiment that cost businesses 10% of turnover, and there are plenty of empty shop fronts, shop fronts on George Street now. How many more livelihoods and jobs do you want to see destroyed before you're satisfied? Accessibility is everything to retailers. If the shoppers can't get there, they will go elsewhere. It's not just private cars, it's taxis, drop-offs, pickups, and buses, especially buses, and Cobus Mintz was categorical about that. Two-way allows public transport, but also allows mode shift, emission reduction, and access. One-way pushes ordinary people away, especially the elderly, the disabled, and bus users. Most people do not want to push bike. Plenty are not interested in walking a distance, and many are simply not capable of going far. Do you want to disadvantage them further? And then there's safety. Cuba Street has 10 times the national rate of assaults and is also rife with shoplifting, who among you will put your hands up to take responsibility for an increase in late night street crime due to a lack of eyes driving by on George Street? Cobus warned about it, remember? Who among you will want to tell student parents the bad news of a late night attack? What about cyclists going the wrong way at a one way street? It is allowed, and who cares to have their child or grandchild step out first? Please let us choose practical, flexible, 
viable, accessible and safe. Vote for two-way. Councillor Walker. Um, yep, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm probably one of the few people around the table who's actually quite disappointed with the proposals. And I'm disappointed because full or partial pedestrianisation is not one of the options today. However, I accept at this particular jun juncture for a number of reasons that Dunedin is not yet ready to embrace a move that is central to many of the world's great cities. However, to the ch as changes to the way we shop, to the way we spend our leisure time, and how we, and how we work and, and until the continued aspirations of the younger, more progressive members of our society, as expressed by the o OUSA and, and Gen Z, are come to the fore, I guess I'm prepared to, to, I'm going to have to be patient. I actually remember, as a member of the public, um, coming in front of council, which seems like eons ago, to submit to the central city plan, um, I think about 2011 or 2012, when I urged the council to be, um, to be bold and aspirational in moving towards uh, Dunedin, make, making Dunedin move towards becoming one of the world's great cities. So I continue to live in hope. But back to what we have today in front of us, presented in, in this um, detailed business report. For me, underlying all of it are two main things. Obviously, something we all agree on, the need to, to sort our infrastructure under three waters infrastructure in, under the ground. I think we all agree that needs to be done. And secondly, and most importantly, ensuring the viability of Jaw Street as a retail and hospitality hub into the future. I think we should all agree with that too. We also, all, having read the report, we all know that uh, George Street is currently used by vehicles primarily as a through route. However, through route drivers do not get your tills a ringing. And after reading all of this, I don't believe the two-way will fully address the through route problem. And if we don't address that problem, we will continue to stifle our local economy. Why would we spend money on upgrading George Street, asks Councillor Vandervers. We do and always have lived in an ever-changing world, Councillor Vandervers. This is an opportunity to transform Dunedin and better help business, retail and hospitality to leverage off of that ever-changing world. Doing nothing is that there is a declining sense of satisfaction with the look and feel of the central city. I think, again, we can all agree on that, which again makes it harder for businesses to compete with other areas, and more importantly, online shoppers. Therefore, we need to put people first. People live in cities. Let's take the opportunity to celebrate streets as places. Let's celebrate greening our city centre. Let's celebrate the diversity now living in our city. Let's celebrate and embrace progressive thinking. Let's celebrate access for all regardless of age or mobility limitations. And why? Because if it's good for people, then it's good for business. A do minimum option is not an option. The two way to me is a slightly better. Elsewhere in New Zealand and overseas. Our support of the business community has been immense and it's been going on for decades. And it's been successful. We've also committed substantial funds to several initiatives to improve access to car parking. Our recent in my Cagney parking roadmap, <clears throat> and this report refer to that and demonstrate that parking is plentiful. The issue is finding it, and for a lot of issue, the, the issue is for drivers wanting it free. Well, that's unlikely to happen given the values we're talking about in the land values in the central city. I have to also observe that the much vaunted greatest petition in all time that's been referred to by two speakers started off as a petition as a petition against pedestrianisation and not in the text of the petition but then morphed in its presentation from its authors into opposition to one-way traffic directions. When you think about it, we're really lucky in Dunedin at the layout of the city. that We've got feeder streets adjacent to and behind our main streets pretty much everywhere. In this case, uh, Falul and Great King, both with extensive off-street parking at our building and in the three buildings in Falul, one of which we still own, of course, because that extension of the design initiatives acknowledges in doing that the importance of Dunedin's biggest and most important business. And that university, which 
that this welcome development of the Dunedin Hospital complements also plans to produce and further expand its internationally significant medical precinct, and colleagues will be aware of the interdisciplinary medical training centre that is planned in association with the hospital build. 30 seconds. Is that time? 60 million dollars to improve and enhance the front door of our main street retailers it's a huge commitment and it's overdue and business owners and retailers know they too have got a key role to play in activating those spaces just as the city has in further encouraging and supporting the conversion of innocent city space to accommodation thank you thank you councillor elder thank you um I brought a picture along of a very colourful um, urban street drawn by a child, actually. Um, and um, it's very beautiful, and we all want a beautiful street. And looking at the designs, I think we're going to get one. In the design um, brief, it says both the one-way and the two-way will work. And that's really important. Um, I looked at, um, and I listened to lots and lots of people in the 10-year plan, and I listened to a lot of people, and one of the comments, and Alex King uh, referred to it, was that a lot of people cannot get to the Octagon, cannot get to George Street, cannot get to the library. So, in fact, um, because of the distance people can travel or can't travel, access to George Street is very difficult. And so I thought I'd research it because um, I didn't know the specifics of it. So I did a bit of a research and it says, making accessible streets is about street design, which is making it safe. It's furniture design, which means people don't bump into it. So it's really important. Um, it's putting... Um, seats so that people can have rests because that's important too. So proximity to, the de to people's destination if you've got a disability is huge. If you cannot, you can make, if they want to go from one place to another on George Street, they need to get on a bus and go to the next block. So it makes it accessible for them because it's proximity that stops you from doing things. One minute, councillor. So the reason I will be supporting a two-way street is because, in fact, a two-way street enables us to do a very efficient loop bus system. And that's why I would su support a two-way street, because, in fact, in the future, we will be able to have electric buses that are very narrow that can go both ways quite easily and people can jump on and off on the street uh, and get to where they want to go. And that includes using the university and popping around to all the different places and they can jump on and jump off, which means actually a lower carbon footprint for George Street if we use a system like this. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll be supporting these resolutions. I can fully understand the concerns of the business owners and the retailers, many of whom have been struggling with the effects of COVID-19 and fear that we will further damage their businesses. However, Council and its many consultants have spent hundreds and probably thousands of hours over several years studying and analysing a large number of factors to minimise any negative risks that would arise from changing to a pedestrian-oriented street. I'm confident that these changes will enhance not only the public realm for our citizens, but the vibrancy and sustainability of the retailers in the Central Business District. This is a big decision, and I'd like to draw a parallel with the decision made by Council to build the new stadium. Both have engendered strong reactions that to some degree have polarised members of our community. Change is scary, but at times we as city leaders have to have the confidence to make the hard decisions that we truly believe 
will deliver great outcomes for our city in spite of those fears. In my opinion, the significant work undertaken by staff and consultants to understand the risks and benefits give me great confidence that the outcome will be very positive for our community and those businesses. To quote the late Richard Walls, at times you just have to bite the bullet and make the hard decision, unpopular as it might be. How good the outcome of that decision is will be measured by how long it takes for our community to vote for it with their feet and have a positive reaction. As to the one way or two way, I'll quote from the ACOM report where on page 59 it clearly states, overall the options tested have little difference across the wider network in, reaction, in relation to travel times and congestion. I favour the one way and I'm, being, and I'm comfortable with it being southbound. For those who believe that the most important success factor for a retail business is to have more parking, I have to note that the two-way option has 25% less parking than the one-way option. We set our goal on making the CBD retail area pedestrian friendly, a place where people will want to gather and linger. Where the foot traffic generated by the beautiful surroundings ensures the success of our retail district. This will be a successful project and it will enhance our central city and its businesses. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. My vision for our central city is that Autopoti is a leader in an inclusive city centre. That the lens of the most vulnerable groups in our city, the most vulnerable shoppers and users of the area, those with mobility issues, be they young or old, um, those with disabilities, which may involve those in a wheelchair but other disabilities as well, young families, the elderly, are all included and considered when we land on an option. And I note that everyone wants this project to proceed quickly and everyone wants it to succeed. So the decision we have before us today is two-way versus one-way, and I will be supporting the motion, all three parts of it, because the point of difference for this, while uh, there weren't a lot of differences between the three choices we had, or the four choices we had, um, was the safety benefits for the one-way, more public space, and areas for activation, for arts and culture, and social interaction, and that is the point of difference for me. For the retailers, well, this is a huge investment that Council was make, making to support the retailers. It's going to increase the value of their property. Nobody's mentioned that. It's not the whole answer that was covered off in the report. and They would do well to attend to aspects like customer service, which we're not well known for in this city. When I go shopping, I enjoy the bespoke nature of some of our shops, and uh, we're well known for that. And I look for customer service as the point of difference. And we, it has been noted that it's important that there is private investment if this is going to work. I had a couple of anecdotes from two different people recently. One, a young woman who's a musician, who talked about uh, her vision for the city, and it was something unprompted by me, around a safe and affordable spaces for people in some of the buildings, apartments and spaces for small businesses to flourish. And she was thinking about what's happening in the central visit business di district around people living above it, and we've heard that mentioned in the reports. An older friend of mine commented how excited she was about the George Street project, and her issue was around trip hazards, and looking forward to that being addressed. And I want to turn now to accessibility. 
and I find it very difficult to listen to some of my colleagues uh, and their total disregard for the disability sector who have spoken loud and clear today and through the stakeholder group. It's a lens that we need to attend to. Not all disabilities are around mobility, but that's an important one. And I believe I'm extremely well placed to comment on this as a member of my family has mobility issues and currently I have a leg injury which means that I can't walk very far. So I'm very well aware of the difficulties and I am opting for the one way. The livability of our city is, is vital and I note that urban design can deal with crime prevention and I recall the comments of a police officer during the time of the Ed Sheeran closure of our central city and he commented to me that uh, that was uh, that he was delighted that it was closed in the area because one of the difficulties is um, the drive-by rentings and catcalling. 30 seconds, Councillor. Thank you. Um, I saw a post recently, the climate is changing, why aren't we? Uh, retail is changing, we need to too. Uh, and what is best for the most vulnerable users in our city is best for everyone and the one way southbound will deliver that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Thank you. Um, I will be supporting A, B and uh, not C. Um, thanks to staff and all the work they have done to get to this stage. Thanks to all the people that were represented groups and the workshops and those that came to the public forum. George Street has been currently is and needs to be going forward our city's number one street. Currently it is a major movement route, our sh key shopping street with many supporting services and the envy of many around the country. In my view, a two-way George Street allows for public trans so a transport system that could travel both ways. This to me really increases accessibility to all. It is exciting to see what future public transport may look like in the next 10 to 20 years and we need to accommodate that. Regardless of the decision, as per Councillor O'Malley's question, I think it is vital that no matter what the decision is made today, that the construction foundation work future-proof the street to be used one way and two way. I am deeply concerned that we have been presented as very much isolated to just a few blocks on either side of George Street. I have seen little consideration relating to the highway system and the construction of the new hospital. The design, I believe, should have been part of a wider city vision that talked about what our city centre should look like in 10, 20, 30 years and beyond. Anything we are going to do here is going to be great, but it's going to be isolated. As per page 72 of our paper, the future success in the retail quarter will rely on more than just the DCC's investment in the public realm. It is a collaborative approach between the DCC, business, property owners, user groups and other stakeholders will be far more likely to lay the foundation for a vibrant and attractive area for people to visit and invest in. I definitely saw the commentary from those private investors investing in George Street is that two-way is their preference. These investors are very keen to see George Street improve as they know what that is important to the success of their buildings, businesses and our city. And yes, additional parking is needed nearby. It is important to the success of future George Street, regardless of what it looks like. Yes, we want a safe and vibrant George Street, and this can be achieved with a well-designed two-way movement through it. My vote for a two-way George Street represents those of many in the community that have engaged with me, from the retirement homes in Mosgill, to the cafes around town, to the many communities I have attended in my various roles in the last few years, through to the golf club clubhouses. And yes, talking to me in the street and shops around the city. If anybody has an opinion on anything in council, George Street has been it. As you will all know, everyone has a view on the future of George Street. I have heard loud and clear that two-way is their preference. But whatever, excuse me? But whatever the decision of this meeting and how we proceed, we need to continue to champion the importance of having a successful George Street. 
one that all users will love, find vibrant and enjoy, but more importantly, we as a city can be proud of. Yeah, for clarity, Councillor, um, you appear to have indicated that you're supporting B, but have spent most of your time speaking against oh, it. Sorry, yes, that's correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. I just want to touch on a couple of points. Um, empty shops on George Street, this comes up a lot, and Infometrics did a study for us a few years back showing that it's consistently at 5%, and it's been like that for about a decade. Um, crimes and cars. Um, during the octagon closure, whatever you want to say of it, the police feedback at the time was that crime in the octagon dropped with the reduce of cars and that in fact cars were a source of crime, not a source of protection. And I can certainly go back to my days as a student when I ran away from 15 young lads jumping out of a car to beat the crap out of me, but I was faster than them. Um, when we... <laughs> oh, I wouldn't be able to do it now. Um, we, wish, we should be reminded this is a follow-up from a series of decisions we've already made to this point, and this is a culmination of, as others have said, over a decade's worth work of going backwards and forwards and considering different outcomes. And when we looked at the last time and we said that we would go with the one-way system, some felt at the time that that was still not a big enough step, although we heard from Mr Hazelden today that in fact some cities are considering this mixed modality as in fact might be the right level of um, interaction. We had to wade through 460 pages plus of quite technical data. I'm going to touch on that now for a little bit because when we're, consi you know, when we're considering the outcomes, it was essential that the IPM talk to the NBCM, and these were critical determinants of calculating the BCR. <laughs> now, the BCR fed into the originally the IBC and more recently the DBC. Obviously, all of this was sitting underneath the GPS, which, if it followed in its entirety, would have elevated the BCR and helped for a more favourable DBC outcome. This relates to the project's proximity in the RLTP and its ability of the project to be evaluated into the NLTP, and ultimately a favourable position in the NLTF, hopefully resulting in a full FAR allocation to the DCC by NZTA. Now, in simplistic form, if, the, if, if Waka Katahi had been following the government's directive through the GPS, we would have got actually good scores on the one-way system. But in fact, what we got was a detailed business case that came back basically neutral. And so the decision we are making today is to follow up on what we've done in the past. We've already decided on the one-way system. And now we have got to make a choice which is essentially around amenity. That's really what we're voting on today and how this city will feel, because the detailed business case did not come back on what was a transport-only analysis saying one was better than the other. So the choice sits entirely with us. I'm voting on the one-way system, and I'm going to vote on One Way South because of the improvements it brings into the Pitt Street intersection, especially considering the buses will be turning into that intersection as they come down Great King Street. This really is simply a question of how modern do we want to be. Do we want to be a city that's attractive to others to come and visit and live in, or do we want to simply sit and repeat the same old thing over and over and over again, and that's why I'm voting for the one way. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. I was going to start another way, but I have to completely agree with Councillor O'Malley. I was reading this report, and I have to say, and some people go, oh, yes, it's, is that I kept going, mm, mm, nodding off, because it was the NBC and the CBT, and the, it was... I mean, no offence to whoever wrote it, but it was really, it was quite, I don't like to say poorly written, but they always say keep the jargon out of stuff. And it was like, I had to keep referring back to the first bit where it said the index, what does the CPT and the DBG and the LBG and the BDB? I thought, I don't know what the hell it is. And I was so confused and it took so long to read it. And I mean, to get this amount of paper to read, like what, about a thousand pages, in three days, it was quite frankly quite overwhelming, um, and hence I've had a headache from wearing my reading glasses so often, and oh dear. Um, but we've got to this stage now, and we're here, and I, will, I won't be supporting this motion, um, but I do, I have to say, um, sorry, but I do not have the confidence that um, Councillor Staines has that this is going to be positive. I don't think it will be. But look, prove me wrong, it might be. And that's why I brought up earlier, having a two-way 
would give us the flexibility to do some sort of trial to prove whether it is successful or not, and we'd have the options of doing either. And we've got the business community saying to us, please don't do this, you know, they're really worried. This comes at a time that they've just suffered four, maybe four and a half weeks of being closed down. Now many of them are under um, restrictive, you know, um, already, you know, struggling to get by because they can only have certain numbers of people in their shop. There's real restrictions on them already. And uh, the timing of this, we can't help it, obviously, because we're in a pandemic, but I think the timing is, is quite frankly, terrible because there's a lot of fear. And, of course, the pandemic has added to it, but it, it's tough for businesses out there. And I think for us, I also have to say, I question... I, I do not think this is a, um, a definition of progressive. And I certainly, as a person who's been involved in business before, but many other people around this, uh, around our room have been as well, is when you, how do we say that we know far better than the business owners who are running their shops that we know what they don't know? You know, I find that really hard and I struggle with that when I think all the, you know, 99% of the business owners, I know there's some who are unsupportive of it, are saying don't do it. And for us to sit here and say no, we know better, really cuts deep for me because I don't believe we do. We're not running their business. We're not their day-to-day. -day. We don't see their financial figures. And if it comes out that the predictions they've made are true and correct, then I think we're going to have to put a hand in our pocket and say, right, we need to help you when these businesses, if they collapse financially. I mean, where are we? Uh, we can't just say, oh, we'll ignore all your cries for help and your cries for don't do it, when we've had, as, as quite a few of us have mentioned now, Cobus Mintz um, recommended two-way and a one-way, but in a workshop, he did say to us, if I had to choose two-way, he said, for safety reasons, and he gave several other reasons, he said, would be my preferred. But he put two options up, the one-way and the two-way, and the majority of councillors voted for the one-way. But he is acknowledged as one of the urban um, design minute, experts in, in New Zealand. We had the CBD advise, advisory group who were meant to be our voice and our connection and our engagement for this process. The majority of them wanted two-way. We've had Grey Power say they want two-way. What we're missing, if we, don't, if we vote for this today, is we're losing the flexibility we had in that last motion. I didn't vote for the last motion, but um, if two-way wasn't ever allowable, I would have voted for that last motion because it gave us a flexibility to have a two-way at some stage if it didn't work. This doesn't. This gives us no flexibility. And, you know, in a two-way with the um, bollards, we have an opportunity to block off for events. We can have full pedestrianisation or one way. And we can still have two-way. We have everything. It pleases everyone. And what I want to say before my time runs out is that I want to thank the CEO for appointing Dr um, Glenn Hazeltine. I have spoken to some business owners who have been furious about the whole thing. It's Are you going to cut time, me off now? It's your time, Councillor. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I support these resolutions and the One Way South option, primarily as the Pitt Street 5 intersection safety has a higher safety rating, all things being equal. Having been hit and knocked out of that intersection, I have a keen interest in the safety of this intersection. Some rhetoric has been used in the past about Council going against staff recommendation for One Way versus Two Way in 2020. However, when the report is analysed, the multi-criteria analysis, two options scored 35. One way north and two way. The other option, one way south, scored 37. The extra points were for safety and overall network function. All of the evidence that we've heard since then confirms the multi criteria analysis assessment. So, as was mentioned earlier today, it's a philosophical discussion about how you use public space. The compelling argument is that we need to act as soon as we can to bring the magic back to our main street. 
We need to fix the infrastructure, that's for sure. Last night I heard from a central city retailer whose stock had been flooded by a burst water main under George Street. The underground issues are real, and what a great chance to fix the above ground too. It was great to be able to assure them that many of the issues brought up would be addressed through the plans for the enabling works on the surrounding streets to make better, safer fl traffic flow better access to parking and better wayfinding. Of note is that the proposed one-way options have nearly 30% more parks than the two-way options. What I really want to focus on is the why of what we are doing for the retail quarter, why Council considers it important to spend so much time and effort on George Street. What we need is an inspiring vision for all of us and the excitement of an amazing public space, space that we'll all be excited to visit, hang out and shop in. Haven't we all been a wee bit jealous when we've visited other cities and seen some of the innovative spaces they've created? When I visit Wellington, I head straight to the Cuba Street Mall as one of the most exciting places to be, despite the crime which I have investigated and mostly happens in the evening apparently. After reading through all the reports, looking at the consultation and feedback, I went back to the oft-quoted Dunedin Central City Plan, which has been um, as Council of Benson Pope referred to, around since 2011 in various conceptions. The key words in the plan are the overarching vision to create a place focused on people. That's the ultimate reason for all this work and investment and hundreds of pages of reading. In my work in business and tourism, we focus on customers and getting them to visit through creating a compelling destination. Tourism New Zealand has always focused on getting people to stay longer and spend more. I believe that we do need to create that compelling destination and to use the space created by more pedestrian public space to do that. Imagine if we could have had a virtual reality walk through future George Street and really seen what could be. I don't think we'd be spending quite so much time debating in this chamber. We'd be advocating for shovels in the ground as fast as possible. Ten years ago, the aim of the Central City Plan was written, to create a central city space that is vibrant and compelling, we've heard these words a few times today, safe and accessible, environmentally sustainable, culturally inclusive, and a hub for community and economic activity. Finally, we're getting closer to it. All those aspirations have been included in the planning I've read. Simply, the plan aims to help create a centre city Dunedin can be proud of. I don't think anyone feels very proud of it right now. So we need to work together as a community to help create this place. All the groups that appeared today at public forum that have been part of the consultation, everybody cares about and wants a great, vibrant George Street. We need to focus on getting there together. We've been assured that a lot of the issues raised, crime stats, accessibility, etc., will be addressed through detailed design. The Retail First report last year stated it's important that the retail quarter responds with transformative spaces and experiences that reflect social and environmental objectives while also supporting future economic opportunity. I consider the important word here One is... Minute, Eh? One minute. Transformative. So I did ask a question earlier about why the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce uh, had a different opinion about which way the streets should go from the um, chair of the Retail Committee. And I know the chair of the Retail Committee very focused, read the Retail First report, and they were also a very experienced retailer. Um, so that was one of the things that actually helped me make the decision. But I did go back to the multi-criteria analysis and also about what we wanted to do, which was to make a people-friendly space. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. Um, yeah, look, I can support these recommendations. When I came here today, I wasn't sure whether I was uh, more keen on voting south or north. I quite like north. I, I think it has some merit as well, um, possibly because I come into town from the south and it'd be easier than doing the loop up. Um, but, uh, but one thing I would say is I don't think it's in anyone's interest, as Dr Hazelden said, to uh, muck this up and do it wrong. And I don't believe that we're going to. I am um, listening to Councillor Houlihan. She says about Covis being one of the leading urban designers in this country. Well, I think Dr Hazelton's another. And um, as well as that, he's, he's a gifted communicator at getting his points across, and I think he does that actually better than Covis, in my opinion. But um, I, I believe we can do this, and I believe we can do it well. And um, I just think of places I travel around the country, around the world, different places I've been to, and um, you know, even if it's a wee place like St Clair where you go in and it's a one way and it's a slow space 
and you can pull off to the left or you can pull off to the right and you see people walking and drinking and sitting on the street. Or whether you go to somewhere like Townsville where you go down the Strand and it's all been uh, taken out of two way to one way and it works and um, you know you can be walking down the Strand in Townsville and you'll see business people come out of buildings or you'll see people go and park nearby and walk and they'll sit and have their coffees and their business meetings on the street. And you see it in lots of other places. And I realise you can't compare apples with apples, they're not the same, but you see it in you know, Circular Quay in Sydney and, and lots of other places. And I, I've just come, as I've perhaps got older in life, to appreciate those spaces more and more. And um, I believe there's no reason why it can't work here. And um, I'm absolutely, absolutely convinced of that. And I think the only thing that would handicap it as if we didn't give it enough budget to enable it to happen properly. And I'm convinced that should that arise, um, there'll be a desire around this table to do what's needed. But I'm also convinced with what Glenn said this afternoon that there wasn't uh, an adequate budget. So, yeah, thank you. That's my view. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll, I'll speak briefly in response to a few things that have been uh, mentioned over the last uh, hour or so. Uh, Councillor Vanderviz has said that we needn't worry about shifting from the status quo because cars will get uh, cleaner and quieter. Um, I think when you get hit by a vehicle um, or live in fear of being hit by a vehicle, you don't care too much what's fueling it. Uh, and indeed, um, there's a the perverse outcome of the transition, which is admirable in this part of the country towards electric vehicles, is that you can't hear them coming. Uh, and therefore, if you are a, a vulnerable road user, uh, that is uh, that is a greater risk. Um, I, I appreciate uh, Councillor Lofisel's comments around making room in the public realm for for families, for whānau, for people who move around in numbers greater than one and two. And for people who, who don't uh, frequently use George Street as a pedestrian, I can assure you that at peak times there are already uh, congestion issues uh, as a pedestrian uh, on our main shopping street. And as anybody who has um, time-sensitive errands can attest, uh, as you're trailing behind perhaps one, perhaps more groups of uh, more sanguine housemates uh, who are on a, a different uh, time schedule uh, to you might be. Um, uh, Councillor Radica said that we should support the two-way option because it is, the, it is the consensus option in terms of stakeholder acceptability. Uh, and, and certainly it is true uh, by the metrics that are used, but I think that's equally as much uh, a fact, uh, I think a factor equally as, as as relevant to that is the fact that people who are advocating for change uh, are less uh, trenchant uh, in their views around this uh, and therefore uh, a little more accepting of things not quite going their own way. Uh, and when you set up uh, a, a framework like we have had to use for this, that is the outcome. Uh, Councillor O'Malley, it is unfortunate uh, that you've taken this opportunity uh, to speak so ill of Treasury uh, and their methodologies without them being here uh, to defend themselves uh, in this forum. Um, I'm going to leave aside what is quite extraordinary fear-mongering about crime uh, as a result of what we are being asked to, what I am asking you uh, to support here, but I, I do think it's unhelpful. What I do want to pick up on uh, is the, um, the way that, regardless of their involvement in the Central City Advisory Group, uh, regardless of their very strong and very clear uh, feedback that was delivered in the public forum, uh, we have elected members here who are prepared to, uh, at the very least, misrepresent the feedback that has been received by the disability community, uh, and worse than that, uh, invoke that community as a reason for voting against this. Uh, and, and Councillor Elder, I think in particular, as the chair of the Disability Issues Advisory Group, uh, to sit here and hear what they have to say to us about how they want the city centre to function, uh, and then both A, ignore them, uh, and B, use the members of that community as a, as a reason to support voting against this uh, is certainly uh, disappointing. And the only the, the last thing I want to say really is about the, the comments that have been made inevitably, and I'm surprised it was only once, uh, about the, the abject failure of uh, the Octagon experience. Uh, and I disagree uh, that it was an abject failure. Uh, certainly uh, I have never seen more in the way of young people, young families and in general uh, using our city centre before or since then. 
Uh, and yes, there are things that absolutely could have been done better, and there are things that we will uh, improve on as a result of that. Uh, but I think it's been, uh, it was encouraging over that period, actually, uh, to see a, a city centre that was more welcoming uh, and more inclusive. Uh, and it's been sad that it has gone back to uh, the status quo. Uh, and you know, much is made about how it decimated business, uh, so much so that one of the retailers in the Octagon has since uh, not just remained open, but opened another retail business uh, in that same area. So it can't have been uh, such an abject failure for everybody uh, in that affected area. Uh, certainly it will inform the way that we mitigate the inevitable, inevitable disruption uh, of this work, both below and above ground. Um, but I think it's, it is, um, it is uh, un, unfortunate and, and untrue for it to be characterised in quite so blunt of terms. Uh, I have one minute and I don't need it. Uh, I'll take uh, A uh, and then we'll take B and C by division. Uh, the, uh, a is noting the findings of the retail court at George Street detailed business, ca uh, business case. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? The votes are recorded. I've been asked to take the vote by division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. No. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 11 3. B. Oh, just give another division. <laughs> Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. No. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. No. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. No. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. Sorry? Five. Thank you. Carried 9-5. C. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. This is for C. No. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 11 2 with one abstent. My apologies. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting for 15. Oh, indeed. Uh, I'll move that we extend the length of the meeting beyond six hours. I seconded Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Any abstentions? Uh, I will subsequently move that we adjourn the meeting for 15 minutes. Seconded Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you.
Welcome back, no. councillors. Uh, if you will uh, indulge us in terms of the batting order, in order to have staff to be able to speak to uh, item 17, the review of keeping of animals, open parentheses, excluding dogs, close parentheses, and birds by law, uh, we're going to take, uh, recommending that we take that item now, in case, unless there's significant objection, and there appears not to be. Uh, so, uh, welcome Ms Austin and Ms McGill, you're speaking to this, do you have anything Ms. to offer, and Ms Gray, my apologies, uh, um, anything to add by way of introduction or you're taking the paper as read? Um, take, kia ora tato, I'm taking the paper as read. Excellent, questions? Thank you. Are there questions? We're at that stage already, are we? Uh, 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 there, there appear to be none, so thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Wiley and seconded by Councillor Walker. Just giving staff a moment to clear out before the significant debate. Your Worship, I just got a um, clarification um, that Miss Graham would have, the CEO would have ability to make slight edits to the paper. Oh, as an additional... It, resolution we, as, as we, to the recommendations? Yeah, we were made aware that there are a couple of minor typos and that resolution will allow That sounds like an entirely them. sensible part D of that. Thank you for picking that up. Would you like to speak to it? No, I think it's uh, long, we've gone long enough today that we'll leave the uh, puns out of it. But I, I very, think... Um, very, very generous of you. But I think, think <laughs> I thank Councillor Barker and Elder for um, stepping up to assist me on this one. Thank you. Further speakers? Yeah, no, nothing from me other than to wish you the best of luck uh, in your endeavours. Uh, it, uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That is agreed. <laughs> Mr Dyer had different, a different view of how rigorous the questions and debate would be around the statement of proposal and is en route um, to deal with that. I'm assuming there's no one else. No one else. Let's do that. Item 16, 10-year plan update amenity requests. Ms Graham will speak to it insofar as it requires speaking to. Sorry, we're on page 240 of the agenda. Council, councillor's apology from Ms Bodeca, she's gone home today unwell, and so I'm happy to answer any questions that I can in her absence. Councillor, apologies, councillor Lofiso. Tēnā koe, Your Worship, uh, tēnā koe, Ms Graham. I just have a very quick, quick question. Um, I think I'm, I can't remember what paragraph this is, but it's the trees on vacant council land paragraph. 25 yes. and 26? 25 and 26, yes. So has the submitter been now advised of the correct process to follow? I believe they have. Thank you. Councillor Gary. I thank you, Worship. I've got several questions. The first on item, or well, paragraph 8, uh, and I was interested to know the timing. This is the um, coastal hazard risk assessment. Uh, the timing on that... I'm sorry, I don't know any more than it says there, but I'm happy to provide that information to yes. councillors once I know it. Yes, thank you. And secondly, item 10, around the sea lions and the fencing, what is Doc's role in, in that? Do you, I mean, we, obviously we, we have taken a role to some degree, and, uh, but what is Doc's role? I know that we have worked with Doc on this to look at um, what was appropriate fencing and um, ways of mitigating it. The issue, but, and, but so we don't work know with us. The, the working with yeah. you. And finally, uh, item 30, Otago Harbour. So, uh, what is the timing for um, constituting that working party? I see the timing for drafting the plan, but what's the timing for constituting the group? I'm just checking where the Relevant stakeholders, including the Yacht Clubs, will be invited to take part in a working party. I don't have an answer on that either, but I don't think that work has begun yet. 
in any detail. Okay, thank you. Councillor Walker, thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Oh, yeah, just um, item 19, or paragraph 19, the road to Port Chalmers uh, to Ara Moana. Um, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, when, given that this is probably coming, it's under, the, you, you're saying it's going to come under the coastal hazard risk assessment, but it probably can also come under climate change adaptation, adaptation as well. What sort of large body of work are we looking at here in terms of this road coming under lots of other headings? The, the, this is one of many roads that, as we face the issues related to climate change, that we'll need to consider around the around the city. And so there's a um, we are working on a program of work that will um, feed through into various budget decisions. So there's significant work that would be required if we were going to um, make this road more resilient. Great. And then the next one down, the Concord underpass, um, the mention of dealing with it is in the 10-year plan, but this is also a, a safety, road safety network issue. So is this going to be dealt with through transport and, and Wakakatahi as well? Because I think that's under the state highway there as well. Staff have had multiple discussions with Wakakotahi over a range of things that are listed here, and I'm sure this was one of them, even though it doesn't say that specifically. Can I just ask a, a generic question about this process? And it's great to have the, these updates. Um, but then there, there, are, there are responses to submissions by members of the public, not responses to resolutions of council. Mm -hmm. So where ongoing work has been indicated as a response to the amenity request, where does that... It wouldn't go to the work programme because it's not a resolution of council, but where would it report back to? Now the work programme does cover things that are not resolutions of council. The um, outstanding action items are the resolutions of council, and then other things that form part of the work programme um, show up either in the in that ably <laughs> named document that is the 10-year plan, and then the next annual plan document. It'll fit in there. Right. Where there is work happening. Where there is work happening, and otherwise it will feed through in the relevant activity reports, or just in something like this. This, as you know, is the first time we've tried to do something like this because before we we never provided feedback so we're happy to take feedback on if it's useful and how we might improve it but it's a start because it's not a process we've done before. Further questions? It's been moved by Councillor Walker from memory. Seconded by Councillor O'Malley, thank you. Would you like to speak to it Councillor? Just, just very briefly, thank you. Um, yeah, just I really appreciate this this report because I, I think it really helps just uh, cover off those, those topics that the public previously maybe haven't had feedback on. And excuse me, Councillor Murray, for my interruption because it was I also was concerned about that item and thought I'd be answered. And thank you, Miss um, 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 uh, Graham, for, for for clarifying that you'll get the timelines because that eight obviously relates to Aramoana as well. Um, so yeah, just really appreciate of this. Um, Good to give feedback on, on the request the, from, from the swimming pools as well. So I've been asked a number of questions of that, so it's great to be able to go back with this detail. Councillor Milley. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I'm happy to see this here too. I think it touches on some of the requests. It, it touches on potentially the direction that Councillor Barker and I had raised during the long-term plan deliberations, which is that when submitters come, um, if they do not get funded in that last funding round set, they tend to be forgotten and so this is a mechanism of picking up that activity and I really appreciate it and I look forward to it as it unfolds such as the Concord intersection and see how that plays out as we get through the next three year period. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I concur, and uh, I just want to give the example of the Otago Harbour items 29 and 30, which arose out of um, frustration, I would uh, expect, from there being a commitment from Council uh, 
in 2017 to a plan. It's taken a very long time, so um, it's great to see some movement on this. Uh, and uh, and also good to see um, the noting of the issues in Tidewater, Tidewater Drive and Stepney Avenue, which I note are, are enlisted as urgent, needing urgent attention. So I think for the community, this makes them feel heard, and it's noted and documented, and then we go from there. Um, yes, I'd just like to follow up on um, Councillor Gary's comments around... Um, Seawall at Tidewater Drive and Stepney Ave. Um, there were a flooding issue there again just earlier in the month, um, and that could turn out to be a, quite a severe issue if we don't um, take an active step in basically dealing with it sooner rather than later. Um, and I think it's good to see that it has made the page here. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yes. Um, talking about 29 and 30 Otago Harbour. Having spoken with the Deputy Harbour Master last week, uh, they are quite enthusiastic to be uh, participating in this plan. Further speakers? I just want to add my thanks to seeing this report come back to Council to update us on, on things that have been raised during during submissions, uh, as has been said, outside of what we would ordinarily consider uh, the budget setting process, where these things are raised with us, because usually fixing amenity requests requires resourcing uh, at council's end. And while it, you know, it was never promised to us to be a perfect process, I think it's uh, a, a fine example of how we are uh, evolving and, and making our, uh, our processes more responsive to the needs that are being raised in our community. And uh, I welcome it as, a, as an ongoing feature of our ongoing debates. Councillor Walker, your right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That is agreed. Thank you. Welcome back. Item 14, uh, Three Waters Reform, and as I indicated uh, when this last came to this forum, it's my intention to, to move the letter as drafted, accepting that there may well be amendments made to it. Um, but it just seems like the easiest process for dealing with things. Uh, anything either of you wish to add by way of introduction? I'd just to acknowledge additional feedback from councillors. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Councillors, are there questions? Councillor Benson Pope. Um, well, it might be for the two, three water, two, three water staff, or it might be for the Chief Executive, but I've been wondering about, given the process that we're in here and the fact that there are lots of people in the community who are asking us to do something that I don't think we're in the, in the, on the point of doing, even if we might, um, I'm wondering if anyone can cast any light on exactly what the situation is with Christchurch. Are they, they're in the same statutory position and they've responded, as I read it, and flagged that whether or not whatever happens with consultation, they're flagging a desire to opt out. Is that correct? An intent to opt out. That's correct, and a, an intent to opt out. But I guess our view will become apparent in people's comments on the letter. Further speakers? Further, oh, sorry, my apologies. So that time is up. Uh, questions? Councillor O'Malley. Again, clarifying that point, um, the letter today is, am I correct, a response to the request from DIA or government um, that we comment on the plans to date and, and not a request to opt in or opt out? That is correct. Very good. And we sought advice and that was the advice that we also got, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yes, my understanding of the situation, especially after reading the legal opinion, is that at this point we should merely provide, we're asked to provide feedback to government, and because we don't have all of the facts yet in front of us, in front of us it's premature to be uh, opting in or out. Is that right? That, Thank you. that is the same question asked slightly differently, and the answer remains the same. Yep. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you, yes. Oh, yesterday on my 
Facebook page, I got a real barrage of comments around why aren't you consulting now? And I said, well, it's not the time. They said, no, you're incorrect. You're wrong. You've got to do it now. Other councillors councils have done it. And, um, you know, but... And, and they've said that we're amiss and missing out on doing it and we're leaving the public out. Um, is, none of that's correct, is that right? Or, or that, am I wrong? What no, <laughs> there, we don't have enough information to satisfy the, um, our obligations under the Local Government Act at this stage. Yes, that's what I told them. Yep. Mm, thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in that regard, um, this response is um, saying, well, we don't have enough information, we can't make a choice. But um, after this stage, do we have the opportunity to go out to the public, which is what Councillor Houlihan has the suggested? The only, the, only, uh, the only thing we know for sure around the timeline of this reform program is up until the 1st of October, uh, subsequent to receiving the feedback from local government bodies, Cabinet will respond with a timeline as to where they see it going from here. But certainly all the way through this process we have been told that there will be an opportunity before we make a, a substantive decision for our community to provide input into where they want us to go. Cool. That's a good reassurance, hopefully. <laughs> Again, I, I choose my words carefully. It is what we have been told uh, all the way through this. Councillor Lofisor. <coughs> Tēnākou, Your Worship. Tēnākou, Rua. Um, <clears throat> my question is similar to the question that I asked of the uh, use of te reo in the business case for George Street or Central City Plan. And uh, sorry to be pedantic and stray near operations, but I'm just wondering who, <clears throat> how, how does the the, um, the process of Morrison Lowe writing their report, and they persistently use te treaty or waitangi, which is not what we're authorised under in terms of the Local Government Act. So how does that get to happen? It should have happened and it didn't. They misunderstood, I think. So the document that we controlled the writing of, um, which is the draft submission, has is referenced appropriately. And so we, we've noted that we should probably instruct our consultants a little bit more directly. Further questions? Councillor O'Malley? It does raise the interesting question that the Department of Internal Affairs tends to be using Te Tiriti and we are using the treaty and that's our, that's our obligation is not at the treaty at the moment. And, and, and I'm, because I'm, it is, I think we all agree, two different documents and certain critical components. I, 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 would, I would consider our guiding principles to be more of a commitment than an obligation. Uh, the lawyers will tell you that um, we don't have the same obligation that the Crown does under whichever version um, you choose to prioritise. And if I could just add to that, our current strategic framework references the Treaty of Waitangi and until there's any consideration to changing that, that is the basis of um, how we frame this, our strategic framework. And that's why we are using the Treaty whenever we make our documents even sometimes when the government documents coming towards us say te tiriti. Um, and that, as well as what the, um, His Worship said, because the Crown obligation is expressed differently in law. And also a live question whether those agencies that are including that are aware of the substantive difference. Uh, Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm not sure if it's, I'm asking Tom, probably Tom actually, but in paragraph two, um, I had real problems with the meeting we had last week that I couldn't have supported paragraph two, but it's been uh, modified and it says in the, in the last uh, sentence or two, it says, we accept there is a case for changing the way three water services are regulated at the national level. Now, can you just explain the difference between the way they are regulated and what the proposal, it's quite a different thing altogether, and I just wonder if you could explain that. Uh, yeah, sure. There's, there's several tranches to the government's Three Waters Reform Program, um, one of which is uh, regulatory, uh, which is the establishment of a new drinking water regulator and a number of other things, which is well advanced. Um, uh, that regulator uh, is likely to be in place and our regulator by the end of the year, based on legislative progress in the last week. 
Um, and then the other substantive part, which is the part we're providing feedback on now, is um, uh, service delivery reform, which is a proposal to uh, aggregate service delivery. Um, uh, so I think in principle, from what we've heard from the Council, we broadly support the principles of the regulatory reform and the need for uh, for change and an uplift in uh, levels of service delivery across the country. Um, uh, however, the, the feedback is um, a little bit different when it comes to service delivery reform and those proposals. Thank you. And there's just one other question as well, and I sort of think of all Jordan Peterson's colleagues that are email, emailing us all today and um, urging us to vote They're not no. wildly dissimilar in their world views, but Jordan Williams is probably who you're looking Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Who did I say? Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Sorry. Freudian slip. Um, yeah, Jordan Williams' views. Um, but uh, I was just wondering, in terms of, I think a lot of people are looking at this as the, the water's been drinking water, and I think that's the bit that concerns the most people, but would it be fair to say that probably nationally the far greater problem uh, that needs uh, addressed, whether it be by government or by councils, would actually be the um, stormwater? The uh, all, all three waters are material challenges for the sector going forward, both drinking, storm and, and wastewater discharges. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Uh, yes, I think this might be for the Chief. Um, whatever we agree on today in terms of the letter with tweaks or not, how will we communicate that to our community um, in that there's so much interest out there and so much misinformation, people believing we're making a decision to opt in or out today and not really understanding the, the proposal we were up to. How will we communicate that? I'd once the letter is finalised, I would imagine that we will um, produce it and provide a media statement so there's clarity about what it is that we've submitted and at what part in the process it was. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, question for yourself or um, Mr Drew or Mr Dwyer. What are we expecting uh, in paragraph 54? We welcome the opportunity to engage further. How do we anticipate that's going to happen? Uh, any way we can make it happen. Um, it's reasonably enabling, um, and as is referenced in the letter, uh, the, the mayors of Otago and Southland have a meeting with the minister this week to discuss the proposal, uh, and it will certainly be helpful to have uh, an agreed position insofar as we have a shared set of concerns set up uh, to inform the discussions that, that I'm able to have in that position. Uh, but certainly um, we would take whatever opportunities are presented to us. Uh, and, and likewise, um, the, the invitation to the Minister to come down and talk to us specifically, because while it's great to have those wider discussions, the concerns and, and aspirations of this community, uh, or of each community, are different. Uh, and so we'd welcome the opportunity to, to have that corridor. I guess what I'm sort of getting the feel of, and this letter really sort of summed it up, was the input that Councillor O'Malley had um, in bringing the two letters together and moulding them and ensuring that um, Councillor O'Malley with his three waters, um, so with his chair of infrastructure had on as part of those discussions. Oh, I see what the question is actually. Um, so, yeah, and that was that came up in the uh, in in the earlier discussion as well. And, and the reason why the the delegations, insofar as they exist, and the recommendations are as high level as they are, is because uh, while yes, that would absolutely be useful in some discussions, they're not all infrastructure concerns. Uh, so um, we're we're un unable to speak on behalf of council's position on planning matters, for example, I would ask the Chair of Planning and Environment or through the, the, the discussion around what the stranded asset financial implications are, I'd ask the Chair of Finance to do that. So that's, it's not a personal, it's not a slight on any particular elected member, it's just trying to set it up as, as broadly as we can to have the right people speaking at the right times should they become available. I guess at this time, Councillor Staines is quite happy that he's on economic development. <laughs> it's an all, it's an all, in, it's an all-encompassing reform program. No, no one's safe. Ah, Councillor Vanavis. 
In response to my question to staff, and the question was, how will we be able to justify our enormous and growing debt levels when the asset base on which this debt has been raised and justified suddenly contracts by $2.5 billion? And the uh, reply has come back, if Three Waters assets are transferred from council balance sheets, the relevant level of debt will also be transferred with the assets. Can you tell me what this relevant level of debt will be? Oh, it hasn't been determined yet. Sorry? It hasn't been determined yet. Well, if it's worth 2.5 billion, and they're going to give us 47 million, how can you determine what the relevant debt level is and how can you be sure it's not going to affect our ability to raise debt or justify the debt that we have? The justification of debt is a question for politicians to answer, not staff. Um, the, the proposal, as it is set out... Uh, uh, it, with if respect, you could allow, Your Worship. Allow to finish, Councillor. Uh, the proposal here is that um, the transition period would take us through until July 1, 2024, uh, and I would anticipate the financial, if this is what eventuates, uh, the financial implications of this to feed through into our review of the financial strategy as part of the next 10-year plan cycle, where we would entirely have that debate about uh, our appetite for borrowing against the asset base and cash flow of the Council. Um, with respect, my view, Your Worship, is that we need to make a decision now uh, regarding the potential take by the government of $2.5 billion worth of our assets, and we need to know now how that is going to affect our ability to raise money and what effect it's going to have in terms of um, uh, the interest rate that we have to pay. If we have an asset base that suddenly contracts by $2.5 billion, we need to realise what those implications are now. And it's not a political decision, it's a business uh, understanding. If you no longer have Councillor, the assets... Ca Councillor, the, the, the staff response has been that the financial implications of what is proposed are yet to be determined. No, what they've told me is that the relevant level of debt will be transferred. I want to know what the relevant level of debt is. They've said the relevant level of debt will be transferred. I want to know what the relevant level and, is. And we will work through that as if the proposal goes ahead, um, we will work through that and as His Worship said, there will be full consideration of what that means once we have more detail. And the, tenor of this letter is that we don't have enough detail around some of this yet to make those decisions and this is that's the feedback that's being provided to the government but we already know that it's 2.5 billion dollars worth of asset what more detail do you need i've answered the question as best i can councillor with the information that we have councillor Hulahan. Thank you. Um, if Christchurch has opted out, if that's true, well, does that mean we're now, we'd be left as the biggest councillor in the, in the South Island um, Takiwa? So th that's not what staff said, councillor, if I might. They said councillor oh. indicated that their current position is that they might opt out, but no one has made that decision yet, or no one has made that decision yet in the South Island because it's not a decision they can legally take yet. Right. So um, if they're saying now that they might opt out, so indicating that might be what they'd do, what are the implications of that for us? I that would mean we'd would be the biggest council left in. Is that good or bad? I would imagine that the implications of that are yet to be determined. Councillor, if the right. implications on us uh, are still yet to be determined. Oh, I see. Thank you. And in this letter, it says here on point um, 13, if I've, oh no, not 13, sorry, 12, the support package is made up of two components, a $2 billion component to invest in the future of local government and community wellbeing. That's over just the whole Takiwa of our South Island? Or is that the whole of New Zealand? It's nationwide. Nationwide, right. So $2 billion is... And out of that, we get 46.172 million, and our assets are worth 2.5 million, is that correct? 2.5 uh, billion, sorry, correct. right. That's correct. Okay, um, so 
what, like a normal spend, like we've done our budgets for the last 10 years for three waters and infrastructure, we've got put probably more than that, the 46 million into our budgets, haven't we? I mean, way more. Yes. Yes, so that, that amount, does that mean that if that's allocated to us, that means even though they've gone on, with the one of the benefits of us joining is that we'll get a lot more work and have a lot more financial backing. But in actual fact, if that's the amount we're getting, we haven't got, that's that's not going to pay anything like what we need, is it? Well, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't need anything under this model because we wouldn't be investing in the network. We're not going to invest in the network now. What? The entire reform program is predicated upon the service delivery aspect of Three Waters being aggregated at a regional scale. So we wouldn't continue to pump money into, well, poor choice of words, sorry, uh, into, into renewals no. of the pipe network because we wouldn't be in charge of that directly. Yes, but so where it says that, so the two billion component, that's just, get, that's giving um, council's money, basically, that's not the money that they're allocating for Three Waters, is it? That's just money to say, well, we'll give you that to compensate for your assets. Is that what it is? They haven't used the word compensation, but yes, that is what it is. Right. Do you think, I suppose it's unfair to ask if you think $46 million is fair for a $2.5 billion you asset? You could have stopped sooner. <laughs> to use the Minister's language, uh, the money being provided that way uh, is to allow local government to lean into its other uh, well-being responsibilities, acknowledging that this isn't something that we would uh, be in charge of any longer. Are there further questions? Councillor O'Malley, then Councillor Elder. It's really what comes next. Um, after these letters are received by government, I'm pretty confident that the message is going to be fairly constant throughout the country, or consistent. And it's sort of to follow up Councillor Wiley's question, but not as directly, and that is, is it intended that the, only the mayors of Otago and Southland are the only voices that come out of this debate, or will we have other voices from the councils? And will the councils be working together at all levels to establish their positions, of po policy positions? That's a big question. I, I would remind councillors, though, that what we're being asked to discuss and debate here is a letter to the Minister in response to the proposal. There, there are all manner of other moving parts in terms of what alternative responses or what, what different approaches might look like. Um, but this is what we're being asked to discuss at this meeting. But the, I mean, the point's well made. Is, are there further questions? Uh, sorry, Councillor Elder, sorry. Oh, it's just actually a clarification, and that is, um, should the government in the Three Waters um, take responsibility for the infrastructure, the debt in our 10-year plan for ins infrastructure will go to the government? Not the roads, probably, but, uh, but, the but three for Three Waters, yes. Councillor Gary. All the information that we have, we've passed on to councillors. We have a broad understanding of yep. what the reform program is, but don't know any more than yourselves. Thank you. Right, Councillor Hulan. Thank you. Um, you may not be able to answer this, and this might highlight what Councillor Gary was asking, is that we don't have enough information, but is, or, or might not have enough information. I don't think we have enough information. Um, is, do you have any concerns around, because obviously when we've just had this vote around George Street, which combines a lot of Three Waters um, infrastructure work, and a lot of our projects do include infrastructure work, um, and also of course building consents, and a lot of those things contain Three Waters, and we're able to do that because we work in-house in all together, and do you have concerns we'll have could have communication issues and delays because it's no longer all in-house and we can't talk directly to the people we need to, and it might be put on a priority list that's long, you know, the South Island long because we're part of the whole of the South Island instead of just in Eden. 
for work, regular work that we need to get done? Uh, it would, we would need to look at a different mode of operating if, if, that was, if this change were to go ahead. Um, I think there's good examples in the past though where um, indeed the Three Waters Group within the Dunedin City Council has been able to work cooperatively with um, other agencies or organisations such as the University of Otago who have done significant renewals work under their landscape improvements and all of that sort of thing in the past. So I don't think it's unattainable uh, or a showstopper, it's just a bit a different way of working. If government know the amount that they think will be needed for infrastructure in years to come to solve the problems that they say you know, are ongoing, and of course there is a cost for Three Waters, nobody's denying that, why don't they just give the councils the money they need and then have someone who's independent sort of maybe watch Council, over these it? aren't questions of staff, they're questions of No, but has anyone the suggested that? I mean, do, you have, do you have questions of staff? Yes, has anyone suggested that? I mean, are, we, are you hearing anyone suggesting that? Because it seems to me that would make sense. I guess we've tried to capture the tenor of your comment in the submission. Yes, thank you. Councillor Lofiso. Tēnā koe, Your Worship. Uh, forgive me, but I'm following up on um, Councillor O'Malley's question in terms of process. And so if the Minister should accept our invitation to come and meet with us kanohi ki te kanohi, that would be the opportunity for all councillors to be able to address her with our concerns? Yeah, that would... Um, the, the parameters of that discussion and the guest list for that meeting would be a question of negotiation with the Minister's office. Uh, I would assume, but it would be my intention for there to be a, as broad a range of input from our elected membership involved as possible. That's, um, we don't always have the luxury of dictating the terms. Uh, I do note that the suggestion around uh, the invitation to the minister uh, is absent from the amended uh, from the recommendations on this paper. Yeah. It's on the, well. It's, it's part. It's part of the letter. And if people are, if people, if that's um, adequate for people, that's fine by me. Um, there are no more questions. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to move the recommendations. Yeah, and I, and I will include that, Senator Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, and, and I will. I would include that as a part. J. Uh, to, to directly invite the Minister uh, to come and discuss the contents of this submission with us. Um, I'd like to thank uh, elected members for their input into this draft, both before and after uh, the last meeting uh, when it was on our agenda, and, uh, and particularly uh, Councillor O'Malley and also um, Mr Drew and Mr Dyer uh, and staff who, who had the unenviable task of knitting together all of those bits of feedback and creating uh, what we have uh, in front of us. I think there's very little disagreement about the problem uh, that we need to solve here. We need three waters infrastructure uh, and service delivery to better look after the health of our people uh, and the health of our environment. Uh, and we also want to provide a stronger role uh, for iwi Māori and decisions that matter to them. And water is pretty high uh, up that list. Uh, which is one of the reasons why this council voted to support the appointment of Runaka representatives uh, onto our planning uh, and infrastructure committees. Uh, it's also true that the performance of uh, local councils in, in the Three Waters space and the infrastructure work sits on a spectrum. Uh, some are doing far better than others and the cost of doing the work required uh, around the motu is certainly uh, eye-watering. Uh, but what is being proposed here for large water service entities taking control of uh, the assets and how they are run uh, would be the single biggest shift in how local government functions and serves its communities uh, in more than 30 years. And I think what is most concerning to me with a decision of such significance is that no real work appears to have been done on what an alternative uh, might look like. Uh, and, and that's extraordinary. And, and thinking of other items we've had on this agenda today, uh, consider the approach that we have to take uh, when it comes to getting funding uh, from Wakotahi for the projects uh, that we want co-investment through the Treasury 
better business case methodology. And we have to identify the problem and run multi-criteria analyses and then run multiple solutions against each other to see which one best solves it. And all of this for a few million dollars out of the National Land Transport Fund. Uh, similarly, when we make decisions uh, under, our, under the Local Government Act, our obligations are to have considered all viable alternatives for achieving the desired outcome. Uh, many of these are trivial uh, in comparison uh, to the water reform program, and yet the rigour required of us uh, sets the bar, uh, has, has been, that bar has been set significantly lower uh, in, in this process, and you, and I, you have to ask why, uh, and, and those points are made uh, clearly uh, at the outset of our, of our feedback. Uh, but what we're being asked to do at this point is provide feedback on the proposed model, uh, or what we know of it so far. Uh, and you know the lack of consideration of alternatives uh, is a point well made in the draft letter. Uh, but that, uh, that said, and that aside, uh, it would be short-sighted of us, I think, not to engage in the proposal that has been presented to us uh, in the event that government, uh, as is their capacity, uh, were to, des to decide to mandate this model. Uh, I think we want to influence its design uh, as best we can uh, through the processes that we have, uh, because burying our heads in the sand uh, on this doesn't seem to be a particularly sensible option. And that is why uh, uh, Local Government New Zealand uh, have been doing the work that they have with the Department of Internal Affairs, uh, and why uh, elected members uh, around the Naitahu Takiwa have been working with Naitahu on a response to the proposal, uh, because in the event that this is what we are landed with, uh, we want the conditions to be as favourable to us as they can be. Uh, I'd like to thank staff for capturing the, the broad range of issues uh, that are touched upon uh, by this legislative uh, reform. And I think the largest, sadly, I think, in the wider public discourse that we're obviously seeing ramping up now, I think the, some of the more critical ones are largely absent. And particularly for me, that is the, the implications for the planning system uh, and how we provide for a growing population and provide for a development in, a, in our city uh, that makes sense for us, uh, as opposed to something that might make sense in the short term uh, for a water services entity in terms of where they might put the pipes in the ground. Uh, we need to be able to continue to make long-term future-focused planning decisions. Uh, and it's still unclear to me, despite the assurances we've had from various um, uh, members of parliament and DIA officials are uh, how we can have the assurance that uh, the water services entities will take their direction uh, from the planning system. Uh, similarly, at a more pragmatic level, uh, you know, who is going to do this work if, if there is vastly more work to be done? Irrelevant, though, because uh, regardless, of the figures, uh, regardless of the figures used, it's hard not to come to the conclusion uh, as various parties have, uh, that the work that needs to get done around the country will be more expensive. Um, but it's important to get the costs right, though, because that's how you can have an informed discussion about uh, how you, and what are your trade-offs. We may all be financially better off uh, under the model that is proposed, but are we prepared uh, to um, suck up the cost of not being financially better off if we manage to retain more of an influence uh, in the system? And that is why uh, nailing the, the figures to a greater degree would be would be helpful. There is finally very active public debate on this, uh, but not all of it has been helpful. Um, I've got no interest uh, in debating the rights or interests of iwi Māori and the governance uh, of water, but plenty of correspondence that I've received uh, in the previous weeks suggest that that seems to be the real sticking point, uh, the real um, mask off issue uh, for, for some people. Um, that the biggest problem isn't the planning system or the cost or the degree of local influence. Uh, it's having um, brown people sitting around uh, the governance table, and I think some of that discourse has been uh, unhelpful for those of us who have genuine concerns about the proposal because it makes it easier to dismiss all of us uh, by lumping all of us uh, into that same uh, dog whistle uh, pack. Um, <laughs> We've got two options, really, when we're dealing with situations like this. We can choose to be combative, uh, as uh, many of our <coughs> elected colleagues around the country have chosen to, or we can choose to be constructive. Uh, and I think that um, the letter here uh, strikes that particularly fine balance, and it is a, it is a balancing act, that tension. Um, I'm not going to die in a ditch, ditch over it, because the word reset is certainly open to interpretation, but I would... I would I would hate for all of the work that has been done, particularly by our own staff, uh, to say nothing of, of bureaucrats in Wellington, uh, is, is dismissed. 
uh, because I think it's been helpful to have the work done that has been done. Uh, what we're asking for is that other work be done on alternative models to be able to justify this as being the solution uh, to our collective problem. Um, but I think, uh, but I think that that point doesn't need to be uh, spelled out uh, in the wording of of this letter. So, uh, thank you to this, the staff for their work on this. It is an incredibly um, difficult policy field to be working in. Uh, it is evolving um, day by day, uh, and I welcome the opportunity uh, for this to be fed into the the, the government's feedback and for hopefully. Uh, the opportunity to be able to discuss uh, its contents with the relevant minister. Further speakers, Councillor Benson Pope. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, hard to add very much to what you've said, but I would like to make a couple of comments. Um, I think you have encapsulated the situation, uh, a very difficult situation in which we find ourselves very well. I think the letter um, sends a number of very clear messages about our discomfort uh, and like I think most of you I think personally that these proposals are ill-conceived. Um, I've always found it ironic that um, had um, the Ministry of Health enforced the regulations which were already in place, Havelock North wouldn't have been a problem, um, but they didn't and it was. Uh, but that notwithstanding, to use the significant problems and public problems and health problems in Havelock North as an excuse for uh, reform proposals of this kind is, gross, is a gross overreaction and uh, totally unacceptable, uh, not just to me but to a lot of members of our community, I think. Um, and like you, and you've flagged this a number of times on previous occasions, uh, one of the issues of major concern to me is the loss of autonomy in terms of this community's make, right to make its own decision about its strategic direction. You know, we spend a lot of time consulting, and we talked earlier about work since 2011, strategic visions and all the rest of it. We're about to do another one with the Regional Council about our development, future development plan and the rest of it. That's going to be hard enough, but to do that sort of work and set priorities on a wider than regional basis would be, I think, near on, nigh on impossible. And the other element of part of all of this that has been occasionally mentioned but not really highlighted, which I think will be of greatest concern to our community, is if these proposals were to proceed, the inevitability of volumetric charging. I mean metres everywhere and bills, water bills everywhere. That's all <clears throat> a contentious issue, uh, and, but we are in a situation different from every, most other cities where, um, fortunately, I think, there has been long-term, very strong residual resistance in this city to domestic water charging, and I think that's appropriate, given our situation. Uh, we do have commercial water charging of course, but I'm not sure too many in the community realise that the, one of the implications of these proposals is just that. Uh, so they need to think about that. That said, uh, I think our direct but moderate response, I don't mean moderate in terms of its content, but moderate in terms of where we are in a process that we're not in control of is entirely appropriate. And I'd like to add my thanks to those members and staff who have put a considerable amount of time into producing this letter, and I'm happy to support it as it stands. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I'd just like to say, um, <clears throat> or like David, I'd like to reinforce my, my uh, appreciation of your comments. I think it was a very, very well put together opening address, and I think um, the way this was uh, at our last meeting, I couldn't have supported it. And with the changes that have been made, I can, and particularly the change about, uh, as I said in paragraph two, um, the case, we, we recognise there's a case for the change in the way three water services are regulated, and there's a huge difference between regulated and owned and looked after. And um, I'm not saying that you couldn't get to a point one day where there was a case for change, but at this stage, there's been no... Um, no justification in my mind. If, if all you're worried about is um, is what's happened in the Hawks or in the Hawks Bay, um, 
that that could have been dealt with and that should have been dealt with a long time ago and um, I think that's a bigger failing of government to deal with the problem that they should have dealt with and um, I, I do realise ongoing that there will be significant costs to councils either way or to ratepayers either way whether we continue to own these assets either way there is going to be an increased cost as, as the cost of doing this work does get dearer but I um, can happily support this the way it is thank you Thank you Councillor Houlihan Thank you. Yes, thank you for your introduction to this. I thought you raised some very good points. Um, and thank you to Councillor O'Malley who added some really good um, points to this letter that were needed. So um, I certainly hope that, that the Minister reads this letter and I certainly hope that the Minister gets the impression that we do not, well, I'm, well I certainly right now do not support things the way they are. Um, so I hope that comes across in this letter and I think it show, hopefully it will show her that we have quite a few concerns. And it was very clear today, again, that there's a lot of questions our staff even don't know the answers to, you know. And I mean, that's not good enough when it's such a huge and significant change. And to the people that are currently inundating our email box with um, emails about, you know, opt out and and say you're against it, say this, say that, or where's our public engagement, why don't you consider sending those emails and letters to the local government minister, not to us? Because councillors all around the country are having this reform put on them. We haven't asked for it as far as I know, and now we're being almost mandated with it. It's not compulsory yet, but it's certainly some comments we made that certainly sound like it could be, and quite frankly, this process all the way along has been, I would call it, a shambles. And I um, certainly could not support anything like what's been going on at the moment. It hasn't been clear. There's been no communication that has been um, clearly understood. The governance structure was, was confusing at best. We had a... Um, a local government New Zealand held a, a webinar where we, quite a few of us from around here, sat in on it, and even the LGNZ people were confused by the structure. And every single um, councillor and mayor that was there voiced concerns about it, including, I won't name him, but a mayor from one of the biggest cities in the country who said it was BS. So this is, you know, it's just not good enough. And there should have been so much more engagement prior to this. So. That's all I've got to say on that. Thank you. Councillor Vanus. I was very pleased to hear Councillor Benson Pope's arguments and showing some of the severe problems associated with what's been proposed, but then disappointed that Councillor Benson Pope agreed that we should just have a moderate response. If you look at the Morrison Low report, page 99, it says the DCC will see the smallest benefits compared to all other Otago Southland councils. Morrison Low also points out that the only way there will be any benefits is if most councils opt in. Christchurch city councillors, in the news reports I have read today, have unanimously spoken against. That means that there is no chance of any positive outcome for this proposal, this essentially infrastructure grab that has been proposed. I believe that we need to protect the Neden and to protect our long investment in three waters, which is now valued at 2.5 billion dollars. Most people I know uh, do not accept that there is a case for changing the way three water services are delivered in New Zealand, certainly not the way they're delivered in Dunedin. Dunedin had previous problems uh, which we still haven't caught up on in terms of deferred maintenance, but significant improvements have been made and we haven't had a decent flood since the avoidable uh, property damage of 2015. Dunedin's response to the recent lead pollution issue has also been rapid 
and all that could possibly have been expected, better than any national centralised body, could have done. I also don't expect, uh, accept the claim that we offer this feedback with acknowledgement that we share common goals with the government. I would like to see this party political subservience just showing up for what it actually is. The government goals are certainly not ours. The stated goals of the government are to take control and effective ownership of our billions of dollars of worth of water supply, wastewater and stormwater infrastructure, built up by previous generations for over 150 years, with the government giving us 46 point something million, hardly a shared common goal. The billions value of our three waters also underpins our reason for our enormous and growing debt. Debt that will sit across a much diminished asset base if we allow the government to use our taxes to take three waters for a mere 47 million. Nor do I share the common goal, nor do we share the common goal of nationally creating an additional 5,800 to 9,300 jobs over 30 years, as forecast with the proposed new service delivery model, a new massive centralised bureaucracy, which to me contradicts the Mahuta claims for three waters efficiency gains. Any efficiency gains will come at the cost, I believe, of local contractors and consultants, a plus for Wellington, but a big minus for us in Dunedin. The Mahuta proposed Three Waters government takeover and co-governance with Iwi is the biggest infrastructure change in New Zealand Board history. Of order. Since... Uh, point of order, Councillor Gary. Um, I'm finding that the language that uh, Councillor Vandivis is using is extremely disrespectful towards the Minister in the way that he is uh, calling him. I'll uphold it insofar as uh, I think referring to people by their proper titles is uh, as to be would be expected behaviour in this forum, Councillor. The MP Mahuta proposed three uh, water no, government. Does that I, no, help? She's, she's the, the Minister for Local Government uh, and has been brought to your attention. You could refer to the Minister as the Minister for Local I'll Government. I'll just move on then, Minister shall Mahuta. I? Welcome. The national grid reason for centralised New Zealand controlling electricity doesn't exist for three waters because all of our water systems are regional anyway. There is no grid that makes centralising it any sense. We've got one minute. We do not need more details or more time for a pause. We need to protect Dunedin's major asset. To drop this government takeover of our major infrastructure, three water investment, and to keep the financial and operational security we currently enjoy with our own three waters. The claim that there needs to be a stronger role for iwi in Maori in our three waters infrastructure makes no sense to me at all. Um, the idea that we can uh, choose to be combative and that we are instead choosing to be moderate, I believe we should now, like Christchurch, be combative and say, no, we know enough already to know that none of this is in Dunedin's interests. That's your time, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, my view is that uh, the letter has landed in a, in a fairly reasonable place. I preferred the original style um, because it was a little less combative, but I do believe this letter is still very constructive in its approach and also very firm and clear uh, and strikes the balance about the variety of, of those um, views around the table. Um, what is disappointing to me is the information gap that has been left by the government, and I think that's been well uh, written up in the letter, uh, which has provided an opportunity for a considerable amount of misinformation. And you will have all got the letters and, and seen the kinds of things that our community um, think is happening uh, around the cost to households uh, under a form uh, and we still aren't clear on that, um, but it's not as people think. Uh, and um, around 
uh, the possibility of status quo being an option, which it isn't, and the belief that we can organise a referendum, which I don't believe we can. I believe that's a central government matter. So these are all terribly unhelpful and that we're making a decision now which we're not. Um, and I do find it particularly troubling, um, the divisiveness that it has resulted in, particularly uh, the racism, the just pure racism that has occurred. I found that particularly troubling. Um, I've also noted the disconnect between uh, central government and, and local government, particularly what an example of that is, and I wonder to myself if um, Minister Mahuta uh, knows that uh, her government are basically um, attracting some of our expertise in councils, which we need so much right now, by offering much higher salaries. And I find that extraordinary, uh, really. Uh, at this time, when our people are so important to us. Um, what has been, the people that have been left out of this proposal, and I appreciate the staff's inclusion uh, of this concern uh, in the letter, uh, are the majority of 12% of our city residents who are domestic self-suppliers. And the proposal was very ambiguous around this, talking about all New Zealanders having access to safe uh, water, etc., when in fact um, there is no intention of including uh, domestic self suppliers. So, my thanks to the staff for the eloquent way that they articulated that. Um, for many of our community who are in the priority list around the public private stormwater issues that we have in our city and are waiting for their particular turn for their issue to be addressed. This is a very worrying time because of the issue around local influence. Um, so I do believe the letter has landed in the right place uh, on the whole uh, and I do believe um, the genuine uh, invitation to Minister Mahuta to come uh, and kōrero with us to get a full understanding of our concerns is the right way to go. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. I'll keep mine pretty short and sweet in the sense that um, I'm happy with the content of this uh, letter. I think it really did bring together uh, some really strong points. Um, and my thanks also go to Councillor O'Malley, Mr Dwyer and Mr Drew. Uh, the part that really, uh, for me, was a bit of a touchstone was um, paragraph 9, where it talks about the overlap of Three Waters Reform Programme with the reform of the resource management system and the future for local government review. And all I can say is, for me, if they're dealing this and they're taking this approach with Three Waters Reform, you know, God, we better be careful with what's going to happen with resource management. And then on top of that, future for local government review, I guess they'll be down to four councils in the country instead of the 67. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I support the letter and I support the tone in which the letter has been written. I think if we had had a letter which was combative, then it will, will have less impact so putting a letter together that states it clearly, states our position clearly, is more likely to be taken note of. I personally have significant concerns to be given the, the indication that we would have an input into how this thing would be when there is only one proposal on which we can have input is very, very concerning. The fact that our own and other councils work undertaken by consultants to, to look at the numbers that are being proposed has such a gap between what the government in their uh, paperwork are saying it's going to cost versus what we as a city and other cities have done the same thing believe it's going to cost has to be explained. And to be in a situation where a government is using television to tell a story which is hardly true to our residents, indicating that we are serving up bad water, and even though it was modified back to saying we are working with councils, is just not acceptable. Every person I talk to 
And all of the emails that pour in to me are telling me, don't do it. Now that, regardless of whether this is good or bad in the end, it's pretty clear from that that people in our community do not believe what is being said and do not wish to proceed with the option of going to four large water companies. I think there has to be a step backwards. There has to be the, a correct amount of time to consult properly. As has been pointed out by the Mayor, this is the biggest decision that councils will have made in terms of local government for over 30 years. And to rush it and to leave large gaps between each other's position in terms of costs and outcomes just means it's unacceptable. I've been a director on plenty of boards. If this proposal came to me as a governor on a board, I'd vote against it. I certainly wouldn't take it. It has, it has to have logical sense and believable data in order to convince me that this is the right thing to do. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I support this letter of feedback to the government. I believe we strongly need to ask for re or co-design and actually looking at other models and methods rather than just giving feedback on this one predetermined model. The leisure points have been well covered, so I'm going to be more general. We all want the same thing, safe drinking water for everyone, care for the environment, rivers and lakes we can swim in, careful disposal of waste and stormwater, fit for purpose pipes in the ground to allow for our communities to be serviced and in places where our community wants to grow, want to grow, to have place making abilities for our people. Plus especially, and this is key, local decision making for things that affect our local community's well-being. Water is a precious treasure which allows our lives to thrive. Having grown up in the countryside, not on town water, I still think it's a bit of a miracle when I turn the tap on in town and safe drinking water streams out. Equitable access to safe drinking water wherever someone goes in New Zealand should be a must. Environmentally sustainable disposal of waste and stormwater is a must as well. Everyone agrees with that. For me, a key issue around the water reform is that the new drinking water standards are yet to be set as the Water Services Bill has yet to be passed, the entity set up and new standards set. Dunedin City has 100% compliance with drinking water standards and the latest government stats online. So how on earth can we make any decisions on whether we should join or not when we don't know the goals we are setting out to achieve? We're hearing, we're going to make some tough new rules and you're not going to be able to afford to meet them. But how do we know that when we, how do we know that when we don't know what the rules are and what targets are being set? This is a terrible example of building the cart before gestating the horse, the mule, the dogs, or whatever size animal is going to be needed to pull the cart because we don't know how heavy the load is going to be. In the piles of information we've ploughed through, there's a huge amount of graphs, numbers and assumptions made about centralised models versus local councils. However, the basic goal is missing. So what are we trying to achieve? What does safe drinking water and safe water disposal look like? How can we decide which model is better if we as council can't model our own future water systems properly as we have little information on what we are trying to achieve? Better water is a nebulous goal. The timing and the phasing of the information does not help good decision making. Local decision making. When we swore our oaths of office, we swore to work for the best well-beings of our community. And I honestly cannot discharge this by letting the government push an incredibly fast and uninformed timeline, which is what this is feeling like. It seems like government bureaucrats have designed an incredibly complicated, clumsy system that they say will ensure water assets are saved, money, save, money is saved through efficiencies, and water service improves. As Per Councillor Staines, my jaw dropped when I saw the ads the government had put on TV, which showed taps running with muddy water, grotesque cartoon-like figures, and inane messaging and inferring that councils were doing a terrible job delivering safe drinking water. The campaign has been described as infantile, denigrating, and I believe shows a lack of regard and true partnership and commitment to working together for positive outcomes. The one answer model DIA and the government are pushing is one where inevitably the de-entity centralised model will end up running out of Christchurch. Our 20 councils will have six, 
I think it's 21 actually, will have six representatives who will have very small influence on decision making processes. We've seen in close up detail how our CCOs work with our arm's length ownership. All centralisation in Christchurch allow pipes to be built in Broad Bay. I had experience with getting an ambulance to a place on High Cliff Road via a Christchurch call centre. They sent them on the longest route and it always troubles me about whether that lady's life could have been saved. Recently we voted to include mana whenua on key committees, infrastructure and planning. One this minute, is like... <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can do this in 60 seconds. This is localism working at its best when we who know our local area and serve our community can work together on placemaking and consult directly with our community. For our communities, localism is workable, centralisation is clumsy. I'll finish with this thought. I'm also totally sick of central government politicians going on about lead in the water. When our monitoring has proven Dunedin is not delivering lead laden water to its residents, how can we trust them to make decisions for us when they can't even be bothered to get this fact correct and are using it against us to push these reforms through? Thank you, Councillor Raddick. Yes, I'm uh, completely opposed to giving away $2.5 billion worth of asset for 2% of their value. And I also don't see any connection between the water of Invercargill, Christchurch, Waitaki region and Dunedin, because water doesn't go from one place to another. Therefore, there's no need to have a central control over water. There's no extra added value there. A central purchasing mechanism so that there is uh, consistency of pipe sizes and specifications, a central uh, regulator, Tamata Arawai, is being formed and that is a critical, important new development and Mana and I have a strong role in that and that should uh, be enough to satisfy their control over water to make sure that the standards are raised throughout the country and similarly at the other end Dunedin is doing a good job of uh, three waters and as has been pointed out, we uh, provide good, clean drinking water of a very high standard, and we have been doing so for quite some time. And we also have mana whenua input into what goes on on the ground. And I think that is enough. Uh, the letter it, uh, covered, carries that message that we support the regulator and we have issues with everything else. And we've been asked for feedback. That's all we need to do, and it's all we ought to do at this stage. So I support the letter. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, I want to, before I start, thank my fellow councillors for helping me um, with the work I did towards the changes to this letter. I put in 29 changes. Councillor Lord gave me one to put in as well, which I see he's glad to see it got in there. And Councillor Radich's one around um, the ability to control your three waters in terms of civil defence response. And that has made this letter, I think, much stronger than it was before. I wouldn't use the word combative at all. I would, I would say this letter is now assertive. And I think that we've, we failed the first time around to be assertive enough. I'm not going to go much further into it. I feel that what we're facing here is a response that started out with the Havelock North crisis and to some extent has gone on in a way that developed a certain size and direction without much consultation to the communities around it, created a statement of um, crisis that was not tested in the councils to ask them whether or not in fact they felt that crisis. And I feel that to some extent I'm disappointed at the role that LGNZ has played here with the heads of agreement and I feel that they have taken on a role of instead of acting as our representatives to government in what is a difficult environment of, of backwards and forwards, they have acted instead as the agents of government and went forward with supporting and accepting the four water entities as the starting point. And I think that it's important that we put reset in this letter because I, we all agree there is not a single person I have met in this whole debate up and down the country. And I, I want to also acknowledge here Pauline Cotter, the Head of Infrastructure at Christchurch City Council, and Ian Pottinger, the Head of Infrastructure at Invercargill City Council, because they've helped me clarify some of my thoughts. And, and I, it has been actually very enjoyable being able to talk to people from other councils and get these senses of where they are. I think when this started out, I felt that I was actually almost a lone voice against the four water entities. In fact, I very much felt I was, but 
But as we've got forward, we've got a better understanding of what these things are and what threats and potentially what benefits they might offer. I believe we can achieve the benefits that are offered in these entities through very different structures. And so we've said so in our letter that other, other models have to be considered, including models of funding. We've agreed that better service delivery is part, is, is ideal, is wanted, but not in every council. Some councils are already meeting their delivery standards and other councils are miles away from it. We need to, again, have a clear understanding of who needs what and how are we going to achieve that. Yes, these are eye-watering numbers, but they're 30 to 40 years' worth of eye-watering numbers. You've got to take that number and divide it by 30 or 40 to see what the annual is, and then they aren't all that far away from some of the numbers we're spending now. Um, I also would like to re-extend or re-ask, there was a Naitahu invitation for them to come and talk to us about their position and I want that to happen. I really, I don't want anybody to say, well I'm talking and therefore it doesn't matter. I, I would like us all to be able to talk to the people that Naitahu would want to send to us to talk to about how we go forward and what partnership looks like. And. I feel that when these letters are all received by the government, it's going to pretty much say the same thing. No one's opting in or opting out, but I don't think there's any letter going in there saying that they are enthusiastic about what is coming towards us, which effectively means, by default, all the councils around the country are saying that if they come push or shove, they will opt out. So what will the government do upon receiving that? I think we are only at the start of this interaction. And that's why I asked what will our roles be as councillors and as mayors and as, as collective and what minute, we do counselor. next. Thank you. I, I um, would also suggest that because this is actually a government initiative, that you contact your local MPs and ask them their position. This has been a debate about where the councils are going, what the councils are doing, but in fact the control of this sits with the current Labor government. So if you have a local Labor MP I would like you to go and ask them, what is your position? That needs to be clarified because if I'm feeling what am I really responding to here, I remember the Roger Douglas years. And I feel that this is just a variant of that, another one of those. And I'm saying that we must actually fight it, get to a position of genuine agreement of how to move forward and then move forward. It must be collective and it must be respectful. And I don't think that we've been given the respect that we deserve. Councillor Elder. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, I agree with this letter completely. And one of the um, really things that concerned me right from the start and why I really strongly recommend the reset of this is because, in fact, we were given only one option. It became very clear right early on that they, they were that central government we're moving towards one option. Whereas when we are compelled to engage with, with our community about anything, we're meant to have options. And so we haven't had any um, other models suggested, um, any other choices su suggested, any other ways of doing this, maybe through local government or a, a number of different options for funding, different options, how regulation and funding can work together, we have not had that. And that has always been a concern for me that we have not had that debate. And that debate has to start right at the start before we come to options. And that's what we do around this table. The other thing that's really concerned me right from the start is distant decision making is not always effective decision making. There are local issues and local concerns that are better known in local communities. And so I, I believe that, in fact, that model has, has some flaws. And in fact, distant decision making isn't always the best option. And so we need to look at how that decision making process works and how local influence and local choice works. We all want better water, we all want better drinking water, we all want better stormwater systems. We know we need to do these things, but um, they have, I f believe central government has to step back 
and reset and give us choices and options and then come back and work through that cooperatively with local government. Councillor Lofiso. Uh, tēnā ko, Your Worship. I would just like to tell, take this opportunity to record my thanks to you for your opening um, statements and in support of this motion and uh, record my thanks to staff and colleagues who have fashioned this letter. Um, in speaking in support of the motion, I remember being at Waitangi in 2018 and Prime Minister Ardern was very sincere about her, um, her wanting to mend relationships with tangata whenua or Aotearoa across the whole motu. And I remember thinking very cynically, um, well, that's all very well, Prime Minister, but your ministers and your officials won't necessarily let that happen in the ways that it needs to happen. And by the same token, I accept um, Minister Mahuta when she says she's... What's been... Of course, Havelock North kicked off her work on this, and she said at that meeting in the municipal chambers that she was been, has been working on this issue for four and a half years, and I accept that the goal is to uphold te mana o te wai. So I just want to uh, record my thanks particularly to Councillor O'Malley for challenging um, the DIA people at Gore, were we? I can't remember where we were, but uh, challenging them about te mana o te wai because it became very clear to me that, again, while the minister, maybe it's naive of me to say I accept that that's what the minister wants to do, is to have... Um, ways that we really genuinely uphold te mana o te wai. I don't think her officials, whomever, are going to be able to, they're not culturally competent or able to do that, in my opinion. So I just want to um, thank everyone for their whakaro, their thoughts on this, and yes, like uh, Councillor Raddick says, what we have to do today is thing the letter, and we're responding really on the regulating the regulatory stuff, the delivery, that's another battle. But kia kaha to us all. Further speakers? Uh, in response, um, a few things have been suggested. It's been suggested that people have spoken in support of the government's reform objectives in terms of how the water services entities uh, might function and, and how governance and ownership of those assets might function. I don't recall anybody uh, saying that. Uh, the shared objectives certainly that I referred to were having better public health and environmental outcomes as a result of improved uh, water infrastructure uh, and, uh, and a, a greater role for, for iwi Māori in terms of, of governance. Those are objectives uh, of this government uh, and certainly also objectives uh, of this council. It's been suggested that uh, others uh, have said that the response uh, is appropriately moderate. Again, I don't think anybody has said that. Uh, the, the conversation has been around the tone of the letter and how our very real and very direct concerns uh, are articulated uh, to government. And I think uh, taking, in general, taking a constructive rather than a combative approach is a more effective strategy uh, if you're looking to uh, persuade people. Uh, I do have to respond to Councillor Vanavis's point around the fact that, and it's great to have the vote of confidence that the councillor has in, in the performance of our uh, Three Waters Network, but the suggestion uh, that we haven't had a decent flood since 2015, uh, inferring that that is a result of said upgrades when the councillor well knows that the primary cause of flooding in 2015 was too much rain uh, in too short a period of point time. Point of order. That is absolutely not the case. My clear understanding of most of the damage caused by the 2015 <laughs> flood was lack of maintenance, pumps that failed, the Tahuna pump not being switched on, and mud tanks blocked all over the show. Sorry, what was the point of order, Councillor? The point of order is that you misrepresented what I uh, supposedly understood to be the cause of the flooding damage. The flooding damage was caused, in my view, in those days by deferred maintenance. The We've had plenty of rain events the, since. The words I use were primary cause, but I'll leave it to others to decide. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to adjourn. Uh, could I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Benson-Pope. All those in favour?
Right. Those against? Thank you. We'll just take a very short adjournment. I'm not going to uphold the point of order because it's a different interpretation of uh, what the situation was. So we'll continue and I'll hand back over to Your Worship. Thank you. Um, it's also the, the question or the role of, of iwi Māori in the water services system has also been questioned and I think the reason why is pretty clear. It's, it's an expression uh, by the Crown of um, making good on their commitments uh, to, under the Treaty of Waitangi um, which uh, haven't, been, haven't permeated extensively through the public sector up until this point uh, as Councillor Lofiso uh, has, has alluded to and I would remind um, uh, councillors, I think there's a salient point in the Waitangi Tribunal's report on national freshwater and geothermal resources claim where it says whether the tribunal found that local government and government must involve iwi and hapu in the management of freshwater and freshwater ecosystems and reflect tangata whenua values and interests in the management of and decision making regarding freshwater and freshwater ecosystems. And I, 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 um, I acknowledge that that is not exactly the the, the topic that we have at hand, but it is certainly uh, um, the direction that the, the tribunal's decisions uh, and the decisions of government are heading, and I don't see why this would be, uh, would be any different. Uh, it's worth, because the, the government's um, advertising efforts have been raised, that's probably also worth uh, commenting on. We were promised uh, an educational effort uh, from the government. Uh, and what we've had uh, is the most extraordinary piece of political advertising since the Dancing Cossacks. And I think it's cute now for the Department of Internal Affairs to tell us that, oh no, this isn't how we're trying to depict the current state, it's a warning against what the future state uh, of water services delivery might be if we don't do uh, something about it. And I think, um, but local government's hands aren't clean in this. Uh, the vacuum that has been left by government to a large degree in terms of information uh, has been filled by uh, many um, members of our wider elected uh, local government family uh, taking very unhelpful uh, positions uh, and raising um, their concerns in a reasonably uh, unhelpful way as I've already as I've already touched on. Um, <laughs> you have to think that the government have misread the room on a reasonably substantial scale uh, in terms of the feedback um, that, that we are all getting and, and that local body politicians are getting up and down the country uh, in response to the proposal because the alternative is that they knew uh, what the response would be and wanted us to carry the can uh, for making that decision on their behalf and it couldn't possibly be that. Uh, and I will take the vote by division. Thank you. Uh, it's, on the, it's on the papers with the addition of the invitation to the local government minister. It's, it's, it's not readable, but it is up there. But it's on, Sorry, your, it's it's on your agenda, big... councillor. Yeah. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Councillor Lafiso. Councillor Lord. Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Raddick. Councillor Staines. Councillor Vandervis. Councillor Walker. Councillor Wiley. Your Worship. Carried 14-1.
they should be on their own. They might have had there is no dinner time as such. We'll see where this next discussion takes us, shall we? Councillors, but as staff are arriving, if I could just uh, point out a, an error um, on page 225 of your agenda of item 15. The first recommendation has some additional words that need to be removed, so it should say decides to prioritise. So the words, a wait list criteria that will be used, should be deleted. That's an editing oversight, and so we'll just get rid of those. L yeah, Lynn will put the right one up. Do you want it up now? Yes. So that's the correct version of the resolution. Apologies, that was just slipped through in editing. It, um, the recommendations mirror the staff's recommended option, which is option one. Yes, apologies for that, councillors. Sorry, Your Worship. Quite all right, thank you. I, I have a question uh, of interpretation of the grammar and structure as well. Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is the intention of staff to recommend uh, that the priority list should be people aged 55 years and over with limited assets and income and those with urgent and or physical. Uh, what is the, is the, is the so intention of the age to overarching and from, with, from within that demographic cohort, people with either limited means and or accessibility issues? So at the moment, um, Your Worship, the, the uh, prioritisation as it stands at the moment in the two, 1997 housing prior, uh, policy are people aged 55 years and over with limited assets and income. And uh, so we're proposing um, under the resolution to include uh, those in urgent housing need and physical accessibility needs in that prioritisation as well. So apologies if that's not clear. And the intention of that would be people with said needs of any age? Yeah. Uh, yes. OK. Yes. I'll defer. I think a semicolon sorry, after income is probably clear. helpful. Um, that's, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, questions? Councillor Raddick. So should the and be better read as or? No, I, I think it can be solved by putting a, a semicolon after income. Yeah, semicolon. Semicolons are highly debatable. <laughs> <laughs> Everything today has been highly debatable. It's two, just to make the point that it's two distinct groups. Yes. It may overlap, but also may not. Yes, Further questions? Councillor Elder. Sorry, can you? Uh, in the motion. It's quite. Oh, for God's sake. I, I, don't, I don't care, but as long as people are aware that we're talking about two different groups that may overlap but also may not. Do people have any substantive questions of staff on the report? Councillor Walker. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Your Worship, and thank you for the, the report. Um, my question is around the fact, obviously, during the 10-year ten, uh, ten plan submission process, we did go out and ask about the 65 or over. Um, is it, am I correct in reading this? In, in essence, already, we have a de facto favourable view of 65 and over, simply because of the fact that they, they make up the vast majority currently of our, of our, of our residents. That's why I'm reading it. So even if, it's, yeah. So by keeping it 55, we're still favouring, in essence, 65-year-olds plus anyway, because they make up the bulk of the residents. Mm, that's really hard to answer. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that information is kept at that level, is it? Can I? You can try. I can give it a go. <laughs> um, 
the fact that the percentage is over 65 would be a coincidence or perhaps connected to demand, but when people are allocated onto the wait list, they're in order of their application. So it's how long they've been on the wait list will take them to the top of the wait list if they meet those basic income, asset and age criteria. Uh, apologies, Councillor Lord. Apology accepted. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, no, look, I just had a question in the background information on the first page, item five. It says the income limit is aligned to the work and incomes accommodation supplement, currently 44,200. The asset limit is set at 50% at of the Needham's median house price, currently 310,000. Um, I just would like to think that if you had $310,000, you wouldn't probably need to be in a council flat. And, I would assume that most of our, like we wouldn't have too many people in our flats with that sort of money in their asset column, would we? I couldn't answer that, I'm afraid. They're only asked whether they meet that criteria on application, not how much dollars they have in the bank. So, so actually that's almost, un, it's not even relative because you're not. Part of what we will do would, as this policy is developed is make sure that we have slightly better processes for how we assess um, folk who get onto the wait list, because while that is there at the moment, I don't think we have been actively assessing whether or not people um, meet that criteria. We've been allowing them to, as I understand it, say yes or no, self-identify, and then not rigorously checking. I think that given where we're at, we might need to um, come up with clear criteria and then make sure that we um, follow them a little bit more um, rigorously. I, I guess probably uh, trying to phrase it a different way, my concern would be that um, someone might three, ha have that, you could have $309,000 in assets and still qualify for a flat and, and that if your income was relatively low and, and I just find that quite a um, low bar really. Will those thresholds be part of the discussion when the community housing policy comes back to council? Yes. yes. Thank you. Councillor Lofiso. Uh, your Worship. Uh, um, thank you both. Um, my question sort of follows on from Councillor Lords and it relates to paragraph uh, 12 about the, the 54 submissions that talked about that didn't define need. In retrospect, in our consultation, should we have, I don't know, maybe a lesson to learn for the future, should we have defined, um, asked submitters to define need? I don't know. That, that's a hard one to answer. Um, but I think what we've got is some really useful feedback as part of those submissions that have helped us get to this stage. The other thing I'd add to that is that the, the constraints of the audit process are, make it pretty prescriptive as to how we which questions get asked in the 10-year plan document and how they get asked and those sorts of things. Further questions? Would someone like to move the recommendations or otherwise? Move Councillor Benson Pope, seconded Councillor Gary. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Are there further speakers? No. I just want to um, comment briefly on, and this is an interesting discussion and, and, and where it, when it first landed on our table as part of the draft budget setting process it seemed to me that given the composition of the waitlist and um, the, the, the length of the waitlist uh, uh, that lifting the, uh, the age would seem a commensurate response um, but I'm, um, I'm, I welcome the feedback that we've given from staff and the reminder that we've been given from staff uh, to recognise uh, the inherent inequities of universalism uh, and the, acknowledging that different communities have different life expectancies and arbitrarily lifting our, our age of, of priority to 65 um, would disproportionately disadvantage um, people uh, in our community. And, and so thank you for the reminder uh, of, of my inherent biases uh, and, and I welcome the position that we've, that we've got to. It's, it seems extraordinary to me that our second priority group is people over 55 with money uh, and not people under 55 without money uh, and, and that isn't something that we're being asked to 
uh, decide on today, but we'll, um, we'll get a steer from, from staff when the community housing policy comes back to us uh, for more uh, detailed discussion. Further speakers, Councillor Reddick. Just a very short comment. I think um, in order to make uh, accurate sense of this option one recommended option, we remove that comma as Councillor Elder suggested after the over and, and have your semicolon after income inserted. Thank you. That's all. Otherwise, I support the motion. Moving that as an amendment, Councillor. Move that as a minor amendment, yes, please. Is that all right? No, I just think it makes better sense. That's all. That's enough. There are further speakers. Think Councillor, it, Councillor Elder. Yeah. <laughs> well, I suggested taking the comma out. I just think it reads better. That's all. Your right of reply, Councillor. Mm -hmm. We'll vote on the amendment. All those in favour? <laughs> those against? That's agreed. Further speakers. Councillor Elder. Um, I'm just really pleased to see that um, included in this is the uh, physical accessible housing need and I note that all our new housing will be very accessible and it is a huge need in our community um, which needs to be met so I'm really pleased about that. Um, very briefly, I'm pleased to hear the comment that the Chief Executive has made about the, the sensitive issue of um, whatever declarations are in place in respect of assets. Um, I I'm historically have been made aware of quest questions about that matter, um, and I think we do need to have a more transparent process, especially given the pressure on this resource and, um, and our intent to actually enlarge it. So it's important that it's not, shall we say, gamed. Thank you. I will put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That is agreed. Thank you. Item 18. Proposed event road closures for October to November 2021, a dose of optimism. Ms Benson? It's been moved and seconded, that's fine. Please take a seat, one doesn't like to presume. Oh, I don't know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that yet. Um, can you promise to make Counsel those people come, Janine? Councillor Elder, your question. <laughs> My question has been asked. Can you guarantee? Can you help with getting those people to come? It would be lovely, lovely to have those cl road closures. Um, should people come? Are there any questions of staff? No. It's been moved by Councillor Van. It's seconded by Councillor Lord. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Uh, would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Further speakers? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against, that is agreed. 19, it's a notice of motion. It's been moved. <laughs> it's been moved, thank you. <laughs> Cute though. Uh, seconded by Councillor Vanders, that's fine. Um, and I, I won't uh, speak extensively to this, um, but it, it, seemed, it seemed to me that given the, the nature of the meeting that we had to to discuss Council's role in the future of the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame, uh, which has been well traversed. Um, it would be helpful to have the opportunity uh, for councillors to effectively make many of the comments, or certainly I will, that were made in that meeting uh, in a public forum uh, and to have uh, Council's desire for the for the facility in some shape or form to remain uh, here in Dunedin uh, as, a, as a matter of public record, as a resolution uh, of council. And so that's uh, really all this sets out to do, uh, that, that council supports this facility remaining uh, in the city, that we will actively work with uh, the trust uh, to support their applications for funding uh, to other public or private uh, providers. Uh, that should any community-led organisation leading the, the redevelopment or reimagining of that facility um, coalesce around it, that we will provide the appropriate 
uh, and adequate support and input into that as we would uh, with any significant uh, investment proposal or, or, or feature attraction that was looking to get off the ground uh, here in the city. Uh, and that uh, D, that uh, we will consider uh, any future funding requirements through the relevant uh, annual plan or long-term plan process uh, alongside uh, all of the other calls on the public purse. Uh, and, uh, and, and certainly, uh, I mean, I have uh, discussed this uh, with representatives from uh, the Edgar family, and they are, enti they are uh, entirely comfortable with this direction uh, and see it as a real uh, positive a move from the city to, to put a stake in the ground uh, this way. Uh, you will have seen, obviously, that, that part of uh, Sir Ian Edgar's uh, bequest has been brought forward to support the ongoing operating costs of the, uh, of the uh, current facility in the meantime, and, and I understand that uh, further money has been raised privately to support that uh, institution, uh, and, and that, is, uh, that is something that we should all be uh, grateful for the, the, the role of philanthropy in, in supporting this, um, which isn't to say that uh, council doesn't see a role uh, for itself in, in supporting it. We currently do in its, in its existing iteration uh, and certainly don't see why we wouldn't uh, entertain a discussion with our community as to their appetite for us supporting any future, uh, uh, future uh, redesign or, or, uh, or revitalisation as has been discussed uh, in the public domain. Uh, often in recent times. Uh, Councillor Reddick. Yes, a question. Uh, is the money that the Trust has in hand from the Edgar bequest and fundraising, is that enough to get them through to uh, the, uh, such time as possibly some money from Council through the annual plan process could be delivered to them? Better raise. I'm happy for you to raise questions uh, in, in speaking to the resolution, and I can respond to them uh, in well, the that, well, reply. I thought, that, that was, I thought that was a question. Yeah. Is yeah you, you can raise questions in speaking to the resolution, uh, and in, in my right of reply, I'll reply. It's, been, it's already been moved, and there are no staff to ask questions mm. of. Hey, do, would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Don't have to. I'm just asking. Well, I'd, I'd like to see that. Um, I think this is a good move, and I'd like to see that the um, the Hall of Fame does have enough money to get them through. So, that, because I think uh, the fundraising to uh, actually produce the, the significant reimagining of the entity will be quite substantial and take quite some time. Uh, so, therefore, I think uh, it'd be really helpful if council could support them. Um, as well as, you know, in conjunction with the fundraising that they've made. And uh, that was my question, really, to explore what options we have uh, to make sure that they don't fall short before any uh, annual plan funding comes available and to ask what mechanisms do we have available. So, Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Barker and Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. Um, just let me find my place. Um, I support this motion. Supporting the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame has been a, a long process and I certainly want to keep the heritage alive in Dunedin. And as I've said previously, luckily I had a speech up my sleeve, um, heritage is Dunedin's superpower, one that we need to preserve, protect and enhance. The, um, New Ze I'm on record as saying the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame is an integral part of our living heritage and part of the fabric of our history and visitor offering um, a heritage attraction and currently a heritage site. Sometimes I think we've lost our way in understanding the huge benefit that our unique heritage attractions bring to the city. And sometimes it takes the wake up call, like the fear of losing the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame to make us start to open our eyes again. So I welcome the, um, the resolutions here. Um, I did talk previously about the five key reasons to um, support the Sports Hall of Fame, which is our connection to our national sporting heritage. We asked to host this 21 years ago. Uh, we've nurtured many sporting heroes, and it seems natural as the heritage city that we hold on to those important relationships. Um, to protect our, our visitor and community assets, we've lost Cabri World. It's almost finally now. Fortune Theatre and the train is challenging, and these were real heritage attractions in the, um, as is the Sports Hall of Fame. And during our meeting the other week, I did also ask about some of the work that Enterprise Dunedin was doing 
through the STAP funding that the government had provided on product development and the destination plan that I really feel um, would help us make some decisions about what we are going to fund in the city. Um, I know that our absolute key strength is heritage, the wildlife and heritage capital in New Zealand, got to get that in. Um, and also about our economic development potential. It has been said that the Sports Hall of Fame doesn't host that many visitors, but for every dollar spent on visiting attractions, another nine dollars is spent on accommodation, travel, retail and hospitality. Uh, the attractions are the sizzle that enables the, um, the sausage, and Dunedin needs to keep its suite of attractions to build more compelling reasons for people to stay longer and spend more. Uh, also to inspire and educate our people, uh, the Sports Hall of Fame is aspirational for people to visit and think about that one day they could be those people that, that um, have those success. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, look, I'd just like to say that um, I, I didn't plan to speak to anything on this today, but I just think one of the outcomes of the last meeting, in fact it was in non-public, and that people went out from that meeting and spoke to the media and spoke to Ian Taylor, Sir Ian Taylor and others. I just think uh, that the fact, the one thing that was missed in the entire um, different representation that different councillors was that we were, the first part of Councillor Bandivis's motion last time was that we not express interest in the expressions of interest that was called for by the sport Sports Hall of Fame, and I think there was 14 people in the meeting, and it was a unanimous decision by those 14 people that we would not do that. And I was just appalled at some of the grandstanding that went on over the the sum of $100,000 afterwards. So yeah, just um, I'm, I'm glad to support this as well. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Well, thank you, Worship. Uh, I simply wanted to uh, acknowledge the uh, work of staff behind the scenes. Uh, to the point of the last meeting and since, uh, a point that wasn't necessarily acknowledged or understood in the community, um, with the family through the trust. And I, the other thing I wanted to say and note is to thank Your Worship for his leadership uh, from the last meeting to this to put this motion forward because I believe that this is a motion that we can all support. Thank you, Councillor Vanivis. I particularly like um, C of the motion where it talks about um, appropriate representation on any community-led steering group charged with planning its redevelopment and or relocation. For me, the real value in the Sports Hall of Fame, apart from what Ron Polanski has done in gathering so many sports treasures together, and having the mana to be able to keep them as loan items as long as they're displayed publicly, to me, that is a good foundation on which to redevelop a truly viable, seriously interactive and modern Sports Hall of Fame Museum. If I think about reasons to go to Invercargill, uh, there are only two of them. Well, three counting, that's where the mayor came from. Um, uh, and, 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 uh, and they are the motorcycle museum and the um, truck museum down there. Uh, what those museums have done in terms of create uh, a reason to go, educate people about our automotive history, um, entertain people that have been there, even people that haven't seen Goodbye Pork Pie will love to see the mini and the crash and the bits and pieces that they've got down there. Uh, and those are great um, uh, attractions, but again, not interactive enough, I believe, to really compete on an international scale. We in Dunedin are lucky to have not just all the heritage items for the Sports Hall of Fame, not just Sir Ian Edgar wanting to give some spark funding to kick the thing off, but a whole lot of people that want to get in behind making it something truly exceptional, something that recognises the potential for extraordinary experiences that can be had in a museum, and the role of Sir Ian Taylor in that. 
I think, is absolutely vital. Animation research brings together all the delights of video gaming, all the interest in many different kinds of sports, everything from yachting to motor racing to you name it. Um, he's basically done it. And we have all that potential here in this city to create uniquely the best redeveloped possible sports museum in the country. If it's not done here, I'm sure it'll go to Christchurch because they are keen. But this here, this notice of motion, gives an indication that we are keen and that we recognise that we have all the ingredients to do something truly superb here. And I really look forward to uh, a community-led steering group coming forward and bringing all those things together that Dunedin already has by way of the necessary building blocks for an international standard attraction. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Your Worship, um, I'll be happy to support this and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear from His Worship's um, introduction to this that there is bridging finance money available to take this through to the point of Part D, which I'm very excited about because it looks like we are finally developing the, the discipline to get staff reports around council money as opposed to the what I might call nobly sublige activity that occurs sometimes at the end of our budget meetings. So um, I'll be happy to support this and I do look forward to the, new, the, the Sports Hall of Fame staying in Dunedin um, and I like the fact that it's New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Mayor for putting this motion. Um, yes, I, um, I think like some others have mentioned, I think it was unfortunate that our last meeting was decided and public excluded. I thought that was a mistake. Um, and so now we have an opportunity to talk about this publicly. I think um, Serene Taylor is inspirational and I would be really excited if he could do something um, innovative and interactive with this. Um, I think what was missing from the last meeting was it would have been great to have him and some people from who represented Serene Edgar to be at the meeting to ask some questions because we didn't know what they had planned um, or what they could do. But um, it would be awesome if we could have something that was like some of the interactive things at Te Papa or um, something similar or even better in Dunedin because it's certainly the facility as it is certainly could do with a revamp. So I think that's fair to say. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you. I'll be brief as well. Thank you for the notice of motion. And like Councillor Lord, I wasn't going to speak to this, but it is great to hear that, uh, that ph philanthropy has, has come to the party to help, um, yeah, to help support this facility along with our ongoing support. Although, as I said, and I'll stand by the comments I made in, in non-public, um, that I couldn't see any reason why you know, any grand plans couldn't have been progressed even whether or not the facility was open. I, you know, they sound fantastic, and as far as I'm saying, go for your life. I'll be, I'll be the biggest supporter of them if they remain in, in Dunedin. So, yeah, great. I support all the recommendations here, and I really hope that the, the new facility is, is a success where whatever it is and wherever it is based. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lofisal. Uh, Tinako, Your Worship, I'd just like to um, also recall my thanks to you for uh, bringing this um, motion into the public sphere. Uh, speaking as the only person who wasn't at the meeting on September the 3rd, I would just um, caution uh, advocates such as um, Ta Ian Taylor and just say, yeah, okay, so you feel passionately, there's no need for you to call names or to... Uh, disparage in advertisements in the ODT, uh, councillors who were not able to be there, being the only person who um, bothered to not show up. Um, I was at a tangi, and um, just when you're in the future, uh, please give a thought to why people are not present to exercise their democratic. Kia ora, councillor. Thank you, councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you. I will support this motion. I look forward to Council engaging more with the Sports Hall of Fame Board, Sport New Zealand and other stakeholders. 
I also hope the DCC Property Department continue to support the Sports Hall of Fame with a property grant to offset the rent um, over the next uh, over this current financial year. And also um, hope Enterprise Dunedin and other council departments that could potentially tap into other funding pools that may open up, um, hence uh, as per Councillor Barker's reference to the STAP funding. The Sports Hall of Fame is a true Dunedin asset. And I guess it was ironic the day that we did um, have that last meeting and the decision on it, um, two of our wonderful athletes went on to win gold medals in the Paralympics, uh, one straight after, an hour later, and another one later that night. And um, I also want to take this opportunity to con congratulate um, Anna Grimaldi and Holly Robinson for their gold medals and wonderful achievements, plus their support teams. Councillor Elder. <laughs> I want to commend um, the Sports Hall of Fame board and the other groups involved in wanting to take this forward in a partnership uh, model and I believe this is um, a really good move. I think quite often we need public and private um, endeavour to make things happen and I'm endorsing this because it enables us to support that and move it forward. So. I'm, I'm happy with this motion. Further speakers? Uh, there are none. Uh, I just want to, uh, to thank colleagues for their support for this motion uh, and, and add my voice really to Councillor Lofiesel's comments. It's embarrassing uh, that elected members have to feel the need uh, to explain their absences from council meetings because people with deep enough pockets can buy ads in the newspaper and attack their integrity in such a way as Sir Ian Taylor has. And I can't see how that kind of advocacy does any potential future redevelopment uh, of the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame uh, any favours. Uh, it, is, uh, it is outrageous, really, uh, that people would take that opportunity uh, and that people then have to feel the need to explain uh, their grief and their support of a community in mourning uh, in a public forum uh, such as this uh, in order to be able to respond uh, to that kind of behaviour. And we'll take the motion uh, by division in four parts unless people want to, the individual clauses taken separately. There's no indication. Take it by division, but in one. Thank go. God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Vandivis. Sorry. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 13 1. Thank you. I will further move as. as no, 13. I thought. Did you say yes, Doug? Sorry. It's actually unanimous. Carried unanimously, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll move that council move into non-public for the reasons outlined in the order paper. Seconded, Councillor Elder, thank you. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed.